good afternoon to all and a very very warm welcome to again once again to all of you welcome you all again to an interesting webinar focused on common to advance ent life surgery for ent today again this is our uh, 14th program i think we are setting new new records uh, what is uh, i think I mean, in any of the surgical web first of all surgical webinar uh, done lively second is that uh, we have been doing it on i mean as a serious in it is on put is a 14th webinar i think no one would have done in the pharmaceutical industry so this is again a record and if there is another record also that when this all this uh, surgical webinar which we have conducted in the last 14 uh, series has crossed more than 100 hours of uh, teaching and sharing of knowledge by dr and dr rajiv pachori and dr pramita and many many eminent personalities across the country and across the globe that is a bit and again it's a big record by for this uh, explorient webinar so it's a uh, record breaking i would say i think we are setting up a new records for for companies to come and break and i think i mean it will remain for a long time so once again uh, my heartiest welcome to all the ent surgeons across the globe across the, across the country so uh, with this uh, let me i mean this is mahindra varman from sun pharma pharma care division of which is dealing with uh, cipodem reciper and monta capex and new introduction a bit about so with this uh, let me hand over the session to dr rajiv pachor sir dr sir please uh, thank you Welcome. thank you from my team and mr varman uh, all my friends and welcome all my friends from my country from abroad all over the those who are just logged in with us and this is our 15th webinar and uh, i am having i will before i specify it is almost uh, 111 hours so very auspicious you can say hours we can say 111 hours been completed so far in our 14 webinars so uh, today we have very hectic schedule and uh, all the cases been nasal head and neck ear is there and whatever you can think of and we are expecting i think this at least 8 to 10 hours minimum we, we should cover it and uh, today again we, i would like to welcome madam faizawadia Paisawad, madam and samandeep bil from lgpj and kula and all the friends and again i request to everyone please give us feedback about the questions and suggestions and discussion and let's uh, start from now and uh, i over to dr sapis paramita you are there yeah, just any comment from your side so over to sapis dr sapis now hello god just Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. Good afternoon. We welcome you all to the 15th webinar of ours. We have all interesting cases lined up today, and uh, thanks for to these gents, sir and Pujari, sir, for organizing the event for all of us. Uh, and all the questions are welcome. We'll have a good discussion today since we have interesting cases. Uh, over to sir, yes, sir. Yes, Adish, sir. Thank you. No, no, hello, Sadish. Before that, belated happy, happy, happy birthday. Thank you. Yes, thank you Friday, Friday was the great master's birthday. That is over now. This is a sort of a celebration. I have come for five minutes. I am going to delay, but only to begin this with a very happy birthday to our dear grand master Sadish. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, hang over. <laughs> thank you and good afternoon everybody uh, today i welcome you again to this uh, webinar with the i hope to be a great day with some legends with us you all know them very familiar to us our own and i welcome farida madam who has always been treated me like her son thank you thank you she has been a uh, amazing teacher to many uh, including me you know when i was in post graduation period she used to come to our college as an examiner and she always treated the students like you know colleagues helped them encouraged them and that's what i have been observing for all through those years thank you and she has been same thank you she encouraged me in my life throughout my career a lot thank you, thank you. madam who has a vast experience of teaching she has been in medical college for almost 20 years now in practice to her credit number of papers medals fellowships so many things innumerable things and we always uh, see her in forefront of 
academic activities everywhere she has been to mario been to many many awards and now teaching so many and in surat so many junior colleagues are you know taking her open she is guiding them thank you, through thank their you, practice i know vishal and all those doing joint practice and madam has been instrumental in um, you know treating them thank you madam thank a you so much for being with us a pleasure to be with you us. satish a pleasure yeah. to be with madam has a special interest in head and neck oncology right and you know we have a couple of cases in oncology today so we'll have a you know great insight from madam and learn so many things from her thank you thank you madam once again Arida, then, yes just a, just a word of caution he is going to take revenge on you for all the exam questions you asked <laughs> so be prepared for very difficult questions coming from no, no. satish not satish not cannot difficult. have any questions he only has answers to everything <laughs> no question yeah. Okay. And okay, so this carry on. And then uh, I welcome another. You know, I call him dynamite of academics, Dr. Ramandeep Virk. Uh, and thank you, Ramandeep, for joining us. And he has been a great friend for all. He is professor of ENT in a prestigious. You all know the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine and Sciences in Chandigarh. He has been in forefront of academics. to his credit number of publications he has a special interest in endoscopic surgery laser surgery otology and you know he has trained so many students in his career over the last more than 15 years he has been training he has a keen you know interest in instrumentation keep up of instruments guiding i have been guided by him several times when i you know i supposed to buy some instrument he is the man who to ask for besides that he is a wonderful human being uh, amazing biker you know i spoiled his <laughs> sunday today uh, he was supposed to go by you know he he goes to kashmir and uh, even beyond uh, on bikes he has a special interest in all those things thank you ramandeep and today he we have his uh, interest of case jna's laser stapes and so many and will i believe will have a good time learning from him again some important things thank I, you ramandeep i think satish i think when you told him he has to come on zoom he thought he has to come on his bike right <laughs> yeah. zoom in with his bike <laughs> and no raman is really among the very brightest minds in yes. bnp he's a big thinker this is something uh, i'm taking out of turn but really one of the guys who should be i mean he does the pg in pg institute proud because he's truly a genuine PG's thinker he's love him boss he yeah. encourages like anything he treats them like friends throughout right from the his first year pg behaves with him like a friend amazing and ashish remember yes, we had a great time with him last year when kidney sir organized that alchem autosclerosis panel what an amazing videos he had shown that time thank you ramandeep once again for being with us winning my sunday remember thank you and before we start we have a big thanks to sun pharma for this entire support we have been uh, throughout for last two months and this program is uh, all the brain child of dr rajiv pachori and uh, paramita who have been a big help in organizing this event i have been just part of the program and they are the pillars behind this program believe me they have the kind of hard work they have done in organizing this webinars is amazing thank, thank you very much thank you once again and today we have a big day we have almost scheduled 12 cases to begin with uh, we are starting with a interesting case of jna we have always uh, you know couple of time we discuss lot of things about jna but jna is some pathologies requires more and more discussion the different extension of the tumors pose different problems so this time we have come up with two cases with the one being as uh, you know the limited extension and this being a with a different extension last two cases we saw the last one was going to the kebona sinus superior orbital feature this tumor is going more and more laterally particularly destroying the posterior wall of the maxilla which i am going to share with you so this is overall the picture of this case and the investigation which i like the first investigation to order is a ct angiogram the rest the mri and other things are required if the tumor extensively invades the skull base otherwise the ct angiogram is good enough it gives us a contrast picture of the tumor which is the highlight of the tumor as it enhances on contrast administration being a vascular tumor along with the most important information of 
the vasculitis the vessels supplying the tumor more than that this information can be given to us by the radiologist that these are the vessels supplying the tumor but looking at the ct angiogram the way i have been showing dynamically gives us a complete three dimensional picture of how the vessels entering into the tumor and that has a huge impact in surgical planning sometimes because in our uh, technique the hallmark of technique in endoscopic technique is to go on to the vessel catch the vessel first and then go into the tumor if you go into the tumor first without catching the vessel you cannot remove it the kind of bleeding it gives is something will will never allow you to work with the endoscope so in situations where you can't catch the vessel first to me is probably a contraindication to endoscopy and we have uh, got certain cases where we had to avoid endoscopy we had no option to catch the vessel before going into the tumor so this case like this is a ct angiogram as i told you this is a preferred investigation i'll start from below for everyone quickly we have discussed this several times but yet again quickly this is our common carotid artery on the right side this is the right side the tumor now it is dividing into two vessels external and internal can you see this yes yes this is arterial phase this is the vein which is prominent in the venous phase of the uh, angiogram so if i have to focus on the external carotid to begin with and it gives number of branches see the branch arising from it see right. you have to keep an eye on the branches and that's how this is the this is the facial artery that's the facial artery going towards the mandible this is the lingual artery right. and if i follow the course of the external carotid going itself behind the angle of the mandible see this vessel here it is it divides into two branches see this yes it is dividing into two right let me change the intensity see this the one going laterally is the superficial temporal we had a tumor few months back i'll share with you sometime had a extensive blood supply from the superficial temporal artery and that itself was a huge contraindication for any endoscopic approach you can't go and catch that vessel first before you remove the tumor as simple as that so here this uh, where i got sorry i'll go back go back yes so this is behind the angle of the mandible the external carotid dividing into two and the this one the huge one yes. see this this huge one is the internal maxillary and what do we need to see look keep an eye on my cursor how this vessel is entering into the tumor can you see this yes very clear this, this is the posterior wall. this is the maxilla this tumor coming from behind is destroying the posterior wall of the maxilla and pushing anteriorly trying to go into the maxillary sinus the periosteum is always intact but yet it pushes anteriorly and see this vessel how it is entering into the tumor at what level can you very see this clearly. vessel here yes yes very clearly now you have to decide at this point of time can you catch this vessel first before you remove this tumor and then only you can think of doing a proper endoscopy let me reconstruct in all three planes to show you better that's the beauty of dynamic imaging see here i am in the axial again i'll catch the same vessel see the same vessel on the axial yes i will bring my cross hatch over here to pick that vessel in the coronal now i have caught the vessel in the coronal see here where my cross hatch is okay now oh sorry again again reconstruct so this is how you can catch the vessel in all three planes and that is most important because this is a huge impact in surgical planning now this is my vessel i will catch here like this go to the coronal and large keep an eye on the vessel this has been the vessel see this right now if i follow this vessel see this how this vessel is entering into the tumor can you see the entire Very course now this is the maxillary sinus from superiorly the tumor is pushing anteriorly and from here the vessel is entering into it and riding high up riding high up into the tumor 
Tennis, yes. If we can catch this vessel intraoperatively, we can, before removing the tumor, we can very well do this tumor endoscopically. That is the main role. Now, if I keep the cursor over here at this point of time, we will see, see this vessel here. This vessel, if you see in the sagittal plane, that gives you another insight. This is the maxillary sinus and see how this vessel is entering into the tumor from here. Can you see here? Yes, sir. So we, we have to catch this vessel at this point of time, at this point of place in the, in the surgery, during the surgery and see how this vessel, how this vessel in the axial plane. So we'll go, we can catch this, we will go when we do the dankers, when we remove the anterolateral wall, we'll go far anterolaterally here first and catch this vessel first and remove this tumor. And that is how you can plan very well on this three-dimensional uh, radiology. Any, any point of time, had this vessel been entering into the tumor from behind, and I had to go through the tumor to catch this vessel would have been the absolute contraindication for me for an endoscopic surgery. So majority of the primary tumor, however big they are, they do not invade intradurally, the primary ones. And any given extension can be removed endoscopically in a better way with good on-site magnification and illumination, provided the vessel can be caught before you handle the tumor. And that is the hallmark, that is the principle of endoscopic surgery. And in this patient, I have in my mind now how to and where to catch the vessel. This vessel is little lateral as compared to the previous case. Let's, previous case, let me show you yes, again to begin with. Yes. This is in contrast to the previous case. Now the tumor is coming forward, bulging anteriorly, and this vessel is somehow you know, going through the tumor. See this vessel. Again, I'm showing it again and again. See this vessel, how it is entering into the tumor. So when I am going endoscopically from here, when I remove the medial wall and part of the lateral wall, I have to go right laterally there at the edge of the posterior lateral wall and see the vessel and how it is riding high up. As I come medially in the posterior wall, I will see the vessel riding high up. But still, still, it is not passing through the tumor. Still, it is passing on the anterior wall of the tumor. And yes. see the, if I see the dimension, mm -hmm. if I take the dimension from the level of the floor, see the level of the floor here, this vessel is somewhere is still 1.7 centimeter 1.6 centimeter above the level very well within the reach and again why i'm saying this vessel is still anterior let me go to the sagittal plane see this sagittal plane at the vessel level as you come from anterior from the maxillary sinus from here see this vessel is still anterior so as it enters from lateral to medial this is the point where we are supposed to catch this vessel right. With this three-dimensional picture in our mind, we can, we will, our first approach after the dankers will be to go and catch this vessel. That is our goal. Second part, another important thing as far as the three-dimensional or the extension of the tumor is concerned, this tumor is extending behind in the posterior part of the nasal cavity, nasopharynx. It is big, big. It is like a, it is like a ball within the nasopharynx, the huge one tumor. This tumor is so huge in the nasopharynx, if I measure in dimension like a cricket ball, this measures right from here to here, almost 5 centimeter. Anterior to posterior, almost 4 centimeter. If I see another plane, I will show you the other dimension in the coronal. Then this tumor is extending. See, in the infratemporal fossa, very clear. Yes. Going posteriorly in the inferior temporal fossa, that is anterolateral extension, this is posterolateral. And then some part of the tumor is between the pterygoid plates. In the pterygoid fossa, you can see very well. Can you yes. see here? Yes, sir. So these are the extensions of the tumor. And again, if I reconstruct in the coronal plane, this is a very important information we get again. 
in the coronal see this tumor the superior inferior height of the tumor i told you it is like a cricket ball again more than 4 cm hanging down in the oropharynx and this patient has intermittent uh, breathing issues as well that's how he has come for surgery now because otherwise it is painless he had some bouts of bleeding which he could ignore but now with the respiratory issues now he has come for surgery and another thing see this tumor is entirely one component entirely one component what it is prolapsing here and there is different thing the important thing which we should never miss is this pterygoid fossa component this is the maxillary sinus if i go behind that's the pterygoid fossa this component in the pterygoid fossa may be missed if you are not careful and that is only in the upper part this is upside down picture and see this is the pterygoid process and this is only in the uppermost part lower part as muscle and there is no tumor and that's what we will corroborate intraoperatively as well now the regarding the destruction of the pterygoid process this tumor has gone laterally in the infantile fossa here right it has eroded the pterygoid process medially the median canal completely eroded and we have to be very very careful in the region of the median canal which again remains one of the common side of a residual tumor we have to drill away thoroughly yes if you go to the publication from dr alok thakkar from all india institute 2016 in head and neck they had almost like 40% incidence of the pterygoid canal invasion which can be easily overlooked and yes, this is sir. something this remains or this forms the major cause of a so called recurrence, recurrence. And, that, and see here the tumor is little bit prolapsing in the sphenoid floor not much in the sphenoid cavity just into the sphenoid floor here and just just protruding inside the inferior orbital fissure a little bit very small component going not much behind anything and this floor of the middle fossa is completely intact no intracranial no significant intraorbital unlike the previous case where it was going to the superior orbital fissure more and more component is the, uh, is in the nasopharynx posterior nasal cavity the in uh, pterygopalatine fossa infratemporal fossa and this this huge component in the infratemporal fossa going behind as well that is our part of area of interest which we intend to resect mri in this case is always useful to substantiate your diagnosis because it gives flow voids like any vascular tumor it has flow voids by means of which you can diagnose you are never supposed to take a biopsy in these patients because these are male adolescent patient who present with obstruction and bleeding and that's how the radiology can reinforce the diagnosis in doubts you can get mri done you can get diffusion to rule out any malignant or any other tumor mri can give you good information about involvement of the critical neurovascular structure skull base intracranial structure in this patient since the tumor is not invading deeply into the skull base we didn't order an mri that would not give us any additional decision making information that is all about the radiology raman anything you want to add on or you are in the institute you are the pre all mri and uh, angiograms and all that and you have been doing lot of uh, angio fibromas anything you do different hey you, you you have to unmute man unmute yes can you hear me now yes yes very well okay yes, uh, so as far as um, uh, you know uh, the protocol it's uh, the same it's absolutely the same there is uh, no second opinion about that uh, a few things i would like to add is like the extension you are showing in the nasopharynx this makes a tumor slightly difficult because of the dense adherence to that area so uh, i am more i would be more comfortable doing a tumor which is not densely adhered into the nasopharynx completely because it is occupying both sides it's one space but left and right both it makes uh, uh, dissection a uh, slightly more tricky that is one secondly as satish has always said that in the sphenoid sinus uh, you know uh, the tumor doesn't attach in the brain it doesn't go intradurally you know it can reach up till there but it doesn't it can cause local destruction but it doesn't go into the uh, brain tissue so there's a reason for that and the reason is if we go back to basic anatomy Uh, we know it uh, arises from the you know the sphenopalatine foramen i mean uh, there are various theories and there are various areas where they say it arises from but for most of us 
especially uh-huh. PGs and younger surgeons who are in this uh, talk. Uh, it arises from the posterior superior part of the spinopalatine foramen. Now, why is it not densely adherent if it enroaches into the sphenoid sinus or why isn't it adherent to the orbital tissue? There's a reason for that because the body and the wings of the sphenoid bone, it undergoes endochondral ossification. Whereas other parts including pterygoids and nasal bones and other part of the skull undergo intramembranous ossification. So this is the difference. So therefore, occurrence of microceptors and adherence ke, which include different types of cadherence and integrins are different for both type of tissues. And hence, any growth which originates from one of these compartments will not be adhering to the tissue of the other compartment. So that is the reason it, you will not find attachment in the sphenoid sinus. You will not find attachment to the tissues of the orbit or even um, intradural as Satish was mentioning. Great. Great boss. Uh, that's a great uh, very very informative yes why it doesn't attach to the sphenoid sinus has been uh, so important to know i have mentioned he's a you, Ramani, great thinker madam, yeah <laughs> madam you want to add on anything before we start i have washed no, up yeah please wash up and uh, i we would like to see your surgery start i have nothing to add as of now satish Thank you. So I am Raman, you can see it again. Endochondrial and what else? You can see it again if you don't mind. ossification. Yes. And and membranous. Yes. Yeah, Raman Deep, unmute. Unmute, unmute. If you don't mind the critical point, you just re-emphasize. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Can, can you re- Yes, I, I will just uh, repeat uh, what I said. The body and the wings of the sphenoid, they undergo endochondral ossification. Whereas other parts, including pterygoids and other uh, parts of the skull, they go intramembranous ossification. So endochondral versus intramembranous. Yes. So the microreceptors for adherence, which include different type of adherence and integrins, are different for both. Okay. Okay. Thanks. 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 Superb. Superb. Got it. Yeah. Are you getting any endoscopic picture now? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. yes Let sir. me do some uh, white balance. Okay. Now. So, Sukhish, are you going to operate on standard or chroma clara or clara or chroma log? Okay, let me show you which you want. This is standard? Yeah. Okay. Oh. The, the right okay. arrow on your camera. <laughs> so, what do you suggest to do in Clara to see vessels much better? So, uh, they are, they, this is a, uh, basically you are using a uh, image uh, image one spice system by Carl Stores. Yes, okay. so, that is a yeah. So, SPI stands for uh, Stores Proprietary Image Enhancement System. S P I E S. Yes, yes. So, so it this... has two uh, standard is what you would get from any other camera. Then it has Clara and then it has Chroma and then it has a combination of both. Clara will give you increased contrast. If if you can focus at an area uh, of the tumor, where the tumor is and you press Clara, you would be able to see with increased contrast. I don't know why the background changing. which is dark also comes into view. So that is the beauty of the spice camera. Of the spice camera, exactly. So this is the initial picture without any preparations. And yes. as usual, what I'm using is the saline adrenaline soaked, you know, the gauge pieces for the decongestion. In contrast to the sinus surgery, where we don't use these gauge pieces and we use absolutely a traumatic cell. Yes. So, Somnath Saha from Calcutta is asking, can JNA cause bone destruction? Yes. Like in this. Though it is benign, but it expands. Mm-hmm. And due to the expansion, it can easily destroy the bone. And it okay. destroys. You see okay. in JNAs, the yes. destruction. That's why it enters the intracranial space. Yes. How can the tumor enter the intracranial stra- space without destroying the bone? Yes, yes. So it is locally aggressive. It is locally aggressive and it destroys the bone. 
but it protects the neurovascular structures you know in contrast to the paragangliomas they destroy whatever they come in contact with even the neurovascular structures they destroy but here the jn is they respect the neurovascular structures like the nerves i will show you and we have seen uh, in the previous cases the v2 and other nerves they respect except the uh, you know the median canal where the tumor when extensively invade the median canal it is difficult to save the nerve similarly the carotid artery in the last case you saw it pushes it you know it grows by pushing by expanding and there is always a thin periosteum which remains over the carotid artery however extensive the primary tumor is and that is the beauty of this particular tumor this if you follow after understanding this you know certain features of this tumor i believe and i think it is a very well behaved tumor what we have to do is to take the advantage of this understanding and here our goal of this surgery in this endoscopic surgery i told you this can be removed endoscopically provided we expose it from all around and take the vessel into control before we go into the tumor i may have to divide the tumor after controlling the vessel in the end like we did in the previous cases to remove the tumor in two pieces so that we first remove the intraluminal part acquire more space inside and then we can bring in the extraluminal part so that is the strategy in the laterally placed tumors many a times but the main uh, you know highlight or hallmark of the surgery main hallmark is exposure exposure and exposure my 90% of the time is going to be invested in exposure we'll expose it from all around 360 degrees and then we'll catch the vessel and then we'll go around it go into the tumor so in this exposure in this dankers you know modified dankers i would say at the danker which was described earlier was through the sublabial space so this is the axilla my point of you know interest over here before removing this medial wall and the anterior lateral wall is to know the level of the orbital floor that is going to be my upper limit unless you open the maxilla you can't see the level of the orbital floor by and large what i can say if you take this level of the axilla staying 1 cm below the axilla just 1 cm below i can remove this wall and still my orbit remains up so i can still spare my orbit avoid an orbital entry into the beginning see this my man of the match tool for the entire surgery this is never to be used to remove the tumor to remove the tumor from inside never though this is a property of hemostasis but we never advocate to use it inside the tumor to remove it this is for surface coagulation the reason is this tool has a amazing ability to cut see now i am using the cutting ramandeep yes yes we can see this we can see, see this. this i can remove this so vascular periosteum without a single drop of blood over here it maintains your visualization and that is something required in vascular tumors when you are operating endoscopically that is the most important thing yeah. if you can see everything because of the hemostasis it makes the surgery easy so first i coagulated and then i am ablating at any point of time we are not supposed to use it on the bony surface otherwise that may ruin the vent ramandeep yes sateesh can you say something about the principle how the coagulator works okay. you you talk about it a lot right so uh, coagulation uh, is made up of two terms uh, it's a short form of controlled ablation which they join together to form the word uh, coagulation it is a coagulation the name itself is proprietary of uh, you know it was arthro care before but smith and nephew now it works on the principle of creating plasma now what is plasma to understand that we need to know that when a uh, liquid evaporates it forms gas but when gas ionizes it forms plasma so coagulation is nothing but ionized gas the advantage of this tool is that it has suction it has irrigation it has plasma ablation 
and coagulation built into one tool. So Satish has an endoscope and just a single tool which is doing suction, irrigation. He can clean his endoscope also with the irrigation, with the same irrigation. He can do one magic tool for everything. So imagine if he had to use a bipolar cautery, number one, working with a bipolar cautery, opening the tips and closing it is very difficult. Then he needs a suction to evacuate the spoke. Then he needs someone to irrigate so that it doesn't stick. So his space gets very limited. But with this single tool, he is uh, uh, able to work in narrow confines of spaces also. Now the advantage of coblation is that its penetration is just 1000 micron meter. That is about one millimeter penetration. Compare it with quadri, monopolar, or bipolar, which run into a. So that adds on to the you know the low collateral damage yes. the coblator gives. And the temperature which is produced runs between forty to seventy degrees Celsius, which is again very minimal and prevents collateral. Now, I want to show two things here. See, this is my anterior limit, the piriform aperture. You can see very well. Yes, yes. Edge of the bone. This is my medial wall, which I have, where I remove the mucoperiosteum. And now what I want to see, this separate bone. See this? This is inferior turbinate, which is a separate bone. It is not a part of maxilla. And, you know, when we remove the inferior turbinate from anteriorly, we will encounter some bleeding because this turbinate is mainly supplied from behind by a branch from spinopalatine which so far we have not taken into control. So that is a little bit bleeding expected. And once we have a coblator in our hand, we can handle that very easily. So I'm removing this inferior turbinate. So in my exposure part, as I told you, my 90% of the time will be invested in exposure. With this coblator in hand, majority of the time, 90% of the time, we get away with a transfusion and in need of transfusion without embolization. Once you know the vascularity to the tumor, you can catch those vessels before going to the tumor and you can certainly avoid in majority of these patients embolization. Unless are the indication that I have several times mentioned. Once you have a vessel coming from behind, you cannot help. Then you have to do something. Either embolize, go by open approach, you have many options. So, Dr. Ramadeep, sir, I have a question for you. Do you also, do you embolize uh, your JNAs so, uh, or you institute, don't? Standard uh, institute protocol um, if above, uh, you know, depending on the classification, uh, mm -hmm. if uh, it goes PA, uh, we do embolize. But uh, ground reality is many no, times kind no. of Yes, sir. They have amazing uh, neuro. Uh, uh, you know, okay, okay, okay. Radiology, intervention okay. radiology team. I know the PGI, I know intervention radiology team is supposed to be the best in the okay. country. They have heard yes. a lot of them. And that, that's why they are luxury. Okay. So that's why, and see, that is a teaching institution yes. with a, such a good yes, thing yes. around. They analyze yes. most of the cases. But that being said, if you do the surgery according to the principles Satish is explaining. Number one, you need patience. Exposure. If you have that on hemostasis, this tumor removal is not difficult. The biggest part is people run out of patience and then they start blindly pulling the tumor without, uh, you know, trying to find where it is attached, without yes. having read the radiology and that creates uh, you know, a lot of bleeding and then you can forget yes, about yes. removing the little uh, extensions. But if you have good hemostasis, you will be able to see even the smallest yes. of extensions. Like going to the video and going into the interior orbital fissure, the superior see orbital fissure. See what I'm doing here? See what I'm doing yes, here? Yes, sir. Yes. I'm yes. Using the coagulator here yes. because there was some bleeding coming from the underlying yes. bone. And using the coagulator there is inviting problem. You can ruin the coagulator vent completely. Yes. And see, I have almost... Uh, remove this part of the inferior turbinate going behind towards the tumor. Yes. And so, see, sir, uh, uh, yes. Yes, yes, please. Dr. Uh, Riaz Afridi from Pakistan is asking which extensions are not in the spectrum of endoscopy? Which? 
extensions are not in the spectrum of endoscopy no no any any given extension can be removed endoscopically provided the vascularity to the tumor fulfills your criteria i have already mentioned had i been having this tumor with a vessel coming from behind the tumor i would not take first of all directly like this either embolize the tumor or you go by open approach number 1 then yes. secondly in certain extensions which happen mostly in the revision tumors rarely in the primary when the tumor acquires the vasculitis from the intracranial vessel we have seen in few cases when the tumor has a vasculitis coming from the middle cerebral artery branches yes the tumor which has gone intracranial acquired vasculitis from the middle cerebral artery branches mm. we can't afford to remove the tumor pull from below you know mm. leaving mm. those vessels bleeding inside yes and those are certain disadvantages and that really happens with a primary tumor so by mm. large by large majority of the primary tumors however big they are you can remove endoscopically okay okay sir the ct angiograms helps you a lot i couldn't show because i was going fast because we had discussed couple of time you have to see every time when the tumor is close to the carotid the cross flow in ct angiogram i can show after this case is finished mm. again how the cross flow at the circle of willis uh, level is and that helps in planning your surgery when you work around the carotid yes. artery yes sir now see this part of the tumor has come in your exposure see again the beauty of the coagulator we have understood by lot of histological studies this tumor has a maximum vascularity on the surface you know so whatever tumor you expose keep coagulating see this so any in what in what touch of your yes, okay. whatever yeah. tumor you keep exposing keep coagulating yes sir keep coagulating yes sir attach so, the medicine so dr somnath yes sorry dr somnath sir from kolkata is asking can you do surgery without a coagulator i think it will be we can but making a life difficult okay see yeah. we have to think of the best why we are you know what we are thriving for in these uh, academic events to mm. do for the betterment yes, and if yes. you have a better tool why not to use it yes you don't have the different thing and that i say in this jane uh, surgery doing without coagulator is something a disadvantage see this kind of you know dexterity the ease the way you handle the uh, surfaces is not possible with any other tool with all the time irrigation on all the time you know the suction on keeping your visualization good so see whatever surface now visible to me the tumor surface i have coagulated yes. this will help me see this shrinks the tumor yes, as well sir. i can see right up to the nasopharyngeal level now so well as the tumor has shrunken because of the surface coagulation see that i had shown you how big the tumor in the nasopharynx yes. that is behind is, is going to the level of the uh, ustekin tube which is completely compressed you see this tumor how big it is going behind there is hardly any uh, you know sphenoid component so my goal is not going to go into the tumor right now right now is to go on to the vessel expose the tumor from every side 360 degree and now what i am doing this is the level of the piriform aperture and now i am elevating this mucoperiosteum from the anterior wall you can see this tumor has a significant lateral extension as well who can get sablon as a significant lateral extension as well and this anterolateral extension of this approach will certainly help us reaching even lateral and inferior to the tumor that is something very very important another important thing in the exposure see my level of the floor of the nose can you see from both sides both sides 
my level of exposure is to flush with the floor of the nose. This is very important. Any bony impingement, any bony overhang here at the anterior margin of the approach will impede your instrumentation in the depth. So always, once you start this approach, always, always, you know, flush with the floor. Take the full advantage of the exposure. I hope it is clearly visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See now the anterior lateral wall. See these vessels which are compromised. These are anterior superior alveolar nerve branches. Small, small. See these small, small vessels which I am severing. You see this? Anterior superior alveolar nerves and vessels through their numerous interconnections. There are multiple branches of these nerves. They regenerate in a period of three to four months. And until then, they give some sort of paresthesia on the incisors and the upper canines. Yes. See, to me, this is good exposure. In case required, I can always extend it. Yes. Okay? Yes, sir. Now, see on both sides. That is my tumor there, the nasal cavity. This is my anterolateral exposure. And this wall... Oh, no. This wall is something I need to remove to enter right into the tumor head on. Mm. That is my yes, primary sir. goal to enter into the tumor head on. As I always mention, our goal is to keep the floor of the orbit as our upper limit so that we don't make an orbital entry unnecessarily. And here, yes. I will show you the level of the orbit by entering through the interlateral wall. Yes, sir. So, Dr. Sandeep Karmakar is asking, do you contemplate doing an early posterior septectomy in this case? Why? Why early? We will do a posterior septectomy. Posterior septectomy we will do later. Okay. Then we go to the exposure of the posterior part of the tumor. Okay. But I will do that after controlling this vessel first. Okay. See, this is a sort of entry. Entry into the maxilla. Can you see the mucosa of the maxilla? Yes. This is just mucosa of the maxilla here. Mm -hmm. And see, I told you the tumor was pushing from behind. See this tumor? Yes, sir. Superiorly and behind. And this is the mucosa of the maxilla giving rise to sort of mucosil here. Yes. Mucosils do not enhance on a contrast administration. Mm. See this? I am removing this bone so easily now. Mm. Having drilled this part, you can remove it so easily. Mm. And this is my head-on entry into the maxilla. See the nasolacrimal duct now? Yes. Yes. Here, riding up. Can you see very clear? Yes, yes. In this Danker's approach, you have to do something carefully to this duct to avoid this morbidity of epiphora otherwise. Mm. And that I will show you as we always do. I, we have told a couple of times. Yes. You have to cut it flush to the flush it. orbital yes, floor, yes. the brider. Now see, this is just the mucosil inside. Tumor is behind, coming from above. We had seen in the CT angiogram how the tumor was, you know, pushing from above and behind. See this mucosil? Yes. And this is right into the sinus. Sadish, can you show everyone the markings on the micro debrider which prevent it from entering into crucial structures? Marking on the, the micro debrider for what? The arrows on the tip, so that even when the tip is buried, you know where the cutting is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How deep you are. Yeah. So see the where exactly arrow? you are. Important point. Forty. See, I told you, Ramandi has a huge insight of the instrumentation, and he and these things matter. You know, once you are working in the depth drill. You have to be careful how deep you are to prevent unnecessarily com uh, damage, give any unnecessary complication. And that's how, how this micro debrider have, you know, given these markings. Let me show you. First, 
since I have entered into the sinus. Now using this, this is my favorite tool again for the region on the merit. See this high speed yeah. drill. Yeah. This is coarse diamond. This is just diamond. I am running at a speed of right now at the 60,000 RPM. The brighter. So see, choice of selection of instrumentation of what point is very important. He could have used a cutting bar also, but he's using a coarse diamond. The coarse diamond will not only remove the bone, it will also cause hemostasis because the diamond pushes the bone into the Hersian system, stopping the bleed also. Secondly, even if it engages the tissue or part of the tumor behind, it will not cut through it. That is why his mucosal, which he was saying, did not get ruptured. Had it been a cutting a drill yeah, yeah. or a, you know, a fluted drill, it would have gone through it. Absolutely. See, that is the maxillary sinus from inside and that is the tumor which is pushing from behind and above. I am removing just this mucosal part. My aim here is exposure, exposure and exposure. Cobblator. See, wherever is the bleeding from the soft tissue, you have a cobblator, you don't need anything else. That's, that's why we call it as a man of the match tool for this surgery. The beauty of that burr, the stylus burr point is, it has an inherent 15 degree angle. Whenever you see, whenever I'm drilling, my shaft doesn't come in the way. That is another advantage to maintain your visualization so you can be more precise in your drilling part. And another advantage of the cobblator he is using is that the wand can be bent if he is working into crevices or an area which is difficult to reach head on. He can gradually bend yeah. the wand till uh, 40 to 70 degrees yeah. and it will still work. I can go more and more anterolaterally up to the intraorbital now, if you want, you can go easily without any, you know, huge morbidity or anything. But if you really want to go beyond that, then obviously you have to transpose the intraorbital now. I mentioned during the cadaver, if you observe, that how the Paul Casanova described the transposition of the intraorbital now. And still you can go around and work go around the infraorbital nerve and work without giving any additional morbidity. What I want to know here is full lateral, you know, the exposure required for this tumor at the same time flushing with the floor and the orbital floor. So here, this is my obstacle. See, if I don't remove this bone over here, this will impede my instrumentation further in the depth. So it is so important to completely flush with the floor. And did you notice how the diamond drill stops the bleed? His bone was bleeding, yes. he ran it over it, the bleeding stops. And I think it's have you noticed uh, any long-term facial deformities when you do this extensive Denker's approach? Not really, madam. Uh, I mentioned earlier as well. See this. That happens when you happen to damage this lower lateral cartilage, you know. Okay. If you happen to damage this lower lateral cartilage, then you need to, you know, reinforce it with another cartilage. Otherwise, this will droop. It doesn't. That is the only thing. Because these, sometimes these children are quite young, so that's why. Yeah, that is important to, that's an important point you have raised. You are not supposed to go too anteriorly to damage the lower lateral cartilage to give that deformity. Okay. 
See, they're completely flush with the floor. And see the level of the maxillary sinus is Lower. below the level of the floor. With the development, the maxillary sinus go more and more deeper down and goes even below the level of the floor. Now the biggest challenge we have is this tumor. See this? This tumor coming right into the maxilla here. Yes, sir. I showed you on CT scan. That's why I told you this is a different extension which has some challenge and challenge is so obvious here as this tumor is right coming prolapsing anteriorly onto the into the maxillary sinus because there's a thin wall because of the tumor pressure it keeps on thinning anteriorly and that's how this tumor is and what i'm doing is what i'm doing is just trying to shrink this tumor a little bit to get more space around because we have to go behind this wall I know my target is the vessel you have seen. I had already shown you on CT angiogram. I will go behind it and catch that vessel. See how the maxillary sinus is occupied by the tumor that we had seen in the CT angiogram. Yes, sir. <coughs> so can we use a long nasal burr instead of stylus system? Long nasal burrs instead yeah. of stylus system? Yes, you can use long nasal burrs, but this system has an inherent ability to irrigate at the same time, the inherent angle to keep your visualization, the high speed, and such a you know very small pencil like you know the shaft of the burr to hold the burr more effectively you can use it more precisely these are all advantages and these are required when you are working endoscopically so this is additional advantage yes. i think i'm not I'm saying you cannot using, use that i think when you're using the nasal burr, burr can be used in this the answer is no you, you cannot use a regular uh, burr in the system oh, okay. this system has specific burrs which is you can, but you have to struggle a lot. Yes, and you, you have, have to uh, I damage the damage the interior part of the nose also near the ala yeah, and all you, the septum. Your the control becomes poor. Okay, okay. See this how how much I am shrinking it to go behind and lateral to the tumor. See this is the posterior lateral wall. Yes, sir. And we have to go behind to catch the vessel. See, the, if you try to go inside the tumor, it will keep on bleeding. So you have to be very, very careful. A little bit of the... See, this is how, see, this is how, this is the periosteum behind. Can you see? Yeah. And this is how, this is my level of the floor. Right. At this level behind, around 1.7 centimeter up, at this angle, I am going to find the vessel. I have already told you. See this? This coblator helps me shrinking this mass, this tumor coming into the See now how it has shrunken. How much space I have gained now. See this? Just because of surface coagulation. Now, give me a peck. So now, at this point of time... Also, uh, can you white balance the system once? White balance? Uh, okay, was... okay. Just a minute. I'll just put a pack over here for this surface oozing. And yes. the back of the lens also, if you can clean it once. So, so does the... I don't know, okay. maybe it's... Here, look, no? clean it. No? Yes, clean cut. Dry, sir. Dry, sir. Okay, boss. Okay. Should be better now. Is it? Yeah. So, sharper. See now the picture? 
Yeah. Now the sure. first goal before I go to the vessel, first goal is to take this nasolacrimal duct away. And my point, my point would be to flush it, cut it flush to the level of the orbital floor. Let me show you. It should not project below the level of the orbital floor to get fibros later on. That is very, very important point. And by simply doing this maneuver, keeping this thing in mind, you can almost always avoid an epiphora, post-operative epiphora. And see how I discover my level of the orbital floor. This is the tumor surface. Again, more and more shrinkage. See this? Keep using cobulator to shrink the tumor. And this really helps a lot in reducing the overall vascularity, in reducing the vascularity, the bleeding uh, during handling the tumor. See this? Now, drill. See, this part of the bone which is projecting is still, I will flush it. And see the beauty of this drill. My shaft is nowhere coming in the way. Can you see? Right. Paramita, can you see this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very clearly. See, it is so good a tool. Now, see, yes. this has gone. Now, this is the canal of the duct above, close yes. to the orbital floor. Yes. I told you, I will cut it flush, sharp, right at the level of the orbital floor not below yes. at any point of time. So on what power is your cobulation? Uh, Dhananjay, Dr. Dhananjay from Ahmednagar. Nine Rizal. and five. Okay. Full, okay. full setting all the time. Okay. Dr. Jeevan Vedi from Nagpur is asking, so up till now what you have done is called the medial maxillectomy. You can say medial, see, these definitions are, you know, different. Mm, yes, sir. Medial maxillectomy, as the name implies, remove the medial wall. This is not limited to the medial wall. Mm, yes, sir. I have removed the part of the medial as well as the anterolateral wall. See the beauty of this bar. Yes, yes. It doesn't damage any soft yes. tissue. Even at 60,000 RPM, it is not catching on to the soft tissues. Yes. yes. And now see the level of the floor. So for him, this up, this is not a true medial maxillectomy. This is removal of the medial and the anterolateral wall. And this was described initially by the Stanman and Canfield. That's why this is also known as Stanman Canfield approach endoscopically. Yes. Now see the roof of the Maxillary sinus yes. very clear? See very yes. clear? And now we'll catch this duct and cut it sharp. See this? Catch it. And we will cut it sharp close to the orbit. See that? It should not project anymore. Yes. See this? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now this will never come in our way as we have to work behind. Yes. So this is one part of our goal. Wash. This surgery or rather any skull based surgery. Next week, um, uh, we are going to do more and more endoscopic skull base mm -hmm. as we are following the feedbacks of the people what they want to see. And now I will remove the rest of the medial wall completely till behind, till the posterior wall of the maxilla. Okay? Yes, sir. See the beauty of the cobulator. It gives you amazing, amazing field. While using the cutting, you have to be careful. 
See, this is the tumor which is additionally extending anteriorly, which you had never seen in the previous cases. Yes. That's why it is a different extension I named. I told you and we kept in the list so you can handle how to handle this. You can see very well. See this medial wall, I have to completely remove it until I flush with the posterior wall. Debrider, debrider. So you will get some amount of bleeding. See the both both aspects of the tumor, the medial part and the lateral part both together. Can you see? Yes, yes. And this is little bit of the oozing from the sphenopalatine coming through the turbinate. See from behind. Yes. I told you this turbinate is supplied from behind. Yes. With a big vessel that is a branch of the sphenopalatine. Mm. And that you cannot control now unless you take the sphenopalatine in control. Yes. So I'm not going to do anything. I will leave a small pack there. Best. No point in Chota. fiddling into that space unnecessarily as we have not controlled the vessel so far. See this. Yes. yes. See, this is, uh, you have to anticipate this once you remove the inferior turbinate. Yes. Yes. Now, our key area, now the most important step of the surgery is going to come to go behind this and catch the vessel. To devascularize this tumor to some extent. Back. I hope the picture is good there. Yes, yes, very clear. See, I cannot cobulate this edge of the nasolacrimal duct which is oozing. This is going to stop on its own in no time. I can apply a little bit of the adrenaline over there. Yes, here, here I can. See this vessel around? Yes. So, no? Yes. We are not supposed to do any extensive cobulation uh, onto the vessel mm. to give rise to stenosis. Now, coming to the key area. Wash, 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 wash. Yes. See, this is the tumor which is bulging from behind. See this? Yes, yes sir. Unusual bulge of the tumor, mm. making your life difficult to go behind. Mm. What I'm going to go now? So, so will you debulge? Yes, sir. Now this is your pterygopalatine fossa periosteum. Mm -hmm. See that? Yes. Our sir. goal is there. This tumor which will devascularize in no time. Cobulator. See this. Our target is here. Our target is here. I have to go behind this periosteum. See, that's the fat. fat inside. Yes. See, this extra tumor bulging into the maxillary sinus is posing problem. That's what I wanted to show you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably we are on to the vessel very soon. We have to do little bit maneuver. The good thing is the cobulator wand can also be used to dissect bluntly in this area. 
yes yes very well yeah. normally how many carburetor vents you use in one ng fiber in such case one case yeah uh, single vent is good enough most more of the time than, yeah. if you use on the bony surface it can ruin any time so you have to be careful not to use on the bony surface so dr tapan kanti from kolkata was asking can you debulk tumor uh, uh, by coagulation yes i can but it can lead to bleeding because we have not taken the main vessel into control yet yes yes, sir. yes yes see now you have to take the judgment what you had seen this is the level of the floor and your vessel was entering into this fossa here and riding up riding up so keeping that that thing in mind i have to explore this area thoroughly you are challenge is to retract this part of the tumor and keep this area bloodless and that is why it is very important how much part of the interior part of maxilla you remove yes otherwise see without without this exposure it is impossible without this exposure yes i can see the glimpse of two things okay. i will show you because laterally we have to be careful about the nerve as well we are not supposed to damage the nerve and i can see the glimpse of that and my vessel is going to be below it what i will do i will improve my exposure i can see the glimpse of the nerve over here can you see this yes. prominence can you see this prominence yes yes that is the intraorbital now that is the intraorbital now canal can you see that now very clear Yes, yes. Clear or not? Yes, yes. Very clear. Very clear, sir. And my vessel is going to be below that. That is the vessel. Now I have seen. So this is just fat. He is ablating it away. He is eating it away. Yes. I can see the glimpse of the vessel. See how I identify the vessel over here. Let me give you a very important point. This vessel gives a branch. See this infraorbital artery going along with the nerve. Can you see this? Yes. Yes. Going And if you follow this, you will find the main trunk of the vessel. Can you see the main trunk below? Yes. There it is. Yeah, yeah. Now we can see That it. That is the yes, main yes. trunk of the vessel. See how. you can take into consideration right angle all these landmarks to catch the vessel so first give me the uh, you know carison i will improve this exposure a little bit more i have seen my vessel everything under vision now i will take this bone a little bit more and he show you better is oh. right? because it's already thinned out you can see the difference See, you have to be careful while using this instrument to stick right onto the bone. Absolutely, stick to the bone. Yes, give me cob later. Let me clean the field. See, these are just periosteal vessels, which I have bitten through my carison. just periosteal vessels that is the nerve above and that is the vessel below can you see this yes yes i will open up everything crystal clear this vessel i will coagulate the infraorbital one carison 
this is the most critical part of the surgery you know to take this vessel make more and more space before you go on to the target see this for later more space more you go laterally more you clear laterally more safer it is and this infra orbital fat is the sign of your limit lateral limit yes to define your limit i have seen my vessel already see from where this vessel is arising now the issue is to take control of this right angle so would you use a bipolar or clip bit clip i think why why bipolar when you have a coblator us suction kar clip bit suction le no no suction 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 easy easy i want to show you the arcade of the vessels so he's going to hook it from behind and get it to the forefront okay no oh coblator oh yes see is niche chhod niche chhod chhod finding this vessel at this proper plane is so important the most important thing yeah yeah the most important because if he accidentally cuts it here it is going to retract and continue bleeding thank you no then Give you will back for a while wait just one minute time and it will be over just to clean the field for you see this is where patience is required what i was talking about in the start normally people would start tugging at the tumor by now using close up remove this fat to open up the space more and more and that is the vessel behind see the main vessel would you see the glimpse of that Yes, it's coming behind the fat on the left side. Behind the fat, could you see behind the fat? Yes. Hello. Yes, sir. it's very, very clear. Very yes, yeah, yes, very yes. clear. I will make it more clearer. So what I want to say is more exposure. Give me, give me, no, 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 stop later. I am not so keen to catch the vessel early before I expose it thoroughly. i have seen the vessel only thing is to tell you how to catch it remove this fat all the time we can, we can remove a bit of more of bone sir then sir amit kesri this side sir. yes i i am planning to remove this little bit of the bone removal as well i cut this uh, branch see all this fat i'm taking away you can take away with the debrider as well whatever with full control and see he is not burying his wand into the tissue because if he does that he can damage the vessel for self see i am making more and more space the brighter or cobbler 
Yeah, there it is. We'll show you the great picture of the vessel. So he has the nerve on the top. He's yeah, yeah, I, can, I, I have seen the vessel. You can see a glimpse of just the vessel. Just to show you. So he's just going to slowly open up that area. Good sir. See the vessel there. Now, yeah. Now it is clear. Open here, right again. Why do you want to open it? Give it. Retract. Section. This is my vessel. Pack. Pack will show you better. Just a minute, and I am right on the vessel. This is so important. Saba. What is the average blood loss in these cases? And when you recommend blood transfusion in these cases? Pardon? What is the average blood loss in all these cases? Like, can you tell me about this the average blood loss? Uh, not much. That is the main vessel. Should not. Should not. Just for the hemostasis, I put this pack, and now see the main vessel. Yes, yes. Very clear now. Now it is very clear. Yes. Yeah. See the vessel behind. Yes, this one behind. Can you see? Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you remember in the angiogram, how this vessel was ascending. Yes. See this vessel? Right. It's amazing the coblator. Coblator or clamp? Pardon? Coblator or clamp? You will clamp yeah, it yeah. or? No, I I can take the vessel with the clip. I can coagulate it. I can coblate it depending upon the configuration dimension. Sometime this is one of the branch of the vessel because it gives branches also. But this is a very clear-cut vessel. You can see the huge one. Yes, yes, yes. Can you see here? Yes, you can clip it. Our nerve is above, so always the vessel will be below. The nerve is retracted above. See that here, and that is the muscle surface behind. Can you see that? Yes, yes. And this is our vessel. At first, I am coblating this. See this? I can easily coblate this to improve my visualization. This is the muscles behind in the infratemporal fossa. You can see very clear. See the muscles? Yes. yes. This is lateral pterygoid muscle. Lateral. This is temporalis muscle. This is temporalis. See laterally vertical muscle. That is temporalis, and this one is the lateral pterygoid muscle. Yes, sir. And on the surface of the lateral pterygoid, I coblated this artery. I didn't even bother to catch this at this moment because I found this coblation can do this without any issue. This is not a such a great vessel, I would say. Though we will catch it later when we mobilize the tumor. At this point of time, this will help us reducing our vascularity. See that? What an amazing uh, situation! And this all difficulty was given by this tumor extension, the brother. This tumor, which is coming in the maxilla, see this? This is the biggest of the problem we are facing. 
so this is a different extension with different problems and now i can do my rest of the job connect yeah sateesh can you show the arrows on the divider the other side once just for uh, the you need to learn section block hai see the rest of the fat see you more and more picture of the infra temple fossa see the entire infra temple fossa yes yes so good i can tease out this fat so see how we all muscles all muscles see here yes Ab sir. above is our now you have seen our now is here see this and that has to be protected another thing this was a branch going up there that i need to coblate below the now see this yeah hello twig. yes the twig can be very clear listen so now once i deal with the rest of the tumor my bleeding will be minimized my coblator has done the job i did not find to catch the vessel so essential see this everything is devascularized now see in this area with no bleeding hello yes yes this is i will tell you how the nerves are sent up sometime with coblator it is difficult to find plane in this area what is your tips sir yeah sometime you may find that issue but see all the time coblator is a suction it helps you work see this tumor never takes yes. attachment to this now you have yeah, to be yeah, careful and in any given situation you have to preserve this now this now should never be sacrificed other person has lots of problem afterwards this now is ascending towards the foramen rotundum yes sir you have seen several times in these webinars see this i am separating my tumor from the now can you see hello yes. Yes sir. yes sir yes sir all the way above and below everywhere no vessel is coming now and i can do my other exposure now this part i did in the beginning to take the vascularity in control so that when i mobilize the other parts the bleeding will not bother me much so this is not the only source of bleeding but the major source of bleeding for this one now i will leave this field see this part projecting into the maxillary sinus how much problem it creates yes yes this is what i was trying to show you yes now the, we have the anterior exposure we have the lateral exposure you can see now i will go up and take the superior exposure of the tumor i will go behind to get the posterior exposure of the tumor this is the turbinate i am cutting through this is middle turbinate this tumor almost always have an attachment to the middle turbinate almost always like ramandeep said in the beginning this tumor doesn't take attachment in the sphenoid this similarly this tumor doesn't take attachment in the on to the nasal floor but turbinates yes niche rakh chal see now yes. Okay. My simple okay. job. This is my unseen edge. Yeah, yeah. Can you see? What I intend to do now to do ethmoid ectomy to see any tumor going up. See, this is my ethmoid, and here my lateral limit is going to be my lamina papyracea. See, this is lamina. Yeah. And there is no tumor at all. 
we knew from our radiology also there was hardly any tumor going up into the sinuses but you have to hold blocks but you have to ensure that no tumor is going up to the sinuses that's why i remove the part of the middle terminate going behind yes, see sir. the tumor behind okay. <coughs> going up this is all tumor section lower part of the middle terminate sometimes supplies the tumor give some vascular see this supply. is tumor all tumor i told you this tumor is a huge luminal component as well showing it from above above the tumor i am above the tumor into the sinuses and open up all these sinuses quickly there is no point in wasting time here we all know this is for exposure and we have to dissect through all these sinuses to define the superior border of the tumor i am staying right on to the superior surface see this yeah it's all the time irrigation by my assistant See, all this is bony septation which I am removing with my forceps like this. Data, what? Which is data? And see all my small sinuses behind. All good? Yes. Yeah. Good. We know this tumor was going into the sphenoid a little bit from the floor, which I am going to show you. Now see the overall picture. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Little, little we can see. So little we can. Well, below this is above. Yeah, are you taking any uh, diagram from the septum also? Always, you... almost always. I will show you, and we will segregate that. Give me the coblator. I just to show, show with you. the coblator how you lift it off the periosteum. Yeah. See this medially. This tumor almost always takes an attachment to the septum. See here, can you see here? Yes, yes, yes. What you can do simply go and separate, coagulate the periosteum, and work in the subperiosteal plane. See the subperiosteal plane. Right. You can easily segregate from the periosteum. Wherever this tumor takes attachment, it acquires blood supply. See, this is separated from the septum, and this tumor surface now being coagulated again. Whatever the tumor you expose, keep coagulating. And this is a huge component, like a cricket ball. I told you, this is superior turbinate. This is the sphenoid osteum. You can see. Can you? Yes, clearly. Some intrusion. So what I would mean to do here is superior exposure, posterior exposure. Just stay above it and remove everything above that. All bone pieces. You have to ultimately expose this tumor, removing all bone from all around. That is the goal. See this coblator. Tumor surface from above. Now see this is below. Right. And this is above. Entire tumor surface, you can see this, and I can coagulate. Wherever the surface comes in the picture, our goal is to coagulate. See this? Entire surface being coagulated. And another advantage of opening the sphenoid is that it gives you a sense of anatomy. Many times you can get lost in large tumors if there is bleed. So this will also show you where exactly you are. You will know your limits. Yes, it will keep orienting you. Keeping the sphenoid in the field is something to orient you much better. See, there's a remnant of the middle turbinate below, which I am removing. And this is all tumor surface now. Yes. Very clear. Yes. Yeah. So does the lowermost part of the middle turbinate give the blood supply? Pardon? Funny. The lowermost portion of the middle turbinate give the blood supply to the tumor. Yes, to the tumor. See now, I am widening the sphenoid sinus to show you. 
see see the sphenoid from inside yes sir yes, and see how this tumor has come in the floor can you see very clear now yes yeah, yeah. here it is see here it is the small component in the sphenoid whole oh, nice tablet i hope you are oriented yeah very much small component which is rising in the sphenoid sinus see this tablet yes again this is the superior surface of the tumor coblate always keep coblating see this you can completely coblate the surface so, to minimize the bleeding you just tell them what area you are working in right now Because yeah this one is the see this this let me orient you was many see, this hata 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 this is the nasal cavity this is the maxillary sinus can you see clear yeah. oriented yes yeah. now i am above the surface of the tumor as i have dissected the sphenoid the small sinuses and the sphenoid sinus see this wash yes wash will remove the staining and improve your visualization see this is the sphenoid sinus behind right. yeah very clear very clear this is the cella above yes this is the clival recess this is the surface of the tumor which is projecting this is laterally the tumor and here we went laterally to coagulate the vessel and here this is the nasal part this is the floor and this is the entire tumor i hope you are oriented very much now this part of the tumor is the one which was bulging in the sphenoid sinus see this and i will keep coagulating the surface again it can keep oozing a little bit and spoiling your field so this part is in the pterygoids yeah this part is in the pterygoid you have seen now this bone projection i can always remove to flush this bone and you can get some annoying bleeding here many times so this projection of the bone you need to remove expose it more and more and see this entire sphenoid component is in our view can you see yeah yeah find all see this is the sphenoid component which is in our view how it is completely under view and the control see now right now what exposure is left behind before we start delivering the tumor now right. only posterior medial exposure is left behind and then i will divide the tumor and remove it see the surface whatever surface keep coagulating don't go into the tumor just surface coagulation it will keep devascularizing it keep compressing it the tumor will keep shrinking only one tool is working since beginning in one hand that is coagulator coagulator <laughs> i hope the picture is good yes yes it yes. is also very clear this is the level of the medial end of the maxilla where we are going to divide this tumor see this later that is and that is the bone in between little bit of the bony piece left where it turns into the sphenopalatine foramen yes see this bone and some bleeding can occur here once he pulls the bone yeah out. yeah little bit now my last part that is very very important to expose posterior medially and then i will divide and remove this in no time like what you said a little bit of the bleeding it was expected that's why his suction was already there otherwise this would have filled up and then you would spend time again cleaning the yes exactly 
See now the rest of the tumor. I have pressed this side. Okay. Now, coming to the medial aspect, as uh, somebody asked about removal of the posterior septum, this is the uh, the remnant of the turbinate. Now, this tumor has an important attachment in the roof of the nasopharynx. You know, and it has gone. across the because nasal pharynx is a common cavity and we don't have any visualization of the posterior part see now this tumor will behave so good yes surface everywhere devascularized vessel we have coagulated at two places see this is nasal pharyngeal surface which i am coagulating now i will remove this medial wall that is the posterior part of the septum a little bit to expose my tumor in the nasal pharynx up to the lateral limit completely okay yes and for that i will remove this posterior part of the septum the limit is generally till where the tumor comes this is for simply for taking the control in the roof and visualizing the tumor in the nasal pharynx across the midline to the lateral limit opposite side Yes, sir. Completely. Sir, uh, yes, sir. The tumor will be three sixty degree in our control after this. Yes, sir. You are going as per our plan. Yeah, Paramita, you are asking something. Sir, posterior septic to me and cross coat did the dissection. Ah, uh, what is? Uh, can you comment on it, Doctor Papalan? I am just asking. Yeah. Ah, uh, posterior septic to me and cross coat did the dissection. that's what i'm doing now see this to enhance our 360 degree control over the tumor yeah i don't have at present 360 degree control i don't have any information about the posterior lateral extension the posterior control the control in the roof of the nasopharynx not yet taken once i remove this part of the septum and go behind and across the tumor i'll have a complete 360 degree in control see this the bony septum i am removing this is a part of the you can say the key rostrum rostrum of rostrum so in this it is not going in the opposite sphenoid so it is not so important to go high up so high up coagulator when large tumor the opening the other side of the sphenoid will also give you orientation yes yes see this the opposite sphenoid absolutely clear and now this is your septum which first i will this is coagulate the other side he is doing it from the right side see this all yes and now i will take away take away this mucoperiosteum up to opposite side this is opposite side mucoperiosteum you can see yes now that space has opened up and see now okay. in the opposite nasal cavity see this and see the tumor prolapsing to the opposite side do you see and so it also take blood supply from the other side is you know but yes i will i will before i remove the tumor i will devascularize it see how simple now with this exposure it becomes child's play believe me okay everyone don't see get now? it is not child's play see now the opposite side very clear now first of all to prevent the opposite blood supply coming i will draw a straight line at the site of attachment to take away or disrupt the blood supply coming from the opposite side there is no question now could you see okay. yes, i disrupted completely disrupted and see this is the adenoid surface this one where my coagulator is Yes, yes. This tumor never takes an attachment onto the adenoid surface. Never. See, this tumor is free below. See this. That's See, this tumor is free below. 
See, it is taking attachment only here in the roof. Can you see? Right, yeah. Satish, it's clear. See, the lower part is absolutely no attachment. That's why I came now posteriorly and opposite side to take 360 degree control. Now see, I have a complete 360 degree control over the tumor. This adenoid surface should be spared. It has no attachment of the tumor. See this? Yes, sir. The sphenoid sinus and the adenoid do not have any yeah. attachment. See this? Opposite side is absolutely crystal clear. This is a remnant periosteum. He's removing. Yeah, yeah. So now it will help me removing this tumor. Another uh, reason, Satish, I think septectomy is important is because the septum will usually be pushed to the other side because of the spread yes. of the tumor. And there no. is no space on the other side for you to if go If you in. don't do this septotomy, believe me, your life is very difficult once you remove this part of the tumor. It can make your life very, very difficult, you know. You have mobilized the tumor from the other areas and here you are stuck behind. It prevents you from pushing the tumor down the oropharynx. And that is something you have to do before. That's why. And then this, this is one area where many of us would struggle with an elevator. Yes. Custom elevator. Now, there is no question. It is free. See now the posterior part is completely free. Absolutely free. With no bleeding. I remove this remnant of the septum to give me common entry into the nasopharynx. Behind. He is doing surface coagulation again. See now completely elevated, lifted to ensure that my tumor is not attached anywhere, inferiorly, laterally, superiorly, posteriorly. Can you see everywhere? Now, as I told, this is huge, like a ball. So what I will do now, if I try to remove my lateral component at the simul, uh, you know, along with this primary uh, component in the nasopharynx, this lateral component would be difficult to accommodate. Okay. See this, this lateral component I bring, Unless I remove this medial one, how will this be accommodated? Can you understand? So what I will do, I will divide. I will divide, remove the medial component first. And then remove the lateral component. Now my 90% of the job is done for everyone. Now my last part is tumor removal, which I have come to. Okay? So first, the division. See this, at this level. That is the bottleneck. That is the medial wall of the maxilla. Can you see very clear? Right. That is the medial component, medial to it, and the lateral component, lateral to it. Okay? Right. I will just coblate the surface and remove it. You are using coagulation mode right now or coagulation mode, sir? In between both, full. First coblate, then cut. First coblate, then cut. Wherever there is bleed, start coagulation. Otherwise, continue. With yes, yes. I expect a little bit of the vessels still, because this is the pterygoid region here. See this very clear now. Yes. I showed you earlier in the last two cases also this division. See with the coblator. This is uh, Satish cutting his birthday cake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is literally cutting like butter, you know. See, this is my medial component which I want to segregate at this point of time. See this? 
इंटेंशनली आई एम लीविंग माई लेटर कंपोनेंट यो साफ करना सी नाउ नो ब्लीडिंग इमेजिन हैड यू नॉट टेकन द वेसल्स इन टू कंट्रोल हाउ वुड इट अलाउ next to impossible believe me with that much of vasculitis is coming now i have to just pull this tumor down look 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 no pani mat dal tumor into pterygoid myelos yes remove see this is the sphenoid part a little bit here this is the sphenoid component i will pull it down see this and the bone behind it will tend to remember it is completely pushed down 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 and it is free can you see a lateral and medial component got free except this little bit of the periosteum it is free now very clear to everyone yes very clear see no time i told you my 10% job is tumor removal 10% time is tumor removal Ten percent time is tumor removal. I am just cobbling these surfaces to improve your visual. See, this is the tumor in the pterygoid process. See this? Pterygoid marrow is invaded. Yes, this is pterygoid, and this is the region of the median canal. I will show you now. Really? First, I will remove the medial part. See, now it is completely free. Right. Now the lateral part removal. will take 5% of the time just we'll uh, leave this gauch piece over here show na yaar yes press just to avoid unnecessarily oozing from the surface here now mouth opener mouth opener can you see this lateral part and the medial part segregated right okay and no bleeding i will leave this so uh, push this with the gauze piece so it doesn't jump back when i remove from below just to keep it pushed for a minute this is now the lateral part which is dying to come out mm ये मेरे को नाउ सी द क्रिकेट बॉल सी दिस ब्यूटीफुल डिफिकल्ट टू होल्ड इट एंड मेनी टाइम्स यू एंड अप डैमेजिंग द यूला रिट्रैक्ट कर यू रिट्रैक्ट सो मेक श्योर द यूला इज आउट ऑफ द वे सी हाउ दे हैव टेकन द सॉफ्ट पैलेट अप Yes. See this component. Beautifully done. Beautifully. Yeah. Done. Huge one. Now, the medial part. What are they? Uh, then the medial part is removed. So now the lateral part. Okay. Wash. 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 Give me a good wash. And no time. We'll remove it now. is straight away without wasting any time and finally we'll drill the pterygoid bone wherever it is involved see this component yes yes the principle is pull i told you without wasting any time orle aage se pakad that is the nerve above and the tumor is here below and see this let me separate the muscles from the tumor catch 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 first now there is no point in wasting time can you see the tumor yeah yes babe see i am using this coblator as something to separate and the surface has to be smooth if it is unsmooth that means you have left part of the tumor or you have yes. cut yes so this is advancing part of the tumor which is always smooth see this See this lateral part dying to come out. However big it is, sometimes if it is too big, again 
you have to divide this lateral part also in components see this right pakad niche se pakad niche se pakad 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 ruk 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 see this traction and counter traction give me a ruk ruk and you might have small vessels here also and again yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i am waiting i think it's a right? vessel maybe yeah some small small vessels here these vessels from the ascending ferrule small vessels i am dividing the fibrous septation holding i am dividing see this see this all fibers muscle fibers sometimes see i am just dividing them and this is traction and counter traction it's entirely a matter of traction and counter traction now taken away so had he not removed the central part this traction would not be possible yes how where would i push this part and i remove go yeah, yeah this is the part of the vessel again see this yes. no 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 hold 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 this like what pocket clip clip see that is the main vessel you can see again right we are not clipped earlier i told you so as a safety major so he is using I, the 3 mm clip to clip the vessel chhod ke wapas pakadna yeah see taken care of hello yes sir right this is pterygoid venous bleeding because there is some tumor in the pterygoid bone back then yaar suchta kya hai from the that stump of the artery yeah let me show you let me show you a minute let me back this area i have taken the vessel in control i have shown you with a clip the final part with the clip i will show you that clip again where i put see now the lateral part is completely yeah. out see this absolutely clear and this is our nerve going up see that we have been able to separate yes. from the nerve very clear mm. see that and now we know some tumor is there within the pterygoid process see this is the component lateral component can you see right wash give me straight lagao now i will give it a full wash and show you something so how much time did my tumor removal take out of the entire time less than 10% yes, yes. agreed 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 5% 90% of the time more than that is in exposure exposure and exposure see we remove the tumor there was hardly any bleeding we didn't embolize we didn't transfuse now the last part and the most important part is the pterygoid that you have to take a wash separately give me a huge wash i want to remove all this blood staining ek dhang se laga ke de removing all the blood staining i don't want to see any bleeding now and it is also important because red color absorbs light it will darken your camera yeah now first give me the coagulator see now no bleeding yes sir i kept this case purposely to show as a different extension the problem posed by the maxillary component you know yes it can for a beginner it can pose a big problem so now you can know taking into consideration how you can manage it now this is the periosteum mm. which i cut see that mm. yes sir see the adenoid surface absolutely innocent yes nothing to do with this tumor attachment is all periosteum above mm. adenoid surface and nothing to do mm. will you drill, drill the pterygoid now sir yes yes yes, yes. i am taking uh, just ascertaining what areas i need to drill away 
any possibility of tumor anywhere this is my see below is the eustachian tube yes absolutely undisturbed yes they're not supposed to disturb both eustachian tube you can see now yes very well sometimes this anterior wall of the sphenoid bone this very sphenoid bone is you know affected on a slightest doubt in this case it is not on slightest doubt you can remove this bone you can drill away completely it is the drill it is the haversian system of this bone which become the site of a residual tumor see now just to show you just to flush this bone completely sir, without the median, median area sir you are drilling pardon median area we are drilling sir the median area i will show you i am removing all this septation to show you a clear picture the not still i have a tumor in the pterygoid process i told you i showed you in the beginning if you remember yes and that is it is very important to read your ct scan and well so you yes. know where the tumor is hidden very important i will show you i have a tumor in the pterygoid fossa in the area section get me good section yes see this is pterygoid fossa dekha can you see this yes yes this area i need to completely so sometimes the pterygoid marrow itself goes into the greater wing of sphenoid and the yes. there inside and see okay. to know the best information about this marrow involvement the mri is the answer also satish when drilling can you tell everyone what areas you have to be careful in so that adan can once you are drilling here just explain how careful you have to be so that you don't go intracranial or uh, you know when the yes, from goes. here if you know this pterygoid region good i mentioned in my cadaver this section about 1 and 1/2 inch 1 inch square inch area band the area see this is one square inch area where i am coming to yes sir and the last time the tumor was going into this critical area yes again this starts with the pterygoid mm -hmm. this is my now which is going in the foramen rotundum you can rotundum. see okay nice okay now for sir see this this is the now let me clean it separate it see this is my clip on the vessel right okay. separate it you have to completely clean this region completely means completely pakad aage remove all this tissue and see how the vest the nerve is going to the foramen rotundum behind can you see the foramen yeah very clear very clear okay see that is the foramen rotundum and above this bone is the maxillary strut can you see yeah yeah, yeah. yes sir and about that region is the area of the superior orbital fissure yes okay? yes sorry hata de so big jo kar and when see now the nerve is clear preserved the tumor i told you in the beginning this nerve must be preserved yes now this invasion of this bone which i always keep it for the last as you can focus better by clearing all around mm. see now if you leave this tumor here it is bound to come back moti wali i will take a different bar not this one now the same from the stylus but a more bigger one stouter one and a pure diamond now chalo dal section bar see now kulye kya puch find it this area bleeds a lot sir 
you showed us last yeah, time but, uh, this using this diamond will take care diamond gives you best opportunity see this is the terigold fossa below i have opened yes, up yes, yes. diamond can be seen now see that yes now, sir this is the entire terigold process see now completely drilled off Hmm. Above with a normal bone, can you see? Yes, yes. And see that is the median canal. Yes, sir. Give me the coagulator. Invaded part of the. Yeah, that is the vessel in it, the median yes. artery. Can you see the small median artery? Yes, trouble for the median. Always. See this. See this. Yes, yes. Very yes. Well. Uh, this is the median canal, which now looks good now. Hmm. The nerve looks good without any tumor into it, mm. and I am coagulating mm. this. See this area now. Yes. Give me the drill again. No, no. you have to completely. If you have a slightest of the doubt, eliminate the pterygoid completely, rather waiting for a recurrence. Mm. See now, completely means completely. My carotid is behind. This median is leading to the carotid at the foramen lacerum. Yes, this is one of the best landmarks. Mm. You can just follow it. See this area completely clear. Is that the bias? Yes, yes. Okay. Now this is my tumor here. See in the terigoid fossa. Can you see the tumor? Narrow. Yes, yes. Absolutely within the bone. And I told you on CT scan that we have a tumor in the fossa. Can you see? Right. Yes. Very clearly seen. See how one can easily miss this. As soon as he pulls it, there will be some bleeding. See this tumor. Oh. That's why drilling is must. See this tumor. Is separate from the muscles now. Can you see? Yes. That's it. See the muscles below, and now it is out. Had I left this, would have been a disaster. See how important is to read the CT scan. Now there is nothing in the pterygoid for the yes. muscles. There are two muscles in it: the medial pterygoid and the tensor palatine. Yes. Microscope, please. So, uh, our next big case would be the CA parotid mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and before that, um, our next case is opened up. My colleague has opened that is a stepidotomy. He has already raised the flap, so will not take time, will not take long, and before the CA parotid will finish up this uh, stapes. Now, see. Can you see the terigoid fossa now much better? Yeah, very clear, very clear. The muscles below, no tumor at all. No tumor. Had we not noticed this on CT scan, one would easily leave the tumor behind. There is a small component up above. What is that, sir? Yeah, it's yeah, not... that, that I am drilling the bone. That is nothing, not the tumor. I, that is a part of the median canal. Now see here, this is my uh, V2 going in. Yeah. Yes. That is the foramen rotundum. Above that bone, above that bone is the maxillary strut, and above yes. that is the superior orbital fissure. This one, which yes, goes sir. behind to the cavernous sinus, mm. where the carotid is. That is the carotid prominence. Yes, yes, sir. So this point out for lateral CSF leaks. Is this the area that you also drill? Yeah, yeah. Lateral CSF from the lateral recess. The lateral recess forms at the expense of pneumatization of the pterygoid. So the area I'm drilling in the lateral recess leaves this area is pneumatized. That's why you have to see the median canal. Mm. Yes, very well. Clear. So this pterygoid fossa component one could easily leave behind had we not noticed the had we not noticed the CT scan. CT scan. That is the most CT important. See the pterygoid canal. Exactly. How important it is to drill away this canal. Until you find normal, 
if i have a slightest of the doubt i will keep drilling until i get the normal okay can you show the relationship of median with uh, medial pterygoid sir median with the medial pterygoid median pterygoid is the muscle below uh, you know in the pterygoid fossa i told you there are two muscles here mm. the medial one is the tensor palatii and the lateral one this big one is the medial pterygoid mm. and median canal runs above this is v2 completely preserved mm. this is your infratemporal fossa of later now mm. see i told you in the beginning mm. this is infratemporal fossa yes this is lateral pterygoid plate is enough right. clear very clear this is pterygoid plexus mm. right Yes. It is all horizontal fibers are lateral pterygoid. Lateral pterygoid has two components. Is it your opinion? It so also shows the uh, optic strut. Optic strut superior is above the level of the superior yes. orbital fissure. Yes. Below the superior orbital fissure is the maxillary strut, separating from the maxillary nerve. Maxillary nerve. Yes, sir. Optic strut is separating from the optic nerve. Yes. I'll give you the landmark again. See, this is just simple pterygoid venous plexus from the deeper part in the lateral pterygoid muscle. We'll just leave a small piece of surgical cell over here. There, there. See now the infra temporal fossa yes. completely opened up. Yes, yes. Beautiful. Yeah. All in one one single vision, everything is. Yeah. Everything is visible. Oh, see, Denker's with Denker's approach, you can remove any given extension. Let me enumerate. Last time we went above the maxillary strut, if you remember. Yes. This above this region to go to the go to the superior orbital fissure and then to the cavernous behind. Yes. Last sir. time. Yes. This sir. time it was not required. Shota Gauch, please. Yes. Sir. Now, if you have a tumor extension, let me show you in our upcoming webinars mm. when we have a huge peripheral extension. Mm. See, this is the infratemporal fossa. Yeah. So, where is the peripheral space now? Suppose this tumor had an additional peripheral extension. What would I do additionally? I would remove this pterygoid completely from yes. here. And just behind this would have been the peripheral extension going towards the carotid. Just behind this, see this uh, right angle. Here, see this. My pterygoid process. This process is ending here. See where my instrument is going, dipping in. Just anterior to the eustachian tube, where the cartilaginous eustachian tube behind is going posterior laterally. That is the peripheral space. If I remove this, this little bit of the pterygoid left, one centimeter. If I drill away, I will be right in the peripheral space. So, if you have a tumor extension to the parapharyngeal, don't worry. It requires additional five minutes to drill away this remaining pterygoid. Nothing. If you know that Denkers, you can remove each and every extension of the angiofibroma easily. It is unnecessarily terrifying that we have a tumor extending to the cavernous sinus. We have a tumor extending here yes. and there. All it needs is a Denker. This week. It was so gratifying to know. Almost eight people called me that they did their JNA for the first time. Yes, sir. And it is so gratifying. Really, you can do it. No hassles at all. You have to simplify the work rather than terrifying. And I think one of them has used the word satisfaction. So this some new term has come up in the social media. Yeah. Satisfaction. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. yeah uh, he's amazing guy. And he gave Where is he from? He's from Andhra Pradesh. Andhra Pradesh. Yeah, Omar Raja. He is very punctual. He is always. Yeah, very regular with the webinar. Yeah, so he's come out with for... this term. Yeah. Yeah. Satisfaction. Yeah, that paper is accepted. <laughs> See now, finally, no bleeding. We'll just pack, wash for five, ten minutes. Yes, sir. And Pack it. That's it. We remove the pack for a, after a day or two, mm -hmm. and train patient. See this. All five ten minutes. You keep watching. Everything will come under visualization. See this. Mm -hmm. See this panoramic view. 
just join the step piece which is already open up i'll take 5 10 minutes just the video game with the laser and the piston that's it nothing else satish we have joined with our two super talented surgeons maruti kalyankar and dr gaurav gaurav Maruti? chaturvedi both have joined oh, maruti and gaurav both have joined now oh. gaurav chaturvedi yeah, the talented yeah, surgeon yeah. from bombay and dr maruti is from uh, dr kalyankar very very talented surgeon from nandi yes, yes. welcome, welcome both of you, you see the and they have been following satish also for ever i think yeah you know if sunil anush ka naam naam uh, for long amazingly talented guy and you know his pictures his surgical pictures are something amazing. i could never take i have seen his pictures many times amazing how he records absolutely bloodless work his autology endoscopic simply amazing and i have had an opportunity to visit his place nanded once his center and uh, our workshop conference probably was meant con 2014 we went sathi 14 yes yes when uh, we were doing that pituitary you remember yeah yes so now the next case is ready and is gaurav there gaurav is also there he joined yeah oh gaurav is a gaurav is a smart test guy yeah smart the handsome the handsome ent the one who brings a <laughs> little respect besides the chandigarh wala ramandeep the other handsome guy is gaurav <laughs> and you know gaurav is heading he is the director of ent as a prestigious jaslok hospital in mumbai mm. and he has a keen interest in uh, endoscopic i have done couple of cases at jaslok with him and his interest is something you know is a deep interest in endoscopy is uh, something so enlightening amazing gora welcome thank you sir thank you for your kind words and sir whatever you whatever i am doing it is all because of you which oh, your your which means gorav is a aims product he is a aims delhi product he is highly academically oriented and before uh, the just look he was uh, in the faculty in the uh, jaipur in the mahatma gandhi medical college so we had a lot of interaction that time here in jaipur with him uh, i i can see the step is there yeah lot i can i can see the step is here yes the right side see? yeah Yes, very nicely. Okay. Yeah. The case is already opened up. He has curated the posterior overhang. We don't want to show again and again. But the, the foot plate. Of, you want to comment have, on the foot plate? Yes. So okay. here, we don't have this cone beam. Otherwise, I would measure you the exact thickness of the foot plate in a fraction of millimeter. This is, you know, multi-slice scan. But yes, I can see the entire ossicular chain. This is hmm. stapes incus malleus. Can you yeah. see? Yeah. Yeah. all together what i want to see here any inner ear abnormality which may lead to problems mm. intraortic canal the cochlear aperture vestibule the vestibular aqueduct here the cochlear aqueduct here down dish can you just uh, slowly show for everyone uh, you know the important uh, points you have to see for a uh, hrct temporal bone for autosclerosis yes yes i i didn't show here for the reason we have discussed several yeah. times in our uh, Uh, stapes webinar but since you have asked quickly i'll touch upon from above downwards above number 1 the superior canal i need to see whether it is dehiscent or not what i will do i will go to the coronal see this is the best can to see the superior canal dehiscence you can't assess on the axial and how you can assess see this is your vestibule can you see here yes this is your superior canal and follow the superior canal see this There is a thick bone over it. Why it is important? Since Ramandi was asked, because we have to rule out a third window lesion, which may mimic this kind of autosclerosis, early autosclerosis. This is intraartery canal dimension, the cochlear aperture dimension, the vestibule size, then the vestibular aqueduct. Then as you go down, this is cochlear aqueduct here. All should be normal. This is a little bit high high jugular bulb. This is little bit high jugular bulb. Because this is the level of the round window, and just below the round window, the jugular bulb mm. appearing. 
but it is not going to bother us then the ossicular chain then any anterior or posterior you fixation. know bony attachment see this is the superior medullary ligament yeah. look looks little ossified uh, can you see here? it is it is little prominent here yeah. anterior medullary ligament in stapes it is not uncommon to find hyalinization and calcification of anterior medullary ligament and if it is you can pick up on a ct scan see this i will go and check the malleus mobility on a slightest doubt i will extend my incision anterior superiorly and go to the anterior medullary ligament and cut it away that's it similarly on the coronal you need to see the superior medullary ligament if it is ossified suppose if the superior is ossified in the see this here see now the level of the malleus superiorly yeah, in the attic yeah. yes we have seen in our series some cases having conductive wearing loss everything normal and this malleus was fixed in the attic in the roof you can rule out you can rule out on ct scan then the facial now again for the facial now whether it is prolapsing down upside down anything you want to see you have to go to the coronal and now see here again if i go to the coronal see my ossicular chain the malleus incus can yeah, you see yeah. Yes, going to the over is seen well yeah step is supra structure going to the over here yeah he just about the facial in the is seen yeah. yeah had this been coming down it would have been overlying yeah. the oval window it's a wide so yeah. quickly you need to rule out you have to see the dimension of the facial canal to rule out any persistent superior artery or anything this is foramen spinosum yeah yeah present there to rule out persistent stapedial artery this is the carotid artery and the cochlea there is no dissens that is another third window phenomena if it is so you have to see all this our case is already opened up so i will straight away go to the case and the next case is ready that parotid see a parotid single press are you planning to do the things that is that i suggested to you stapedius and posterior crest उटरे So I think that will be um, a little uh, too much. But uh, let's start with the basics here. Okay. Why an CT uh, temporal bone is important? Because uh, you will come across various things in literature that no, it is not mandatory. Then your there are articles which say it is mandatory. Uh, in many countries, it is done done purely because of medical reasons. Right. But for beginners, it is very important because uh, the things of of the things that he showed that third window phenomena can be there. You don't want as a beginner to have a you know a CSF or a perilymph pressure because uh, to manage that itself uh, is uh, an art. Number one and number two, you need to have some experience in stapedotomies to to effectively manage a gusher and not get uh, uh, you know alarmed by something happening early in your career. Uh, the number 3 point why a ct is important is because you can rule out actually you can prognosticate how well the patient will hear post operatively if you see a round window atherosclerosis you know your results are not going to be perfect you are not going to have a perfect ab gap closure so you can actually tell the patient that this is what you expect then of course in far advanced atherosclerosis uh, uh, you know uh, you can uh, there's actually an algorithm uh, which is in place to decide Uh, when to do a stapedotomy and when to do a cochlear implant uh, i can come back to that uh, in a minute and the most important part is like satish said a dehiscent or a overhanging facial nerve or a persistent stapedotomy artery so these two scenarios for experts like satish and others on the board it they are relatively easy to manage and for the persistent stapedotomy artery we have been always taught that if you damage it or if it bleeds why the patient uh, is not going to uh, wake up uh, with all four limbs moving there will be paralysis of one side you but know. if you scout the literature and in repeated publications it has been said that even if you 
bipolar or uh, you cauterize the persistent stibital artery there is no case report in literature which suggests yeah. that paralysis can occur or a stroke can happen yeah. there is no mention so that being said That's people so have cauterized the persistent stibital artery uh, in many cases in which it was causing a conductive hearing loss because it was not letting the staples to move so it presented like a, um, a conductive loss yeah conductive loss but people have uh, yeah. done so it. i think uh, through, through this i think webinar forum i think it's uh, I think let's make it every case of autosclerosis is a CT should be done. Absolutely. I think let's just make that. Ashish. And yes, I think there are four destinations for the persistent stapedial artery. But regardless of that, you can cauterize Ashish. it. Bipolar Ashish. Ashish. Yeah, beautiful. You yeah. have seen us all through all cases. I've been telling you for years. Yes. Always for a scan. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so I'm saying through no. this webinar, the influence that it has, I think let's through this preach that yes, every every autosclerosis CT is important. You, know, you it prevents you from surprises, number one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's no junior senior. I think we're all yeah. juniors till the end of our yeah. careers. Yeah. Yeah. All beginners, yeah. You're a beginner, you will get completely demoralized if uh, and you know out of all autological litigations you see worldwide. Autology. Uh, autos maximum autosclerosis surgery. Achha. Yeah, this is a fact. Because dead ear is the dreadest, dreadmost complication. Yeah. So this is room. not the thinnest of the foot plates, but not very thick either. And yeah, it looks I very, very remember. even. Now, first of all, give me a, a gel form. But the oval window is not so, you know, uh, widely opened up area. It is looking like the, the area is looking congested, you know. So you take the posterior yeah. crust out. Overcrowded, yes. So in stapes, so one thing, the most important thing is prevention of complication because the patient comes with a conductive hearing loss, and there are n number of reasons to give sensorineural hearing loss. And this is something which is never acceptable, not only to the patient, the surgeon also. And many a times when you get surprises, you have to cut a sorry figure. So CT definitely helps you. There is no harm in getting a CT scan done. And with the cone beam, the cost and radiation factor is overcome. Now, first of all, let's check the mobility. Oh, good. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello? Yes. So the mobility, Hello? you check it in the incubus tapetal joint. Look at the play that is yeah. happening yes. between the... Very yes. good. Yes. Very good. I was expecting there to be some astigmatic mobility because of the malleolar ligament, but it looks good. Yes. Ashim has several times emphasized the value of the malleolar ligament. Now, hold on. Now, let me check the mobility at the foot plate level. This is very important, especially in. Hypermobile. Sometimes you have a spontaneous resorption of the both crura. Absolutely fixed. Incus, yeah, yeah, fixed. So he's gone as low as possible on the crura and tried to move it. I remember Gaurav was doing his tapis. Uh, we were together. We had three cases, and all three cases, he mm. came across the malleolar ligament fixation. I told you the most unfortunate guy today. These must it have. <laughs> <laughs> These must have come from the, the, they must have at least gone once to Ashim. <laughs> because he gets these fixations more. <laughs> yes. Gaurav, I hope you are not kept somebody sitting in Ashim's waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> now, see this. Let me check where the IS joint is. See that? Can you refocus? Yeah, it's not centralized and... Let me realign. In fact, the uh, white valence is not We should, okay, okay, we should have a picture like Maruti Satish. Oh, that cannot be. <laughs> Maruti, you can please give some hints. Difficult. <laughs> what you do to make. How he shoots. And it's surprising he has a striker camera and such a beautiful photo, photography and video. Of course, it's his surgical skill also. See this. Yeah. 
See, there is a play within the incubator, the joint of the incubator stapling yes. joint. You yeah. have to be right at the joint. See this? Yeah. If you are not at the joint, you may damage or end up damaging the lenticular process. That is something not warranted. Yeah. See the joint clearly now? Yes. 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 I've opened up. So mobilize the incus anterior posteriorly and look for the joint. Sadish, yes, for a short time, it was proposed that there are four ossicles and the lenticular process was considered as a fourth ossicle. Really? In, in literature, yeah. Just for a very brief period in the history of this anatomy, they went through this. And then finally, after a few debates, they concluded, no, it is a part of the incus. I hope the picture is better Very now. Very nice, yeah. So, so yeah, better. So how now it's you, going how, back. How often you get malleable fixation in your cases? Like, uh, as per study, as per literature, or as per experience? You are asking it to Satish? Well, anybody. Okay. I, I don't see it. I don't. I, I, really don't see. I mean, I have malleable fixation in autosclerosis. Mm -hmm. I use a technique or a term which I call hypermobilizing the malleus. It's a little bit, little extra than what Ashim yeah. does. I remove the anterior superior overhang with my gouge end. But that's mostly I do in tympanosclerosis and other See, now other I'm things. focusing right to the tendon. Can you see? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes. And now yeah. I will bring my laser beam. You can see. Hello? Yes, 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 sir. Clearly see. Shoot, shoot. And see, besides Ashim, Ramandeep is another guy whom I would, I could able to convince for the laser. <laughs> and he's having the luminous laser. In the last uh, seven years, only lasers taped taught me. And well, I have the KTP laser for many, many years now. And uh, having watched Satish's larynx uh, surgery, I just invite today for... Uh, okay, Satish, you finished the narrative. Yeah, see this? Gone? Yeah. Mm. Same. One more shot. Give me a, uh, a gel form. See, oh. I have already weakened the posterior crust. Yeah. yeah. Why did you use a secular... I don't uh, overshoot now. Why did Your you audibility know? is little not good, Satish. Yeah, today. Vinesh, uh, really? issue with your... Is the issue? Can, can yeah. you check? My now, now you're okay. Now you're okay. Okay. See, now I am just pushing an extra gel form underneath. Uh, this may overshoot. See that? That's correct. So many times what happens when you fire at the crura, the crura gets uh, charred and burnt away and the laser penetrates to the foot. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Yeah. See this? Now the like next step. Like Robin Hood's arrows. Yeah. Now see his gel foam. What has happened to that? Otherwise that shot would have hit the foot plate. Yes. See now, I have gone through the crust. Can oh, you see yes. completely? Yes, yes. The entire width of the crura is gone. Yeah. So it has, see now I have mobilized it. Yeah. Now anterior crust being facile, assuming I can easily break this. Fracture this and remove it completely. For we were supposed to show different techniques, Satish, oh, if you remember. Yeah. We were, we, next one, we have to keep the anterior yes, cura intact till the... See, Ashish, with this laser, mm. life so difficult. <laughs> but, uh, yes, yes, for the audience, yes, I will. Yeah. See, this is you break the anterior crust. Some bleeding will be there. More of the anterior crust is little bleeding, always. Mucosa and uh, no, there that, is a plexus. There is a plexus at the base of the anterior crust. That is the that is the area, no, the uh, fistula and antifenestrum, yeah, whatever. Yeah. That's where the yeah, close to that. Yeah, section. That's the birthplace of autosclerosis. Yes. Uh, there has been a lot of echoing actually. I'm getting a lot of messages. Uh, she says voice is echoing and all the, I mean, in fact, even my panelists, everyone's voice is echoing. Dinesh, just can you have a look on this? Do you, do you want us to shut up? Paramita, are you politely telling no, us no, to do that? No, 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 not at all. 
it's messages that I'm getting constantly. Okay, okay. I'm no, you can be blunt with me at least. Yeah. <laughs> I already sent message to whoever this is doing. He's correcting it. Okay, okay. The, see this this small plexus at the base of the anterior crest you have to be little patient if you are out of focus again are are focus kyun hata diya iska virender kyun change karta hai sir this is the other advantage of doing the anterior crototomy after the piston is in place is exactly precisely this bleeding so then you have that fresh blood coming and you know sealing it going around the piston yes you can say that yeah But see, this bleeding is hardly. No, no, no. I know, I know. It's not an issue at all. Yeah, But yeah. I have the added advantage. I got your point. Yeah. You don't need to bring the blood from the. See now. Now. Right angle. My fenestra would be in the center of the foot plate inferiorly. Not now. First. This is the posterior crust, you know, stump of the posterior crust, which was coming in the way. And many times, uh, it is very close to the facial, so you can't uh, shoot uh, the laser at the base. Yes. And so get a little above, and then just out. Yeah. If the facial is decent, again is a big issue. You have to be careful. Point five. Point five upper. Point five twenty watts depth of two. Depth of two watts. I want a good exposure time. The two is the adequate one. We have observed. See now. Let me give. Uh, I have uh, the piston measuring. Before that, let me. Uh, Just pack that area so that we get a clear field for the audience. I will. I will mop that. I will mop that. You are doing it under local or GA? This one, because lots of movement is there. Always, always under local. <clears throat> See the male is there. Yes, yes. What I want to see, I always measure. As I always told you, these two steps I have shown the tendon and the crust with the laser. The crust step is very, very important to prevent complications. And here, let me keep at four point two five and check. Just let me. Check. Just today morning, I inquired this about another uh, CO two laser. This is from a company called Three G, which is based in uh, Chennai. So they have a micro manipulator CO two beam for thirty nine lakhs, and with the additional fiber, it is forty nine lakhs. we are going to have a machine installed in satish's place for a trial for a month and if we like it we'll probably yeah, they had come to it. us also when we ordered the yeah how much is the luminous one now raman any idea 125000 dollars baba rupees mein bolo dollar wala achi maal hai nahi udhar over 1 crore almost 80 lakhs acha so then this is good Forty lakhs me agar. Uh, this is the quality. It's the quality which matters, yeah, boss. Yeah. And it is thirty watts. It is not sixty watts. Do does it matter? Uh, yes, depending on uh, what you are uh, buying it for. No, for uh, for uh, uh, middle ear and for the vocal cords. Uh, and uh, you know minimal work. Four point two five. Hello. Yeah. Gel form. What I was working at major length, length, length of the piston. You know. Yeah. To me, it turns out to be 4.25 section first. Okay. I will clean the oval window for you. Yeah. Before making the finestra, so my last part of the video game is finestration and piston. Piston. Yeah. See the beauty of the laser again and again. What I want to emphasize is the safety concerns. Without mobilizing anything, without passing on mechanical energy to the inner ear. During these many hours, are banned. Raman, you should develop a laser-guided measuring device here. Uh, this are, nonsense. Uh, working on it with uh, Amit K, three and um, uh, you, you know uh, Ravi and uh, Arulanan from SGPGI. Uh huh. Then a uh, uh, project. So it will give us a digital display well, of the length. Of the length, and it will use the same beam as the CO two aiming beam to measure. 
to measure oh so that oh, precise okay because the co2 is invisible it has a um, uh, aiming beam right so yeah. they will use the aiming beam only to measure okay but otherwise some other separate handheld device can be made just like a measuring rod right which we uh, we went with this because we already have a co2 machine and it will already be on the patient when you are yeah our next is ready yeah so last two steps see the laser yeah. beam boom on to the foot plate inferiorly yes and boom kar but now you have yeah. to say boom kar yeah अरे बंद है सक्षम यार सक्षम बंद है हाँ छोटा भी दो टीम विल नॉट गो थ्रू सी ही डिड नॉट Give enough attention to the anterior crust; it is bothering and seeking attention again and again. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to say. Hmm. Section. Oh, See now, nice. this is not. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Point five mm fenestra, which I am going to make for a point four mm piston. This you have to reassess again and again to make the fenestra at a proper step. I hope it is under vision. Yes, yes, yes. nicely seen. Yeah. <coughs> Except the. Ha. Uh, okay. Now, no. So going on to the promontory over. No, no. No. No, it's okay. The footplate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Take it stops the bleeding also the little mucosal uh, oozes children to creates a perfect circular <laughs> so this what piston are you going to use clip clip what clip what a cost one 0.5 hua you na know? yeah yeah 0.5 hua na yeah I, I think moving out. See this. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect, and see perfect the, penetra all around. The all advantage around. of the laser is I don't want mobilization at all. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. And now, last part of this video game is piston. That also no crimping because there is a clip. So, maja nikal diya stepis ka. Dusra lag, mota lag. Give me some instrument, right angle or anything. Do you want to recheck the malleus incus so, mobility before you so put the piston? Pardon? Do you want to recheck the mobility of the malleus and incus yeah, before yeah, you put I, the? I will. So that's I, also another good time when the supra structure is out. It's again a good yeah, idea to check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. Especially since he had yeah. seen on the sea. Incus, other uh, is uh, malleus. malleus. Yeah. Just. Oh, very nice! Yeah, fantastic. I was not yeah. expecting this much. I thought I yeah. would show you mm. intermalleolar ligament resection. Yeah, <laughs> but it's quite a thick mal, thick in case. Yeah. Huh? It's a yeah. stout. Uh, See the fenestra below. Beautiful. So, yeah. Full of parallel. Yeah. Now, once it is full of parallel, whatever blood trickling into the oval window is not going It'll to go float. inside. It will float on it. Yeah. Because pressure inside. With the fluid is more than the pressure outside piston. Yeah, yeah. Just a question: What would happen if blood goes in? Nothing. Huh? Pardon? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> you just get a bloody vestibule, but nothing else. What if the blood goes in? That is the question. What if the blood goes in? First of all, you are not supposed to suck it out. Okay, so leave it there. Yes, obviously. If you suck, you will rather worsen the situation. And this mouth, which is opening onto the incus, see that? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Yeah. This is the bar 
and this is roughly 0.5 millimeter from the lenticular, lenticular process. process. See this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is just gently pushing in. See this medial? Mm. So middle, middle slot of the piston is taking on the incus now. Yeah. And that is all. Mm. See this? Yep. Yeah, story over. There should be no play between the piston and the incus. And it is not at all. Yeah. It's, it's one rigid assembly now. Yeah. Beautiful. See now the piston at the lower end? Yeah, yeah. Blood. Yes. So it's perfect. There's hardly any gap also. So yes. There's no, yeah. It's good. I already measured it was the 4.25 required. Uh -huh. So in stapy surgery, what all required is you know this patient and believe me. These two things have changed the life in our stapy surgery, you know. The laser and okay. the titanium piston. Yeah, absolutely. The uncertainty has gone to a certain extent. The fear has gone. The possibility of the foot plate complications have almost nullified. See that? Perfect. Beautiful. You know? And now, yeah, lastly, blood. a drop of blood. There, Raman, that answers your question. What if the blood goes in? <laughs> it's not going to go. But it, cannot put go. It. it cannot go. No, no, I know, I know. So many things have just been stuck in teaching because of what yeah. we were taught and it gets handed. Yeah, yeah. To the, yeah. And we never learned to question what was, uh, you know. Yeah. So blood can never go in for that matter. If the vestibule is full of perilim, no worries. Yeah. That's why the single thing which we always emphasize, not to suck on the fenestra. But around the same time, Raman, uh, uh, funnily, in the old window? when they were saying that blood should not go in, yeah. for a sunken foot plate, they were saying, put the blood okay. there, let it I clot and then suck on it. Yeah. Which is a very ridiculous uh, technique. Yeah, yeah. I completely condemn it. Yeah. I think it was more of a hypothesis rather than a pull mm. one. Yeah, because the blood cannot clot that much for it to be holding on to the foot plate and coming. Boss, uh, do you advocate the use of rain graft? Sir, 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 sir. Sir, sir. Sir, sir. Sir, sir. Sir, sir. Sir, sir. Sir, so, what is the role of um, uh, hearing a trial preoperatively to give the idea to the patient what benefit will he have? Dr. Girish is asking from Delay. Rather than best, you get the speech discrimination score. Yes, sir. That is most important to predict the hearing outcome in a practical way. SDS should no. be good. It should be good. To give good serviceable and good, uh, you know, uh, hearable hearing, you can say. If the SDS is poor, you are not going to give good hearing to the patient anyway. So that is must. Like audiogram, we must get speech discrimination score done. Yeah, but but as as a as a practical trick, it is a very good idea. Long? What Girish is asking, yes. so the patient sort of knows that that much better is going to be his or her hearing. Yes. Yes. Sort yes. of instill the sense of confidence. It's not so much yes. science, but the art of medicine that it promotes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I don't mic. So this is actually. And sir, uh, what do we do in the anterior malleolar ligament fixation? Fill out and slip it out. Okay. So first of all, you have to increase your your take your incision more anteriorly. Okay. okay. And then there are different ways of uh, managing it. What okay. ABR and Ashim do, they just take a sickle knife or a curt pointer and just run it around that okay. area. Okay. So, you know, just like you cut the stapedius, sort of used to cut that anterior uh, malleolar ligament. I like to go one step ahead and I like to remove the bone over there. So that it doesn't have any chance of joining yeah. And then it sort of hyper mobilizes the malleus, uh, is my imagination. It's not so much. Okay. So, till the time Satish is busy, uh, like uh, I was saying, uh, 
for patients with uh, advanced otosclerosis as we call it yes sir yes yes so there is an algorithm like so we said get speech discrimination why is it yeah. because if most speech discrimination is less than 30% most yes. for a cochlear implant there is no role for a stapedotomy okay so stapedotomy karke bhi we will not be able to give a serviceable hearing yes okay if speech discrimination is between 30 to 50% then get yes. a ct scan done If CT scan is type two C or three, you have a few classifications: Rotwheels and Simon and Simon, right? So yes, yes. Scan shows advanced disease. Go for a cochlear implantation right then, because as the disease will yeah. keep increasing, it will be tougher for you to put a. Telling you for okay. Yes. Okay. If the CT scan is, um, uh, you know, not showing a two C or a three disease, and airborne gap is more than thirty decibel, do a stapedotomy. Yes. Doctor Ramandeep, oh, my name is Miss Gashar. suppose it happens on the table yes uh, if it not been diagnosed by ct scan in advance and you on table you find kashar over there then how will you manage so uh, uh, i've had uh, this uh, case um, at uh, we were operating at uh, aims patna i was mentoring uh, dr kranti so it happened uh, and uh, later on it showed a uh, dilated uh, uh, i know i, I do remember that case yeah, yeah. so uh, what we did was uh, so number one manitol was uh, started immediately number two the opening was already made but the flow was so much that the speculum was also filling up and putting then was getting tough because of the parallax effect of the perilymph filling the middle ear so we kept a suction in the middle ear kept on uh, uh, suctioning out the uh, you know the perilymph and we put in a piston how uh, long did the how long did it take for the thing how many minutes did you have to drain it out it kept ten, on 10 uh, minutes it was More? a csf uh, uh, gusher yeah and uh, more than that actually and it was just not subsiding so once we put in the piston we got a tight fitting piston we got it filled up uh, that area around it with pad and uh, and uh, put in the graft back we were able to stem the leak hello it flows in so yeah yeah satish yes ashish can you hear me yeah yeah we can hear you yeah so we computer we are ready with the next case as mm. i told you Yeah. this patient is a uh, middle aged patient male patient with a diagnosis on core needle biopsy pre operatively having a parotid swelling of a low grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma and ye kyun hata dete usko and this is a important pathology very common pathology and for everyone it's a pleasure for me to introduce few people who have joined us for this case and let me introduce dikhana let me introduce dr shiva dr shiva kumar thiyagrajan from tata memorial center mumbai boss can you put the picture kyun hatate ho bar bar yaar why are you irritating kyun hata rahe ho hello hello yes yeah, adish we can hear you yeah. so you can see on the screen and it's a big pleasure to have him why the picture going here what the hell you are doing rajiv you are not you are you are, you are not unmute no are you, you getting the picture now yes yes we are getting we are getting the scan picture very well okay we are getting yes usko kuch samajh nahi aata kabhi bhi सर्जन इज what an accomplished academician he is he has published number of papers in head and neck oncology and for everyone he is ent surgeon he is amongst us and he is doing head and neck oncology as a career in tata memorial he is associate professor there last time you remember we had dr devendra choker so devendra yes, and yes. shiva are working in the same unit devendra is heading the department and it's a pleasure watching these people operate every time with new things to learn Thank you, Dr. Shiva, for being with us. 
Yeah, thank you for those kind words. Uh, pleasure is mine to join you. Thank you. And I was enjoying the uh, stepidectomy also. Oh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> thank you. Shiva, and, stepidotomy. <laughs> yeah, stepidotomy. Yeah. It's quite some time you can realize. Next yeah, person, I know. And then we have our own Dr. Ashna Parik on the screen. She's our pathologist. Um, I've been eating her head day and night, you know, in Jaipur. We pity and her. And she's the one I always <laughs> mention who provides us round the clock frozen section facilities. Frozen. Yes, yes, frozen. Yes. Round the clock. And she is amazing. You know, I've been uh, working with him in association for last more than 15 years. She has worked in Mumbai, Tata with Dr. Borges and many, many stalwarts in Mahavir Cancer Hospital in Jaipur and now in her own center and has an extremely, uh, you know, accomplished pathologist as far as the oncopathology is concerned. She has a special interest in oncopathology and today also for this patient and I will, I will ask Dr. Shiva as well. We got the co ultrasound guided core needle biopsy and we got this information of, uh, you know, uh, low grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. For everyone in parotid, it's unlike thyroid, the FNSC is not always so conclusive. Owing to the regions, I will ask madam, I know because of the varied, you know, cell types in the parotid as compared to the thyroid, it is difficult to distinguish the lesions. There are, parotid is one gland which can give diverse histologies. Only one gland can give more than 20 kinds of cancers originating from the parotid. It is amazing and to classify into distinct pathologies is a difficult task, particularly preoperatively on the basis of FNSE alone. So we have now made a habit of, you know, getting USG guided core needle biopsy to get more information. It gives you a proper core of tissue. So many a times if you have a doubt of lymphatic malformation, lymphatic, you know, tumors, you can get the material for immunohistochemistry as well. So first of all, madam, Yes. Thank you so much, Satish. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I don't know whether I actually deserve it or not, but yes, oh, it's a pleasure you working with more. you. You deserve much more. You are the backbone of my oncology practice. Thank you so much. And uh, this case, we have three experts now. Uh, Madam uh, Farida Wadia, Dr. Shiva, and Madam Arshana is here. So, Madam, just one question. Yeah. How do you rate still FNAC? Or when do you advocate core needle? Or to all core needle or to selected and when? Uh, see, in 80% of the cases, we can have a diagnosis on fine needle aspiration cytology. But if you want to have a higher accuracy, it's always a core needle biopsy, which is better because then you preserve the tissue for further studies. If you need molecular testing later on, if you need IHC later on, then it's of course uh, a tissue core, which is more important. And more importantly, in an FNAC, you may you are just going into a single track. So you may miss out the other cell types which are there in the uh, tumor. So uh, for that matter, we need uh, true cut or core biopsies. But this trend is, this is not a similar trend you see everywhere. Let me ask yeah. Dr. Shiva. Shiva, what is the current trend at Tata? So uh, we would uh, generally get an FNAC alone. So uh, we would not do a core biopsy in a, I mean, it's not a routine practice, maybe once in a way, but we would definitely uh, always recommend doing an FNAC and it will be always better if you can get an ultrasound guided FNAC for a better yield. But whatever you get it, I think the most important person here is your pathologist. So your pathologist uh, should be able to tell with whatever yield you have. And, um, and uh, the pathologist mostly do report it uh, pretty well with an FNAC itself. But I think, I mean, uh, Madam can correct me if I'm wrong or add to this. Mostly they will be able to tell you whether it is benign or malignant. Yeah, that, that right? with certainty we can say whether it is yes. benign or malignant. Can I, malignant. Can I ask one really? thing, Dr. Shiva? So, yeah, how but, many times, how often your FNAC diagnosis is corrected by frozen and final histopathology? And how do you, you know, handle this? 
So uh, the thing is that many of the times we do get some sort of a tissue diagnosis because patients are operated from outside and come to us. So we do have a, a fair bit of idea as to what uh, the malignancy is. And if the patient comes, uh, you know, a treatment naive to us, we usually go with an FNAC. Now, having, uh, you know, uh, uh, working in an oncology institute, our suspicion is always high. We always think in terms of a malignancy than not thinking in terms of it. So our approach is always like as though we are dealing with a malignant tumor and not a benign tumor uh, as often that uh, we would uh, like to do. So we always go with an FNAC. And our pathologist definitely will be able to uh, tell us whether it's a benign malignant. If it is malignant, it's a low grade or high grade. Now, it's difficult for a pathologist to tell with an FNAC if it is a you know, mucoepidermoid or a salivary duct carcinoma or whatever it is, for which you need more tissue, For in which case a core biopsy might be useful. But so that is the only indication for core biopsy for you? No, we, we definitely, we, I mean, we don't routinely do a core biopsy. If you could look at any guidelines, if also... If imaging dictates like lymphoma or something, then... Yes, if an FNAC, I mean, our pathologist, again, are the key person. They'll tell you it is likely to be a, a lymphoma, right? In which case, we can consider a core biopsy in, uh, or maybe a superficial paratrodectomy for better staging of the uh, lymphoma. Any, so, any time you advocate open biopsy in this era now? No, never. We, we totally condemn open biopsy and if at all, a core biopsy, that too in certain circumstances. But if you have a good pathologist with you, FNAC is good enough. Okay, that's important. Madam, Farida, Madam, you do anything different? Uh, no, Satish, whenever we, whenever we have observe a lymph uh, parotid tumor and uh, the repeated FNAC is that it's from a lymph node, then definitely that patient goes in for a core biopsy after having missed out a lymphoma like that about three years ago. So now when ask, there is anything of the lymph node in a parotid, it's always a core biopsy. Any reservation against getting core biopsy done? Because it has been proven by several studies it is as safe as FNAC. It doesn't lead to any implantation in the tract or anything because you use a, you know, a bigger needle. That, no, it's, but it definitely gives you a much better tissue than FNAC. FNAC, you know, the FNAC gives you just morphological idea. It gives you histopathology as such and it has definitely distinct advantages. What is the reservation in uh, not getting core biopsies done so often? So if I can just take that question, it's not uh, the implantation theory is uh, not a first thing that comes to your mind. The problem is damaging the branches of the facial nerve if at all. Now with your ultrasound, uh, you never know how the nerve is placed in relation to the tumor. Sometimes it can be superficial, sometimes uh, rarely, and many a times it will be deeper. So the chances are that you could damage the uh, branches I of the facial nerve. I think that is remote because most of the tumor else. are in the superficial lobe and agreed. most of the time the nerve is deeper. And they agreed, agreed. Uh, but then it also depends on, uh, you know, if it was... Uh, uh, that not that common an uh, incidence. I, I'm, I I won't be able to quote literature on this as to what is the incidence of uh, you know uh, facial nerve damage after a core biopsy. But that's a theoretical risk that you run. But I don't see an added advantage of a core biopsy because again we, the minimum surgery that we do is a superficial parotidectomy. Uh, so we don't practice a, a, a nodulectomy or anything of that sort. So we would rather do a superficial parotidectomy and send it for frozen rather than do a core biopsy. Because if okay. pathologists tell us that it's a low grade or I mean benign malignant and if it's a low grade or high grade, we will counsel the patient, patient accordingly. And then we would run it for frozen and in frozen, our pathologist will be able to tell you more certainly as to what it is. See, and our decision is a, will change this, on table. Yeah, this is the biggest advantage in Tata with the backup of yes. frozen facility for every case. And that too with the experts. Tata is the place, I call it like Mecca for oncology and the frozen backup is amazing. The pathology department probably the strongest one in Tata. So I, I display the si slide with a low grade and high grade malignancy. Uh, boss, uh, boss, boss, one, boss yeah. one, one second boss. Does the, uh, does your decision regarding the FNAC and core biopsy also depends upon the consistency of the tumor? I mean, if it's a solid or a cystic. Not really, not really. Actually, when we do core biopsy, FNAC, number one, many a time imaging findings in hand before FNAC or core biopsy. And according to the imaging, we take a decision of core biopsy. Sometimes you have a solid cystic lesions and then we need always direct with the ultrasound guided to take the biopsy from the solid area. And then sometimes you suspect 
a malignancy like we always take a core biopsy our our protocol is like this but tata is a good backup now this is why that's why i'm asking dr shiva again this is a list of low and high grade tumors you know and in parotid you have to take decision accordingly with a pre op finding of a low or high grade tumor what you are operating your you know your extent of surgery your extent of post operative treatment everything your extent of neck dissection everything depends upon the distinction between low and high grade how do you cope up because this pre op diagnosis of fnse may not always exist correct regarding the low and high grade how do you take the advantage of frozen or what so that's right so uh, as i already mentioned fnac is just to ha have those dis differentiations that i already mentioned and then uh, our main decision making uh, regarding the, the other thing that i have also mentioned is the minimum Connect. surgery that we do is a superficial parotidectomy nothing less than that so if you have to do a total conservative parotidectomy or anything beyond that is when the frozen comes into play and your uh, true uh, your core biopsy may not change that decision because that's an intraoperative decision that you'll take and also to some extent your imaging that you have and uh, so our um, decision making as to and also the neck dissection if you would tell us again because of the uh, backup of frozen we always do a level 2 sampling when we have a diagnosis of a malignancy and if whether there is low any, grade or high grade whatever sorry whether it is pre op low grade diagnosis or high grade you'll always so, take level 2 sampling yes because anyway you'll have to be there uh, to get your post treatment of diag uh, you know diagnostic as your landmark so we would always sample if it is yeah. a malignancy be it low if it is malignancy right? if you have pre op diagnosis of malignancy in hand yes because we are doing only fnac right even if your fnac may say low grade but you can have surprises uh, on table when you send the full specimen so that's it. Though, so that's why but you must be having imaging all the time in your hand absolutely we do as as of today we do a minimum of the minimum workup that for a parotid is an fnac and a mri Am I? Yes. Can I, I ask think... at this place to uh, Arshna, Madam, and you all, what do you expect from a frozen section from your pathologist? First, uh, Shiva and uh, Farida, Madam. So uh, again, see, uh, you already started the session by saying that uh, in parotid. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. In parotid, that it it has a plethora of diagnosis. Yes. A plethora of diagnosis. You know, it, a, a benign can be malignant. A benign, malignant can turn out to be benign. Unlike parotid, where you have only four uh, types of uh, you know differentiated thyroid cancers and a good uh, you know uh, reporting system, we don't ha we lack one in the th in the parotid. Unlike the thyroid, so here you need the high HC backup to come to an actual diagnosis. The morphological structure of what you see under the microscope can guide you to a, to some extent. But then with your IHC. the diagnosis totally changes i think madam can uh, correct me if i'm uh, wrong there so no no what i mean to ask what you want so from pathologist exactly. your margin so in, whether it is malignant or benign grading. Yes, exactly so yeah, that's what i'm coming to benign. now yes. if it's got a lot of cystic component you can think in terms of low grade malignancy if it's a core biopsy the the pathologist is always very happy because he has more tissue to diagnose and yeah. some it's I mean, with my pathologist, when I give him a core biopsy, very rarely is sprung up the uh, post-operative tissue diagnosis of it being a highly malignant tumor as compared to a low malignancy. So over here, okay. I'm blessed with a pathologist who can tell me definitely whether it is high or low grade, uh, and we correlate it with our MRI findings also, and the nodes yes. which are present also. So it is not Dr. just Shiva. on the. Okay, Shiva. Uh, Madam, I am coming to you. Yeah. Dr. Shiva, you mentioned the minimum operation for a malignancy superficial parotidectomy. That's right. So when you send the superficial parotidectomy specimen for frozen, yes. Do you expect any information on the intraparotid lymph nodes on frozen? No, I I don't expect in, in uh, I mean that's difficult to tell for the para, uh, pathologist in uh, limited sections that they would take on frozen to tell exactly whether whether the intraparotid lymph node is involved or not. So that's why we always send a level 2 you know sampling for the lymph node so in the parotid specimen what i expect my pathologist to tell me is whether it is a low grade or high grade and if they can tell me if it is mucoepidermoid or you know sebaceous or salivary duct i am happy to you know get that have the diagnosis as well but the moment oh. they say it is high grade then i tell myself that we need to do a minimum of a level 1 to 3 neck dissection here and a total and, parotidectomy as well yeah that depends on your finding if you have a good cuff of tissue around the tumor you know we'll and away from that. the nerve then we are okay with that so we even, even if it is high grade 
Yeah, even if it is high grade, if the tumor, it depends on the tumor size as well. High grade alone may not dictate the extent of uh, uh, parotidectomy. It also de depends yeah. on the size of the tumor. You know, why I ask this? I've gone through a lot of papers recently showing the intraparotid lymph nodes in the superficial lobe dictates the need of elective neck dissection even if the neck is N0, number one. Number two, since they are in connection with the deep parotid lymph nodes, if you have any single intraparotid lymph node positive in a superficial lobe, it dictates you to do a complete parotidectomy, total parotidectomy, and an elective neck as well. Now, can I ask Madam, uh, Arsana Madam, can you give us information about the intraparotid lymph node? In no, that yeah. particular given yeah. period of time. Can yeah. I just... Um, madam, if if, is it, yeah. if it is okay, I can just come, uh, you know add to what Dr. Uh, Satish Jain has already said. The intraparotid node, the majority, there are about 15 to 20 nodes and majority of the nodes are in the superficial lobe itself. You would hardly have yeah. three to four nodes in the yes. deep lobe. So doing a deep lobe parotidectomy for the nodal clearance is a myth, I would say. Uh, and also the involvement and the literature is divided and whatever literature is there, it's probably a sporadic case report and things like that. So that is why, and the first echelon from the intraparotid that it goes to the neck is to the level two. So that is that is why the other strategy is because the pathologist may not be able to sample that node within the parotid. Level it becomes difficult. So that's why level two sampling is done because that's the first echelon of the parotid of, apart from the intraparotid nodes. Madam, you can take over. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I would like to comment on four things over here. The first is FNAC. The second is a core biopsy. The third is the lymph node, which you mentioned. And the fourth is intraoperative cytologies, which we can do. So intraoperative cytology is a complementary technique to frozen section. So while we are doing the frozen section, what I do is I take scrapes and imprints from the cut section of the uh, gland which you have sent to me and that gives me additional material to study that is why uh, fnac becomes the basic test but if you are able to differentiate whether it is a benign or a malignant it's fine benign you don't need to go for any other test if it is malignant then of course you need to go in for a frozen section or a core biopsy whatever as a surgeon you decide or based on the basis of imaging modalities and then if you decide to go in for a frozen section rather than a core biopsy then uh, as i just now mentioned we have an advantage of doing an intraoperative uh, cytology with the frozen section because we have a limitation of the number of frozens that we can take because that would lead to a loss of the tissue but when you do an intraoperative cytology you are cutting multiple sections which you would in any case need for your permanent sections and from those intraoperative uh, scrapes or imprints uh, we can always give you a diagnosis whether the lymph node because you can identify the lymph nodal tissue and an imprint the lymph lymphoid tissue is surrounding the cells or whatever, you know, that's uh, the studies that we have done uh, over a period of uh, 10 years. So uh, if you send it for a frozen section, of course, we can diagnose, uh, de uh, detect a lymph node in that. There are techniques, if we put it in the uh, formalin with more of water and less of formalin and that helps us identify the lymph node because it's slightly pinkish in color and the remaining gland it, it is grayish white in color so number one is we can detect the lymph node on that number two we can do an intraoperative cytology number three we can give you a diagnosis on frozen section and number four when the permanent section comes we can uh, send it for uh, further studies which is ihc if you if then you need for a prognostic workup and you can do the various antibodies uh, prognostic antibodies and progressive tumor markers yeah, that is uh, this is something i have always it's observed that that is sending most of the specimen for immunohistochemistry particularly in the parotids because of the diverse histological you know uh, tumors so the immunohistochemistry is a big role in prognostication post-operatively. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember in particularly in the mucoepidermoid, if you have a MUC1 positive, that is considered to be one of the most aggressive cancers. And then you have to take the adjuvant therapies in action accordingly. So the markers has a big role. Yes, Madam Farida, Madam. No, no, I was saying uh, Dr. Archana has really given us a lot of information. Some of it I was not even aware of. I am so blessed. About the imprint that she does from the frozen, very informative. 
Uh, I am so happy to have a pathologist like her giving me complete information, not only pre-op or post-op specimen, the way she frames the detailed report is something amazing. And it is really useful in planning the post-operative adjunct therapy. Now, coming to the next part, imaging. Like Dr. Shiva had already mentioned, for the parotid malignancies, he would minimum have an MRI. And this is a very, very important you know, information coming from him. It is really important. MRI can give you lots of information, and that has a big role in surgical planning. It has a big role in improving your pre-op diagnosis as well, whether it is benign or malignant, because there are certain features on MRI on the basis of which you can reach to the level that this patient has a benign or malignant lesion. Let me take you quickly through some of the sequences we get done in MRI. First and the most important sequence we get done is a T2-weighted sequence. Let me put T2-weighted here first. Uh, mm, this one. This is T2-weighted sequence. T2-weighted sequence, if I run this, you see this tumor here to be a hypodense lesion. More the cellularity is, less the density on T2-weighted, and that goes in favor of many a times in malignancy. Not a specific sign in all cases, but number one, information you can get like this. Number two, the location of the tumor. See, if I take both the coronal and the axial together, let me put it again. This is axial, and now I will take the coronal here. Now, the help of these two sequences, I can reach to the level of involvement in the parotid. See this? Yes. This is the parotid lesion, which is here on this T2 weighted with some cystic spaces in between. Can you see this? This is a strong relevance in your planning. And see, this is lying in the upper part of the gland. The lower part is relatively free. See, this lower part of the parotid is not involved. This lesion is mostly in the upper part. This gives you complete information about it. Number two, you can see the cup of normal parotid tissue around. See, this is mandible. This is retromandibular vein. Can you see? Right. That dictates you whether this tumor is in the superficial lobe or a deep lobe. This tumor is truly in the superficial lobe. And in the superficial lobe as well, the facial now being in a close proximity to the retromandibular. In this particular tumor, we have no concern with the facial nerve involvement as far as the, you know, the cup of normal tumor taking around the lesion is concerned. Because you have a good cup of tumor around, which is completely normal, involving the completely normal parotid, and the facial nerve is no way close to the tumor. Had this tumor been coming close to the facial nerve, would have been a big concern. On imaging, there are a lot of publications saying, in spite of a normal functioning parotid, the facial nerve, if you have a tumor going involving both superficial and the deep lobe, that to a malignancy, the chances of preservation of a functional facial now are very dim. So that's how you can prognosticate as well. Now the number two sequence I would put up here is the contrast. Let me put up here, this is the axial contrast and this is the coronal contrast. Now, once it comes to malignancy, you know, the contrast imaging is very, very important. This is axial and this one I will put the contrast because the malignant tumors are supposed to take up contrast avidly. Now see in this, this particular tumor being a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. See this tumor here, right in the upper part with avid contrast enhancement and some cystic spaces. This is very, very important in prognostication, particularly in mucoepidermoid. Because mucoepidermoid can be low grade, intermediate and high grade. And this is decided on the basis of histology. Whether it is more of mucus secreting, more of epidermoid component, the cellularity. And this patient with the cystic spaces, it is more likely to be a low grade epidermoid carcinoma. Right. Though it is a histological diagnosis, but you can corroborate well in the imaging as well. Had this been a completely cellular dense tumor, yeah. I would level it as a high grade on imaging and corroborate on histology. So this is corroborative, not hard and fast. You can have a fairly good idea. Number three, when I put up, you know, when I put up the diffusion MRI along with, this gives me 
another information about the malignancy maybe this tumor is containing let's see this is diffusion mm. and what i want to show at the same level of the tumor see this the lot of mucoid content in this tumor lot of mucoid content and there is no restriction high diffusion that means it cannot be a high grade cancer see what diffusion weighted mri is diffusion weighted mri is a bio imaging it truly gives you a complete information about the cellularity of the lesion more the lesion cellular is more will be restriction and more it will be darker less less the cellularity more water content and there will be more diffusion so you can have a fairly good idea particularly in parotid malignancies particularly in larger malignancies if it is a high grade or a malignant tumor so on imaging you can have a fairly good idea whether it is involving superficial lobe or deep lobe or both lobe whether it is diffusely involving the soft tissues around the muscles or the external artery canal mandible anything you can have a good idea on mri itself you don't need a ct scan even for the bony involvement these days because mri gives complete information and third on diffusion you can have additional help and fourth is the extent of lesion in planning your approach and fifth is the lymph nodes see this this is the level 2 lymph node here this is the parotid i am going down i am going down and this is the level 2 here i am going down here this is level 2 there are some lymph nodes very small not looking like any level 3 level 4 no lymph node no lymph node at all so i don't see any classically malignant lymph node which looks like malignant on imaging in this patient to me this is n0 not only clinically but radiologically as well and this is a good information i need to have pre op dr shiva tata has a amazing radiology backup i know from the times when supreeta arya was there yeah uh, i she's uh, not in tata now yeah she's an excellent radiology radiologist is a huge yeah, department absolutely. there absolutely and anything else you get on radiology uh, any more information on dynamic or any studies you get done there no uh, as much as uh, what is required you already uh, alluded to uh, so the other thing that probably the other imaging that you would we would get done other than the local imaging is if the pathologist tell me on fnac uh, that it's a high grade tumor then we would do a minimum of a ct thorax or uh, you know just to see if there's any distant metastasis especially if they say it's adenoid cystic we would get a ncct thorax just to see if there is any lung mets because we so know adenoid lesions adenoid lesions adenoid even a small adenoid cystic uh, i mean it depends uh, adenoid yes. cystic definitely has a tendency to have a small yes. lung mets yeah so Here, just a baseline even one information i want to pass in even if they do have a metastasis in the lung in an adenoid cystic that's not a contraindication for surgery because yes. uh, it's such a baseline and the lung lesion can be observed yeah. and you could operate on the adenoid you know, cystic parotid. is generally a slow growing tumor in yeah, spite of a, what the dr shiva is saying in spite of a distant metastasis yeah. we need to treat primary to improve the survival and that but, is indicated in those tumor but if it is anything else other than an adenoid cystic even if it is a high grade mucoepidermoid or a salivary duct carcinoma then uh, if it's a distant metastasis then we would uh, and if it, if by chance you get a pre op diagnosis of a salivary duct carcinoma we would definitely do a pet scan to rule out a distant metastasis okay can i get a clarity on one thing like you mentioned about distant metastasis yes in parotid malignancies yes for audience when would you order a pet scan that's exactly the point if it is a high grade tumor like for example if you have a pre op diagnosis like uh, like for us as i already said patient come to us with some sort of a surgery being done outside so we have a tissue diagnosis and we uh, and we have a tissue diagnosis of a salivary duct carcinoma a high grade tumor a high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma that's when we would get a uh, you know distant metastasis work workup done for an adenoid cystic only a ct thorax is good enough because adenoid cystic going beyond the lung is very very rare but if it is a high grade mucoepidermoid or if it is a you know a salivary duct carcinoma anything of those yes. kind of high grade are, yes. uh, you know histopathology very... that's when we do a pet scan and rarely you do get patients who come with multiple neck nodes with a high grade tumor and that is another indication when we do a distant metastasis work up oh great so uh, another thing like uh, dr shiva mentioned here i would like to mention in imaging as well if you have adenoid cystic which has a high propensity to give perineural invasion you can pick up best on mri mri can give you complete information of the perineural invasion of the facial nerve many a time we have seen the perineural invasion extending along the facial nerve into the mastoid 
and you can pick up very well with the enlargement of the mesh enlargement and enhancement of the facial now on parotid in right from the parotid to the mastoid along the facial now and that is a sign of perineural invasion we must keep in mind particularly for adenoid cystic like you mentioned i can see on the screen dr deepak dalmia deepak before we start surgery you want to add on something yeah i want to ask few questions satish hello ah shiva yes can you hear me yes 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 you are audible one thing is uh, about uh, relationship of the tumor with the retromandibular vein in imaging is there any role to study that whether the retromandibular vein is lateral or medial so that we can make the diagnosis the tumor is in the deep lobe or superficial yeah, lobe yeah yeah i have already mentioned uh, deepak see oh. this retromandibular as the name applies is behind the mandible see this is mandible and this is the vein yes. as most of the parotid tissue we all know 80% of the parotid is superficial to it it's an imaginary yes. plane the yes. facial now runs along the depth of the retromandibular nerve vein mm. and this minimal 20% of the gland less than 20% is the deep lobe yes. so this is an imaginary line and on imaging we can pick up we can't pick up the facial nerve so easily so what yes. we take into consideration is the retromandibular nerve which runs in close proximity that's why And it is important thing, one more thing i want to know if the patient as you said in the imaging we can make some diagnosis it is a malignant or not and if it is appears to be malignant and fnc is showing benign and that you patient is not having uh, facial palsy in spite of uh, appears to be malignant then how you counsel and yeah that's what i asked shiva before then. he has already so answered on table you plan yes he has answered twice number 1 so, Yes, yes, Shiva. Yes, you know you you can uh, encapsulate, or I don't mind repeating it again. So he has answered twice. Number one, the surgery for the parotid, whether it is benign or malignant, the minimum is superficial parotid acne. And even if it is malignant, you have a doubt. Your superficial parotid acne is an answer. Complete answer. Number one. Secondly, what this he said? We always follow with the frozen section. Always follow with the frozen section. and that substantiates your diagnosis if it is a malignant if some need yeah mai abhi sirf heavy man needed if some change is needed in your surgery you can accordingly take take steps intraoperatively mai ko wahan pe ja ke buddhon mein board nahi hona anything you want to add on dr shivani yeah so kisi ki awaaz aa rahi sorry uh, there was some cross my question is regarding sacrificing or saving the facial nerve so that uh, sacrificing also. the facial nerve uh, so that's what so that's why that's where the pre op fnac is very crucial so based on what your pathologist tell whether it's a you know benign malignant and malignant if they are able to tell you if it's a low grade or a high grade then accordingly you can counsel the uh, patient as to what will be the extent of surgery in terms of a parotidectomy and the need for neck dissection and also if the patient doesn't have a pre op palsy then we also counsel oh, yeah. that your on table decision oh, of yeah. saving the nerve will depend on the proximity of the tumor to the nerve and how much of the nerve is involved so that is a totally on table decision and we cannot take any decision based on the imaging so even your radiologist we all, all often have have this discussion as to whether they can locate the facial nerve in your, in your mri now they actually cannot pinpoint the facial nerve in the mri as uh, as far as the mri is concerned what they can say is the relationship of the tumor to the retromandibular vein which already has been mentioned so if the tumor is anterior to the uh, or lateral to the retromandibular vein that means you it's probably away from the nerve if it is involving the retromandibular vein which is encased or the tumor is going medial to it that means probably a nerve is at risk and also the stylomastoid foramen area if the tumor is extending to, towards your stylomastoid foramen area then that again is an indication that your nerve would be at risk so the it's very difficult task again for the radiologist to pinpoint as to where the nerve is in a parotid so it's just based on the relationship to the retromandibular vein satish just one more question i want to ask you to you and shiva that suppose if the tumor malignancy is just involving superficially the facial nerve not grossly involving the facial nerve so you sacrifice it or shave it or post operatively by radiotherapy you manage it because yeah. the function of the let facial nerve is normal yeah. this let is me yes. uh, uh, answer while washing up uh, yes. uh, deepak okay. first of all facial nerve is important for the function we all know yes but if you are operating on a malignant lesion and leaving some tumor for the sake of preserving the nerve 
assuming that you will control with the adjuvant school. therapy is something not acceptable number 1 any yes. primary malignant tumor you are leaving behind assuming that your adjuvant therapy will take over and control this this is just a joke i tell you it adjuvant means adjuvant that is not primary treatment for primary oh. treatment <laughs> for a malignancy should be a radical surgery for facial now if the tumor is closely adherent to it not involving the nerve per se is still in a low grade lesion i can preserve the facial now but looking at a high grade histology and the tumor is adherent to the facial now which requires sacrificing even if it is pre op functioning i would not think twice to give a good oncological clearance <coughs> adjuvant therapy doesn't mean you leave the primary tumor behind and take control with the adjuvant therapy let's take dr shiva's opinion yes <coughs> boss can you unmute shiva yeah so i do agree that uh, we have to get an uh, r0 clearance Uh, as far as malignancy is concerned no doubt about that but your round table decision as to whether to save or sacrifice the facial nerve is very crucial as to when you would save it and when would you you know go on to sac uh, sacrifice it you rightly mentioned that the grade of the tumor has a role to play in this and also if it is totally you know and also whether the patient's uh, nerve is functioning or not functioning if the patient's nerve is not functioning and if there is a tumor all around the nerve there's no point saving that uh, you know that ner nerve anyways but then the question comes that when it is not when it is functioning and you have the uh, nerve in close proximity what do you do with the nerve now the question here is when you can get an r0 clearance meaning to say that you have a some amount of cuff of paraffin tissue that you can you know get, uh, remove saving the nerve that should always be an uh, that should always be an effort the effort is that whenever possible we have to save the nerve that is the basic dictum whenever possible a functioning nerve now that is not at the cost of uh, r plus resection no you cannot leave behind the disease yes. as rightly said so so that, that that is a very fine balance that you have to make so that has to that will vary uh, on case to case basis you know uh, there's no can no I add right on or one wrong thing? can i add on one thing yeah deepak you can take uh, for this decision to investigation into consideration number okay. one your imaging your imaging will tell you how close you are on the facial nerve and that will require an intraoperative decision number 1 right. number 2 a pre op electroneuronography of the facial nerve there are so many publication we have done in our practice as well the nerve which is abutting where the tumor is abutting right on to the nerve pre op nerve absolutely functioning pre op electroneuronography showing 50% reduced response that means that now when you are going to handle is going to go keeping an anatomically intact now is not so important as compared to a functional now and regarding this idea of the functionality idea of you know the possibility of preservation this pre op electroneuronography is a great tool along with the imaging these two can help you uh, taking your decision better yeah so again uh, just uh, extending what was said instead of the pre op neuronography which uh, you can get it done for academic reasons but if you have an intraoperative nerve monitor that will be of good use you can put yes, it to good use very important. so that is that is what is going to actually guide you as to if you have saved some anatomical structure whether it is actually functioning on table or not that that will be a good thing for a medical legal purpose also that you have saved the nerve and it's functioning even if you have saved and it's not functioning whether it's worth leaving behind especially if you have this doubt of whether you have had a good oncological resection or so intraoperative nerve monitoring definitely will help yes yes definitely now coming to the surgical steps are you getting any picture yes yeah, yes oh yeah uh, this is microscopic picture dr shiva i always do parotidectomy thyroidectomy all these under microscope and uh, there are certain distinct advantages doing under microscope which i am going to enumerate some people use loops as well i have seen you doing naked eye as well so good so it's a matter of you know how you are used to but microscope definitely has a you know advantage secondly coming to the surgical steps the first step the incision to me is the most vital step we have discussed during the facial nerve session when i demonstrated one parotidectomy all these but here again 
the initial incision has lot of bearing in terms of you know this thing cosmesis in terms of preservation of the posterior branch of the greater auricular in terms of preventing fresh syndrome and in terms of when you raise the flap anteriorly you can injure the facial nerve branches as well so in terms of protecting all the nerve branches so the incision and the flap raising has lot of bearing which i am going to share with you so the first part regarding cosmesis see i am showing with a microscope my picture uh, you know the area may constrict i'll keep changing so the first step what we do we make this pre operative you know pre auricular incision and then rather than going on to the pre auricular region we take the incision behind the tragus to make it more cosmetically acceptable number 1 and then around the lobule see this incision by and large more by and large it is hardly any uh, visibility you know this is more cosmetically acceptable then obviously this occipital component and and then the cervical component according to the need as in this patient i am going to do a classical superficial parotidectomy by and large number 2 as i mentioned besides the cosmetic part the number 2 please feel free to interrupt me any time dr shiva yeah. madam please we need your input for the benefit of everyone this is a pure academic session and we want to learn more and more from everyone so, so if i can just uh, just uh, add to the point of uh, you know the magnification that you would like to use in a parotid surgery yeah so uh, there is all often a question debate discussion as to uh, what you should do so if you have to uh, so what is the advantage of using uh, you know magnification one is to have yeah, a good let view let me tell you let me tell you no i i'm just ask i mean i'm just speaking okay. as though i'm speaking to okay. a post graduate so that you know okay. as you said it's for the benefit of uh, all so just yeah. telling you so of course you need to have a good vision so that you don't damage crucial structures right so that means to say that you, you to have a lesser um, uh, amount of complication so that is the crux so if you look at literature what sort of magnification has uh, you know has given rise to uh, no, what sort of complications if you compare naked eye with loops with microscope with endoscope you know 3d uh, okay. you know hand holding and uh, holding endoscope is also there which people use so the complication rates are pretty much similar so it all depends on the expertise of the surgeon of course and what they're comfortable with so i want the audience to take home the message that if you're comfortable doing the surgery with a naked eye and your complications rate are pretty less so be it and if you are comfortable doing it with a loop or with some other magnification fine as long as your complication rates are good but yeah we cannot be uh, you know uh, uh, you know let the youngsters not go with the uh, understanding that you have to use some magnification this a loop is better or a, you know microscope is better we don't know that yet any sort right. of magnification which helps you do the surgery well you can do that right now can i add on one point dr shiva yeah please this is uh, the reason you have mentioned about the need of magnification is fine the other reason which for which we emphasize this magnification is the better appreciation of the facial now branches and sub branches you know by and large in oncology the facial now is supposed to have five branches in the parotid by and large the oncologists believe it's not five branches i am going to show you with the microscope n number of interconnecting branches number 1 those small branches are difficult to be visualized naked eye number 1 and those are important in case you happen to damage you happen to give neuropraxia yes. you happen to give neuro neurotmesis and sort of damage to one of the branch if you preserve consciously all those interconnecting branches your chances of spontaneous recovery are much better number 1 this is the biggest advantage for which we use the microscope besides the other reasons you told and this is what you know uh, we always emphasize and here i am going to demonstrate as well see yeah, i i do agree with what you say the intercommunicating communicating branches have been mentioned in literature and the importance of preserving the intercommunicating branches of the facial nerve has always been uh, emphasized but what i'm just trying to say to the youngsters is that let them not go with the idea that this is uh, this magnification is better than that after all by saving those intercommunicating branches you're going relative. to 
Yes. The thing is hard and fast. It's all relative. Yes. So you're going to reduce the complication. That's exactly the point at the end of the day. So by yes. saving the intercommunicating branches, you should pro you probably would reduce the amount of uh, paresis of the nerve. That is that is what it helps in. So that yes. is exactly that was my point. Yes, exactly. Now the second thing, at this point of time, the second advantage or the thing important thing I mentioned about the incision is the prevention of Fraser syndrome. You know, this parotid region is covered by a special tissue. We call it SMAS. That is, this, uh, you know, uh, this fibroaponeuritic tissue lateral to the parotid region is known as some mucus, uh, the, you know, uh, I would say. Musculoaponeuritic uh, system. Some mucus, uh, aponeuritic <laughs> system. So what is this? Why this is important and why this concept is important? First of all, what the Fraser syndrome is. We have seen in our cases earlier, in a couple of cases, when you remove the parotid tissue and some part of the parotid after the superficial parotidectomy, some part of the parotid is left exposed. And when you replace your flap back, if your flap is so thin, your subdermal plexus can come in contact with the postganglionic fibers of the parotid and can lead to stimulation while swallowing, you know, while chewing, while having food. And that can lead to Fred syndrome symptoms. So idea is to elevate this thick flap. Complete SMAS should be elevated here to prevent Fred syndrome. And that can be taken care of during this uh, part of the flap elevation uh, surgery only. See here, what, what my depth of the tissue is, is staying just superficial to the parotid. Staying just superficial to the parotid, this entire SMAS I am elevating. Why this SMAS is named this like this? This area is special because here in the deeper part of the face are muscles of facial expression. And those muscles of facial expression are connected to the dermis through this fibrocollagenous tissues to pass on the facial expression movement from muscle to the skin. This is a specialized area in the body as compared to the other areas where the muscles are used to mobilize the bones. Here muscles are not used to mobilize the bone, but for a special function of facial expression through the movement of the skin. And that is how it is conducted through the SMAS. So, so if I can, if I can just for the you know, uh, benefit of the uh, postgraduates, yes. just how do you identify the, you know, the SMAS is that in the neck, we are always told go subplatysmal below the platysma. Whereas when you come to the face, you have to, uh, you know, uh, keep the plat. Uh, again, the, you should follow the same plane. Initially, it was like you, we were taught that go subplatysmal in the neck and above the platysma in the face, right? So you have to keep the platysma with your flap so that when you put it back, the whatever the tissue does not come straight in contact with the skin. So some amount of muzzle layer should be there yes. on the flap that you raise. So that that is very crucial and important. That is very important. That is exactly what the SMAs we talk about. Yes, and, and for, Satish, even, even you, when you give this incision, you please tell us for the sake of postgraduates, when you give this posterior incision over the mastoid tip, so you yeah. have to take care that it will not go too posteriorly so that the exactly. Exactly. That's a very great point because the uh, Blair's incision, you don't know what the name of the incision is, modified Blair incision. So you may ask, what is the Blair's incision then? So initially, when it was described, the it was an acute, you know, uh, you know, uh, angulation of this incision going all the way up to the mastoid tip. So when you have that acute angulation, then the vascularity becomes qu uh, questionable, and that's when this, you know, it's more or less like a lazy S-shaped uh, curvilinear incision. And to avoid this acute angulation, which goes way too posterior towards the mastoid, to avoid this, uh, you know, necrosis of the skin. So that is very, very uh, important to avoid. So the second part was to prevent the Fraser syndrome and we'll raise this flap. All the way we'll raise this flap deep to the parotid fascia to protect our, you know, uh, to prevent the Fraser syndrome. Yeah. And just for the benefit of the postgraduates, again, if you, anybody wishes to do, they can do this superficial parotidectomy even with your rightidectomy incision. Instead of going anteriorly, you can just yes, go yes, along yes. the hairline. And if you take the hair, uh, hair incision along the hairline inferiorly, you can as well do the neck dissection also with that uh, particular incision. So that's a retroauricular. Nowadays, uh, many of us do a retroauricular neck dissection with a retroauricular incision. So you can as well do the neck dissection. You can do your parotidectomy with the same retroauricular incision. That's just another point. 
Dr. Shiva, are you using this retroauricular and do all this robotic work there in Tata? Uh, we uh, we yes, some of our colleagues do it. I personally do, uh, don't use uh, robotic for this, uh, you know, for a neck dissection as such. But then we use we can just do a retroauricular neck dissection just with an without any uh, you know gadget, just an open retroauricular neck dissection. Many of my colleagues also do it. Satish, you yeah. please tell us when you raise the subplatysmal flap superiorly. So yeah. what care you take to avoid injury to the mandibular branch? Mandibular branch, I will show you. That is, that will come later. Okay. But for mandibular branch, you have to stay right in the, you know, sub uh, platysmal plane, not going deeper to that plane. Stay in the right plane, and I will show you the mandibular branch. And now the most important thing, what I am doing here, is trying to preserve the posterior division of the greater auricular, which sometimes is a uh, has proven to be difficult. But most of the time, we are able to. Preserve it. Now see what I'm trying to show you. Can you see the greater auricular now? Yes. Yes, yes. Can you see this? Yeah, it's yeah. here. There are many tips to identify this now at this level. Number one, see this. This point I have already mentioned so many times in the webinar that is Gonian. The posterior yes. inferior edge of the mandible. Can you see this? This greater yes. auricular now comes out of the McKenzie's point here, McKenzie's point here, where a lot of nerves, sensory, sensory nerves comes out, then running over the sternomastoid. In this part, where it runs over the sternomastoid, is right in the line of the gonian. Can you see the gonian here? Yes. Right in the line of the gonian, you can easily pick up, number one. Number two, one centimeter inferior and parallel to it, many a time we find a branch of the retromandibular vein. So if, if you find the retromandibular vein sometimes, you can have a very good idea about the level of the greater auricular now. That is inconsistent, but many a times you find, find one centimeter below in parallel. Here I can't see. So this point in the uh, neck where you're talking about, I'm not sure if you're, you were mentioning the herbs point. Is that what you're... We call it mechanism point. A lot of people call it as an herbs point. No, herbs that, point uh... to me... Arch uh -huh. point is to me is the point where black hill plexus comes out. No, no, no. The well, herbs point is a classical it. description of where the five branches that comes out along the, the sternocleidal mastoid. It, but this was classically described by Professor Sarnia. You must be knowing Professor Sarnia uh, from uh, Brazil. Uh, Claudio Sarnia, well. yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. And this was initially described by the McKinney who described this point where the five points are coming. A lot of people call it as an up point. But actually, the initial description of the up point in the Gray's Anatomy was referring to where the brachial plexus comes out. Now, people differently describe this point. So, we still maintain that uh, region and call it mechanism point. You can call it whatever is convenient to you, but this is how it was described initially by the McKinney. Now, see. Considering I am not raising my flap so easily, I would have raised by now. What is restricting me is preservation of this nerve. Can you see this? Yes. Now, the, I, I, see this. this nerve, as it goes towards the parotid skin, divides into two branches. The anterior one going to the parotid skin has to go. And it regenerates most of the time because that supplies the parotid skin. And it has numerous interconnections with the trigeminal nerve branches, and most of the time it regenerates. But the problem comes with the posterior branch supplying the auricle, There's the lobule. Don't leave it. The posterior branch supplying the lobule is something difficult, and it has its own morbidity, it's not preserved. And in our series, over 90% of the time, we are able to preserve this. And here again, the microscope helps you a lot. So because if this branch is gone, the resultant anesthesia of the lobule is sometimes not acceptable. It gives a morbidity, particularly to the females wearing the earrings and the people who live in the cold climates. Even if you, you know, uh, uh, get a burn with this in the lobule or anything, you can't appreciate once this nerve is gone. So this posterior branch, our, our version is to preserve it whenever possible. 
it may not be 100% of the time to save this branch but we must attempt it may take your 5 minutes extra but still we can preserve it and i have always demonstrated in our series over 90% of the time we have been able to sometime you have a tumor coming behind and you literally then you don't have to think twice uh, before resecting it but this is important see this it restricted me in raising the flap for last 5 minutes that is the extra time this takes away see this branch i hope it is visible the greater auricular is visible i suppose yes sir yes sir and see here i am taking you to the branches see the branch posterior one is a smaller one the anterior one is a bigger one see this is the posterior branch right can you see this yes yeah. sir well well this is going to the lobule and this we try our best and unless the disease warrants to the clearance of this region we always try to preserve it just additional 5 minutes and see this see this nerve branch going to the root of the auricle very clear see this now having seen this i can easily transect the anterior branch see staying in this region wonderful wonderful Wonderful. Completely taking this cup of tissue around the nerve. Now the anterior one is completely gone. See this? And this way, I will elevate this tissue and separate this branch. This is how you can easily. Now, once you have seen, whoop, that was good. See, this is the posterior branch going to the root of the auricle. Can you see all very clear? Yes, yes, sir. So that was the third advantage in the flap raising. I told you. And to complete the second one to prevent face syndrome, see my elevation of the flap will go in the plane of SMAF. here uh, i have to keep in mind my tumor which is coming laterally so i have to be careful you know to leave a good cup of tissue lateral to the tumor as well ye choda mat kar yaar have you see the level of the plane yes sir immediately lateral to the parotid so that i don't want to leave any tissue or on the other way round i want to keep a thick flap to prevent fresh syndrome now the fourth and the most important part in flap raising whatever good work you have done can be ruined in no time if you are not careful is the anterior extent of the flap see this is platysma what deepak was asking yes yes see stay yes. absolutely subplatysmal uta yes, yes, yes. now the fourth important point here till what limit anteriorly you are supposed to raise the flap if i cross the limit of the parotid and go into the masseter i will end up damaging all the branches running on the surface of masseter so this is a very very important point while anterior flap raising uncha utha ke rakh you are not supposed to go beyond the parotid margin see this yes sir the moment you find your platys my started coming can you see there the masseter started coming can you see this yes can you see all these yes. branches yes yes see this see this all these branches on the masseter if i keep raising flap further beyond i can easily ruin everything without much efforts dr shiva can you see all these small branches yeah yeah seeing that if oh. i have seen people i have seen people doing good parotid surgery and this flap having raised beyond that see this is my limit of the parotid this is my uh, you know platy uh, this masseter and all these small small branches you know all these branches running here 
on the masseter surface you can see all these and number of branches forget about this concept that the plate the fascia now has five branches and number of innumerable small small branches destined for this complex spontaneous expression of smile all these branches see in magnification see how amazing these are can you see yes yes all this yes sir very masseter. clearly this is masseter so this flap raising always instruct your junior not to go beyond the limit of the parotid otherwise he can ruin everything in the beginning whatever nerve preservation you do during surgery is as good as useless once you have cut the nerve distally and this is very very important so this flap raising to me with four goals in mind cosmesis prevention of face syndrome preservation of the posterior division and preservation of the first facial nerve branches distally if you raise the flap properly you can achieve all this goal and otherwise if you give this task to a junior colleague not taking care of any of these and considering this somebody will elevate the flap for you not taking care of all this can ruin everything in no time what a good work you do in parotid sir to me this flap elevation is one of the most important step satish what you said the anterior limit like how much is the superior limit what are the landmarks for superior limit superior limit to me for such tumors i have already palpated the zygoma here my smaf okay. is inserted here and fused with a temporoparietal fascia and this lesion particularly you see this is little superiorly placed we saw on the mri as well so superiorly our limit is generally zygoma and depending upon the condition depending upon the situation you can extend your approach sometimes you know i i demonstrated last time deepak if you remember the mesetric now anastomosis yes and sir in case you have a pre op facial now palsy and you are planning some immediate anastomosis after the surgery after the resection of the facial now i generally go little above to go in the region of the mesetric now and do a anastomosis intraoperatively it has been proven even after anastomosis if you subject the patient for the radiation therapy it doesn't affect the anastomosis at all so it is always the intraoperative reconstruction which is most important so this yeah, is so about the now that you make that point uh, that again for the uh, you know uh, post graduates whenever if you are in a situation that you end up sacrificing the nerve it's very important to reconstruct the reconstruct the nerve at the same point at the, during the same surgery itself because you will not be able to get the planes or, uh, or the you know the surgical field that you desire for a secondary reconstruction yeah, yeah. that's never going to happen so uh, and even if irrespective of whether the patient goes for radiotherapy or not and usually the thing uh, the fear in mind is when you go uh, you know send the patient for radiotherapy the healing how much will the healing happen so it's been shown beyond doubt that the healing happens and the nerve starts to function uh, you know in a good um, amount of time so it's very important that if you happen to resect the nerve reconstruct in the same surgery yes that is very important point you have emphasized again that we need to reconstruct the facial now at the same time otherwise we lose the opportunity for the future you cannot you cannot come back in the same field that efficiently with lot of fibrosis incurred after the previous surgery and then followed by if possible radiation and other things now what i am doing i am working at the level of i am opening this plane of the anterior border of the sternomastoid that will give me two advantages number one that will give me keep my this now behind further behind number two that will help me see my digastric and number three that will open up my level two as well now the parotid surgery revolves around one and one one and only thing that is facial now there are n number of techniques you see in the literature mention for the identification and preservation of facial nerve and if you trying to go to all that will be more and more confusing i have demonstrated several times that the technique we use see so far i am using monopolar i'll tell you the reason the simplest way we have named it as a convergent approach i don't need to look for the facial nerve 
Federation now will come automatically where my two landmarks are going to con converge. That is convergent ap uh, approach. So I will take into consideration two landmarks and my facial nerve will automatically come over there. This is microscopic picture. Hope the picture is good. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, it's good. Hello, Paramita. How is the picture? Yes, very good, very good. Okay, fine. All, no? Let me uh, do a little bit of the hemostasis and then I will come to the convergent approach for junior colleagues. I demonstrated several times. It is the simplest of the thing one can understand how to identify and preserve the facial now, and that is convergent approach. Yeah, uh, I just would like to caution the juniors as well. Uh, this is Dr. Satish Jain operating, so don't try to do this in your first surgery. <laughs> so uh, you can, uh, once you become uh, experienced, you can do that. So the general teaching for the residents that we always say is that once you raise the flap for the parotid with a cautery, then go switch to switch over to your uh, monopola. Because uh, for the new, uh, uh, novice the surgeon, uh, so, bipolar, sorry, switch okay. over to the bipolar, sorry. So for the novice surgeon, it becomes difficult as to understand at what depth you get the facial nerve. So if they use the monopolar, like how uh, you know, a conversant surgeon would use, like how he showed, you might go and damage the nerve. So till you understand the depth, and once yeah. you gain the experience, then you can use your monopolar. But then my, uh, that's what we usually tell our residents that once you raise the flap, switch over to your bipolar. That's an important point, point of caution. And see, to overcome this issue, this conversion technique is the answer. I tell you why. My conversion means I will be using two landmarks which are going to converge on the facial now. So my first landmark, see this is tragus. And this is the cartilage of the tragus which ends medially. Can you see this pointer? Yeah. Everyone, can you see this pointer or not? Yes. Let me... Uh, yes, yes, we can see. Them. See this, this is the pointer. So the, this is the tragal pointer, can you see? Yes. Yeah, this is yes. going to be my superior landmark. Assuming my facial nerve is going to be one centimeter inferior and one centimeter medial to it, number one. Now, as my facial nerve is going to be one centimeter deeper and one centimeter inferior to it, if I use my monopolar cautery in the line of the, you know, tragal pointer, I will be still one centimeter away from the facial nerve. That is one, number one. Number two. I have a safe distance now for working that is one centimeter. But this is only one landmark. Give me another letter here. Now Satish, I... Satish, yes. sometimes as, as you said, as Dr. Shiva already said, ki here you just remember Satish is operating. But sometimes even the imaging, all are not so expert in reading the imaging. Sometimes the tumor is in the deep lobe and the tenting of nerve is there. You have to be careful. Yes. See, deep lobe tumor can push these structures laterally. Yeah. So then the, the situation is altogether different. Yeah. The other, yeah. Sorry. So the other point I'd like to make here is that as you're dissecting here, of course the the convergence of the uh, you know the uh, the cartilage and the posterior bill of digastric is a very uh, constant landmark to identify the nerve. The other thing that you would uh, you know be find it very useful is that before you see the nerve, you'll have a spurter. You'll have yes. this branch of the stylomastoid artery, which is accompanying the facial nerve as it comes out of the stylomastoid foramen. So once you see an active, you know, a well delineated vessel going in the direction of the patient nerve, be aware that you're going to face the, you're going to come, you know, across the nerve just below that somewhere in the tissue. So this artery yeah. is also a very good, you know, a yeah, pointer that towards is the a nerve. Point of caution again that you have to be careful. You are close to this. Yes. Now what I'm trying to say. After having seen the anterior border of the sternomastoid in the depth, what you see, this is digastric. See this? Digastric is a natural landmark given by the god. We know the stylomastoid foramina at the medial end of the foramina, uh, at the stylomastoid foramina, we always take in mastoid surgery the digastric ridge as a landmark. And if we follow the digastric ridge, the facial nerve is exactly anteriorly and just medial to it. Now follow the same thing. This digastric, if you follow, where it no, goes, see, this is my process. This is my process. Centralize. 
Yes. See, this is my mastoid process. This digesting is coming to the mastoid process and where it inserts, my facial nerve will be absolutely just superior to it, where it inserts and deep to the anterior border. Now, what does it mean? See, I am running my artery forceps here, Kelly's, is right on the is right on the digestic surface. As I said, the facial nerve is medial to the digestic. Keeping this artery over the digestic, any tissue coming in between, I can easily cut away and open like a book. It's not this surgery, a lot of people perform with making a, you know, well into this region to look for the facial nerve, made many a times end up damaging the facial nerve. See, I can remove any tissue lateral to the digestive. Can you see now? So the biggest advantage is you don't develop a well. You don't develop a keyhole. It is like an open book. This is my superior landmark and this is my inferior landmark. And now see what I'm trying to see. My digastric is inserting here on this in the digestic process, in the mastoid process and immediately above this level. You need to center the picture a little. Sat yes, yes. Center yes, yes madam. Yes, yes, please. Thank you. See this. Now, where my dag is, wash, wash. Keep this. Uh, this is a very important step. See I, what I told you in the beginning. Just a moment. No? Just above my digestive, where it inserts here. One centimeter below and one centimeter deep to the tragal pointer. Just above my digestic insertion. Can you see the facial now? Yeah, beautifully. Can you see? Yes, yes, seen. Seen. Very well. Dr. Shiva. Yeah, yeah, seen, seen well. See, this is the digestic which insert over here. Yeah, yeah. Just above the digestic insertion. See, one centimeter below and one centimeter deep at this point of conversion is the site for facial now. Now, what I mean to say, coming to your point, what you mentioned, which is very, very important. The depth perception, you know. Depth no, I, I said that, uh, you know, keeping in mind what I was going through as a postgraduate. I never had yeah, the yeah, hang very, of very that depth. Very important point. You raised a so very important point. I, I started getting that, uh, you know, uh, hang of it as we started doing more and more uh, surgeries, assisting and then doing. And yes. then that's when we really understood. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. That is very important point you raised. Otherwise, if somebody is not careful about the depth, can end up easily injuring the facial now. Now, what I want to make point over this point of time for that particular region. As long as you stay above the digestic like this, anything coming over the digestic, anything coming over my artery forceps, I can easily remove. My facial now will always be medial to it. And this way, I will never create a tunnel, a well, or a keyhole. It is like an open book with a, one landmark from above, one landmark from below, yeah. and where they're converging is the facial now. I now, didn't have to look for the facial now at all. Yeah, that's because Satish Jain is operating the surgery. So the nerve is looking at Dr. Jain. To simplify for yeah. everyone. So, but when a when a new person is operating, so the, the way they use the mosquito will not be the same like what Dr. Satish Jain is using it. You, so they will not. They what the te usual tendency is. That's what I used to do when I was a postgraduate. Is to dig in and then take it out. You know. So uh, when they don't, you know, uh, respect the plane. Use the term PLC. Yeah. Stender loving care. So I would not cut any tissue that is coming in the direction of in, in toward in the direction of the nerve till I see the nerve. So what the, we teach the postgraduates or the residents here is that first see the nerve and then cut any tissue that uh, goes in the direction of the nerve. Because if they're not careful, if they don't know how, you know, yes, till they don't have very, the hang of it. Very good standard teaching. I yeah. absolutely agree. So you see the nerve and then cut any tissue, whatever you want, because you might cut that nerve and then it's too late, you know. And then once you gain the experience, of course, your approach changes. But the uh, thing is, we have to simplify rather than terrifying people. No, the this is not. Is, I, I, this I, is I, not terrifying. This is no, costing no, not, the patient. Not, not what about hey, what Dr. you Shiva, said. No, Dr. Yes. Shiva. Now yeah. having having done a lot of parotids naked eye, and now with age using the loop and the microscope, this is yeah. where the loops or the microscopes help. You know. When you, of course, you can learn to identify the tissues which look like a facial nerve and which is exactly the facial nerve. Agreed, ma'am. I agree with you. Experience is the best thing. 
And another thing which I would like you to observe is that when you're using the microscope, this, uh, this uh, thing which you feel that, should I, uh, Dr. Dalmia, whether I should sacrifice this now, whether I preserve this now. So when you're using the microscope and when you see that you can peel it off, yes, yes. malignant tissue of the perineurium, you will be able to save that now. Yes. The, you now get a better... Works, with the microscope, you can make out definitely... Yes. That you whatever you do, even if you preserve you, this now, after some time it's going to go and it's going to cause a facial palsy. So there's exactly no use madam. That now. You get so a better picture. That your microscope helps. You get a better picture. Regarding pic raising the flap and all, you are very correct. But uh, regarding the nerve anatomy and all, I think identifying the nerve and when, when you have this doubt without a facial now monitor, whether it is involved or not, this is where the microscope helps me at least. Yeah. Uh, is there uh, is there anything like this that there is a medical legally needed that we should be having a facial nerve monitor? Not really. So far, for, uh, it has not come in India. It is better to have, I will oh. say. Okay. If you, you if you have it, better. If you don't have it, I'm not sure if anybody can uh, you know sue you for that reason that you don't have it. Okay. Yeah, it's better to have. Uh, there's a question from Mauritius. Dr. Chandra Prakash is asking any precaution to avoid the first bite syndrome? Yes. First, let me tell you what is first bite syndrome. Yes. First bite syndrome generally doesn't happen so easily after the superficial parotidectomy. First bite syndrome happens to occur due to denervation of the sympathetic fibers, postganglionic sympathetic fibers which run along the external carotid artery. So that happens to occur, that may happen. That is not so usual, but when you do a deep lobe dissection or a parapharyngeal dissection around the carotid artery, and mm -hmm. if you injure the parasympathetic, you know, fi sim parasymp uh, the sympathetic fibers along mm -hmm. the carotid artery. Mm -hmm. So that, because of the over denervation, sympathetic overactivity, mm -hmm. and when patient takes the first bite, which involves the parasympathetic stimulus, it adds on to it, and that gives the excruciating pain to the patient. So no, that happens only when the sympathetics along the external carotid are denervated. Yeah. That too, I, I when just... you do either in the deep low where the carotid is or in the parapharyngeal space, but it never happens with the superficial parotid acne. That mo yes. uh, just adding to what uh, uh, Dr. Satish Jain has said is that it happens more so after doing a you know carotid body tumor. Yes, that is parapharyngeal space. That's what. So most of the time in literature, when you just go through it, uh, most of the time because you denervate the sympathetic system, uh, which is there embedded around the carotid system, so that's when you tend to face the uh, you know the patient tends to develop the first bite syndrome rather than in any of the uh, you know parotid surgeries. Even Absolutely. if you end up doing, even if you end up doing a total parotidectomy, and even mm -hmm. if you end up handling the external carotid vessels, mm -hmm. it, I, I, I won't be able to categorically say that never happens, but it may not happen as as often as it happens after doing a carotid body tumor surgery, oh, because yes, you're sir. totally removing the adventitia of the carotid, and along uh, with it goes the sympathetic vessel. Sometimes you, well. sometime you ligate the external carotid mm -hmm. during the carotid body surgery. Okay. Now see. What I want to show under microscope. Can you see the upper division? Yes. yes. And I have dissected all this tissue of the upper division and nowhere I am close to the tumor as yes. far as the nerve dissection is concerned. And yes. that we saw in the imaging as well. Yes. I showed on MRI, the yes. tumor is away from the nerve where the nerve is passing through. That's the value of MRI. And that, that's the value of reading MRI yourself. The radiologist is not going to give this uh, information unless you ask for it. Mm. This is something important. Now yes. see the upper division. This is so important. And lots of branches from the upper division. Under microscope, I can see them all. Yes, sir. There are not five branches only. There are no uh, sir, sir, can you focus a little more, sir? Yes. It is not focused. Oh, why? Better. Why didn't you ask earlier, Arupna? It's okay, but make, make it more focused. Yeah, yeah, I will focus uh, it better. The other point is that while retracting the uh, parotid tissue, we usually tend to use the, uh, the cat's paw. Yes. You know? So that gives you more space and you can actually give a proper, you know, traction, counter traction for dissection. That's what we would use. I'm not sure if that yes. helps you. That is important. What Dr. Shiva has mentioned okay. is a very important point because most of the dysfunction of the facial nerve 
are not because of facial nerve resection. Most of the dysfunction you will see in your practice even after keeping the nerve anatomically intact and the reason is traction. But you have to be very careful in you know the giving traction in the region of the nerve. That's why what we do, we give traction to the superficial component not the nerve and the part deeper to it. So you automatically prevent the nerve coming into the traction. That yes. is what, that's a very important point, Dr. Shiva, you have raised. Yeah. See now, this tumor is here. See, this tumor is here. Yes. And my nerve is there and I am little conscious here, preserving all these small, small branches coming from the upper division. And, and, what and, we remember, and what we remember, the TLC term we use, Satish. Pardon? TLC means just tunneling, lifting, and cutting. So this is the way we remember. First, we have to tunnel, yes, yes. then we have to lift, then cut. Yes, that's a good yes. point. And the other, uh, you know, message for the uh, you know younger you know colleagues is that, or the residents. Is that uh, if at all, even, you know, the nerves are accompanied by small vessels, and as you're dissecting, you, you, uh, you know, there'll be some amount of bleeding that keeps happening every now and then. And uh, sometimes you might get frustrated and, you know, try to go and catch the bleeder. And you have those nerves which are close by. So if you don't give, uh, you know, proper attention, you might go and cauterize the branch of the nerve. So it's also okay that if you're not able to, you know, cauterize it one go, just apply some gentle pressure with a gauze, wait for a couple of minutes, the bleeding will settle. And then you'll be able to see that whatever the bleeder is, and then you'll be able to precisely go and coagulate. So you don't have to be in a to go and catch the bleeder. And in, in the borrow uh, bargain, you might go and damage the vessel. So yeah, yeah. that is one of the sometimes, reasons for damaging the nerve. Common yes, sometimes just apply a gauze piece and just wait for a couple of minutes. The bleeding will settle and then you can proceed again. Now see, I have changed to the lower part first so that I can turn around my specimen. I want to preserve all the branches here, taking the advantage of the microscope. Now you see the retromandibular vein here? Yes, sir. Can you? Yes, it's yes, seen yes, well. See clear. the close relationship of the nerve to the vein. That's why this nerve is a bigger structure, easily identified on imaging. And we assume the level of the nerve where the retromandibular vein is. That's you could see on the imaging how the tumor was lateral to the vein, staying in the uh, superficial lobe. Okay. Yeah. Now see the lower division. See my traction. That is what Dr. Shiva was mentioning. See my yeah. traction is elevating the tissue lateral to it. Yeah. It is not putting any traction on the facial now. Mm. Can you see? Yes. This is the indirect way of preventing the traction on the facial now, and that is most important. Yes. Now see. There are two branches here, major branches. The one go along the nerve that is cervical branch and one which emerge anteriorly that I'm going to show you. Give me the artery. See that? The microscope gives you, you know, confidence that you are not going to miss anything. And that is how... The other thing, other point is, important point is, Sometimes when you raise these flaps, you cut this external jugular vein. So it is not required at all because the facial nerve it is also one of the good landmark. I and mean, there is no need. If you cut this in the beginning, then the venous ooze will be more. Exactly. So, so some of them teach that as soon as you raise, you ligate the you know external jugular vein, which is counterproductive. So it, your surgery tends to become very bloody. The oozing yeah, becomes congestion, more. So, congestion. Yeah, yeah. It becomes congested. So it's better not to do that until unless you're forced to do it because of some other reason, like by accidentally you've damaged it or the tumor is close to it for reasons such as that, but not as a routine step. See now this now. Can you see all these small yes, small yes, nerves? Yes, yes. See, let me just for the sake of demonstration show you under magnification. See this. All small, small nerves you can protect. And see number of interconnecting branches. Number of yes. interconnecting branches. See, our yes. goal is to preserve many of them. It is not the facial, uh, you know, preservation of the facial nerve. It is a synchronous, you know, spontaneous smile 
which is such a complex function of this nerve with 34 pair of muscles with innumerable branches in a normal individual to keep that intact after this surgery is a big task keeping the facial nerve intact overall is not that a big task i believe me keeping mm -hmm. that coordinated spontaneous smile and that is the end result of these 34 pair of muscles coordinating together for a complex function of smile what should be the minimum uh, margin uh, around the nodule means i know all we advocate so, so, total means superficial parotidectomy but if suppose we want to do limited work then what should be the minimum sleeve of normal tissue around the nodule shiva yeah what would be desirable will be a 5 mm but then this is uh, the margins in parotid is a bit uh, uh, a controversial uh, topic at the, at the tail of so, the parotid you have no margin no, that's that's exactly the point. So the margin concept of margins in parotid is a kind of a controversial topic. So at, at the base, if you can just get a soft tissue of, you know, there's a publication from Tata Memorial in mucopedoma and carcinoma, and they've seen how in the retrospective series, how patients have done well. So when the margin was more than one mm, millimeter, soft tissue cuff around the tumor, so, and when the patient received adjuvant whenever it was indicated, the local regional control, the disease-free survival was better. Now, if you ask me, this is just by a statistical method, which showed that when it is more than one mm, the uh, disease-free survival was better. But then this concept is, you know, uh, it's controversial. There is, uh, people may agree or disagree in this. So, ideally speaking, if you can get a 5 mm, it's good, but you're not going to get that on the nerve. But if you can get a 1 mm of cuff around your tumor bed, you should feel satisfied about it. If you're not even getting in one mm on the nerve, then you should think of doing, and if the grade is high grade tumor, is when you need to think of you know, converting it into a total conservative parasitic. Okay. What is the, yeah. is there any difference in the management of high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma? The thing is that it's a very good question. I mean, interesting question that you ask is because the high grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma and the squamous cell carcinoma is very differential, uh, di difficult to differentiate. Your pathologist, if you ask whether they can 100% rule out a squamous cell carcinoma, they probably may not be able to do it. Can I make unless... a point, Dr. Shiva here? Can I make a point? Yeah. So they, they are differentials. So you probably will have to treat a high grade mucoepidermoid like a squamous cell carcinoma, maybe. You know, we had a patient like this. And it was difficult to differentiate, you know. And then the ISC sample uh, was sent to Mumbai to Dr. Anita Borges, you know. Yeah. You know what marker she did to differentiate between a mucoepidermoid and a squamous cell carcinoma? We consider generally MUC1, MUC4. Cytokeratin is what you would have done, I guess. Yeah, she considered and mentioned the MUC5AC is the marker to differentiate the squamous cell carcinoma from the mucoepidermoid. That's exactly and the point. The MUC5AC is the marker. Correct. That is the only thing which can, by means of which you can, uh, you can uh, confidently discriminate exactly. between the squamous cell carcinoma and the mucoepidermoid. See this so, small, small veins bridging? Yes. Sir. See why I'm able to do, Dr. Shiva? Yeah. Why I'm able to do and preserve all these small, small nerves, intercommunicating branches. See this? What is intercommunicating hey, I, branches? I, I appreciate uh, your, the images and all that. Uh, See this? Because it's a, one of the good methods to do it. See this? This is the intercommunicating branches. See this? Yes, sir. These agree, are agree. the main branches. And there are an N number of intercommunicating. See this intercommunicating now? Yes, yes, yes. All agreed, these agreed. are important because this facial now function is so complex a function. Yes. So uh, the thing, uh, the point again, I'd like to emphasize is that you can use whatever magnification you want. It can be a microscope. It can be a loop. Yeah, it yeah, can yeah. be anything. So you can consider using a micro, uh, magnification for sure. There's no doubt about that. Mm. See, now, surgeons. See, yeah. I am I am lifting my specimen from below and see my all lower low branches are absolutely intact. Mm. Lower yes. pole branches. Can you see? Okay. Yeah. Along with the nerve, uh, vein and all the number of branches. It's not five. There are more than 10 branches, main branches from the lower uh, yeah. division. 
we always think of five branches you in two you are asking this question that how safe it is to use uh, dithermy the bipolar near these branches you have to be very carefully uh, in using you know okay. so the other point is that you have to keep using lot of saline i mean that's another yes. point you know hide you know while you you're using the bipolar just to reduce the thermal damage the collateral damage that might happen and also the main point is that catch the point of bleeder and not a clump of tissue to you know uh, that is again the microscope as a value i yes. can see the smallest of the bleeder here yes yeah see again the smaller uh, you know lower buccal branch yes. very small if i have a slightest doubt of this branch any of the branch mm. uh, regarding tumor involvement i will not think twice before sacrificing that yes Uh, so Dr. Because, Pravin from Aurangabad has a question: Is it better to use nerve monitoring used by the anesthetist uh, for nerve block? Is it cheap? It's the same nerve monitor that you can use for the thyroid. You know, yeah. the same nerve monitor can be used for any surgery in the uh, you know yes, in the yes. human body. I showed you. Uh, uh, you see, this oh, is no. the cystic wall. <laughs> see, I am going around the cystic wall. Yes, yes, sir. Can you Dr. see? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. and this is right on the muscle here so here yes. i will not take a chance uh, in preserving one of these two branches you know these are buccal branches or not main buccal branches but branches of the buccal branches you know and here i will take a radical course you know see this yes i will take a radical course uh, in removal of the tumor here the tumor is adherent you see this Yes. Yeah, it was seen on the, the lower branches intact again. All lower branches intact. All the upper branches. See this here. Yeah. Now yeah. I will follow. I will follow my zygomatic branch, the main one. Yeah. See this. Preserve this, and yes. I may have to only thing left to sacrifice to give me oncologically sound uh, clearance is the yeah. upper buccal branch sacrifice. You know. Yes. i will not think twice because rest of my all branches are intact uh, this is a mucopidermoid carcinoma supposed to be low grade and i don't want to take any chance because i have the best possible chance to give a cure to this patient yes because of one or any buccal branch i will not compromise with the oncological soundness of the surgery see this the zygomatic branch yes sir completely preserved Away. Mm. See this. Yes, sir. And then I will round off totally round off because I saw at one place it is going deeper. No, it one was place. evident in the scans as well that at one point it was just sitting on the masseter. So probably yes, you yes. have to. Yes, yes. That is the point. Yeah, exactly. You reached that the, point there. Yeah. Yeah, sitting on the masseter means. one of the branch is going to be in close relationship yeah so actually looking at the scans i had this fear to begin with itself because whenever your tumor is placed higher up like what it is here even though you wouldn't have problem tracing your uh, main trunk of the facial nerve your zygomatic branch automatically comes at risk but here lucky for the patient that the zygomatic branch is just above it you can dissect it but many a times the disease might be so uh, you know no, no, bad no, no. that you might have to sacrifice the branch that you are really worried see this uh, now you know, say and how i am going to do round off in no time yes sir see that is my level of the masseter you can see below yes 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 at this point always uh, our practice is all the branches you know saved mm. on this side on yes. this side as well i have saved most of these branches you know the major branches here yes. this upper buccal branch is something at risk and i will not take a chance i can see my tumor here and i don't want to go close to it i really want a good, uh, good cup of tissue around it and here i can get by just sacrificing a small buccal branch this is something you should not think twice yes uh, so there's a question yes. from iran what about yes. using peanut soaked in adrenaline for control of small bleeders yes adrenaline we generally don't use i don't know dr shiva do you use adrenaline no we peanuts? don't use it for parotid surgeries for sure but they can use it there's no harm in that okay. until unless the uh, your anesthetist is okay with it 
Okay. Yeah, see now. This is the masseter muscle below. Can you see? Yeah. Yes. And see now how it is being elevated out of masseter. Yes. See, it is so adherent. Mm -hmm. And see, all around I have cleared. So I will take it as a, you know, M block. Mm -hmm. And yes. here I am going little radical. Mm -hmm. See this? Yes. <coughs> Can you see the plane below? Yes. yes. A little radical. Dr. Girish from Bilai wants to know if tumor is localized in the tail of the parotid. Even no, then, no. you do classical superficial parotidectomy? Depending upon the you know kind of malignancy it is. No, if histopathology, if it's a Warden's tumor, let's say, mm -hmm. that's the most common location for a Warden's tumor, then we can do what is known as an adequate parotidectomy. Okay. Wherein you just remove the tumor with the cuff of tissue alone. See, but then this is the branch to, I'm dividing. Yeah, but you'll have to, you know, uh, uh, do a proper steps of parotidectomy. But then you don't have to do a sup, uh, textbook classical uh, superficial parotidectomy. You can do, do what is known as an adequate parotidectomy. Can you but see the branches I'm dividing now? Yes, yes. yes. See, these two small buccal branches, because here I don't want to take any chance but if it's a malignancy, the minimum surgery is superficial parotidectomy. Yes, yes. I think that answers the question. Both of you, Dr. Siva and Dr. Safi, uh, this enumerate the you can say points in the revision cases. What precaution you should take radiologically, how to assess it, and what the during surgery, post-operative, like in revision cases, like malignancy. I will... tell you one thing: in revision cases, with a whatever previous surgery done to expose the facial now, it is damn difficult to preserve the facial now. Functioning right. facial now, number one. And if it is a malignancy, forget about it. In but then we cannot. Uh, I do agree. Take the point that the chances of preserving the facial nerve in a revision surgery is uh, that much lesser compared to an upfront, you know, treatment knife. But then Function. the effort has to be to identify the proceed steps remain the same. Yeah. But yeah. it might be difficult to identify the main trunk because the plane is already violated. So you can just maybe understand from the you know previous surgery as to how much of a surgery they've done. Sometimes it can just be a nodulectomy or a biopsy, wherein you might have your planes intact, the usual planes that you want. But if they've done some sort of a parotidectomy, raising the flap and all that, then raising the nerve becomes difficult. And that's when, when you have the intraoperative nerve monitor becomes handy. And the other thing is you can, in those situations, the retrograde approach of tracing the uh, uh, nerve uh, becomes helpful. Uh, that, so, those are the steps that you can use, but I do agree with uh, so, uh, Dr. Jain what he says that the chances of you saving the nerve, especially when it is malignant, function, becomes that nerve. much uh, more uh, reduced. Functioning nerve in a malignancy, is difficult because in malignancy, you have to do an adequate clearance that to minimum superficial. No, uh, let, let, let me warn the, I mean, okay, uh, I understand what Dr. Satish Jain is saying that you for oncological clearance, you have to get an R0 clearance, you have to be radical, point taken, yes, agreed. But then uh, let the youngsters not go back thinking that if it, is on, if it is a malignant tumor, you have to just go in and remove everything that is there on your way. No. So the decision will be on table decision. You will have to yes, take yes. the decision on table depending on your tumor on the case to case basis. So yes, it's a malignancy. You have to get an R0 clearance, but you have to go with the case to case uh, basis. The decision will differ. Now, can I show finally the field? Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this point again, I enumerate what Dr. Shiva has mentioned about the retrograde approach. That's a very important point he has mentioned. The reason is the surgeon may not have gone far anteriorly. He may not have given fibrosis far anteriorly, and you can pick up the nerve easily and trace retrograde. That is the idea behind it, because in the area where the surgeon has already entered, it's difficult to get the nerve so easily. So that is a very important message for everyone. Dr. Shiva, yeah. your, your, your points are so amazing, important. Yes. You know, 8,000 yes. people logged in right now. Wow, that's great. Yeah. And uh, you have been so instrumental in uh, you know, each and every point. Now, lastly, uh, before I uh, go to the next case, what is the next one? Sir, I have a doubt. What about this adequate parotidectomy that you had mentioned? Can you elaborate something more about it? So, adequate parotidectomy is that you raise your flap like how you would raise for a parotid, superficial parotidectomy. You identify the trunk like how you would identify. 
mm-hmm. and you would probably depending on the location of the nodal yeah. let's say it's located yes, in the tail of a parrot you just trace your lower yeah. branch of your facial nerve okay. and then rem- round it off with one of the branches let's say the lower buckle and then you don't have to go to the up- so trace the upper branch it's at all Okay. So you know Hello. you understand. So that is yeah. what adequate parotidectomy is. So that's done mostly for benign tumors like Warden's tumor or a pleomorphic adenoma that might be located in the lower pole. So that again you cannot do it for all cases, but for select cases which is benign. Okay. Satish, you please tell us uh, how you do the retrograde dissection because all the nerves are visible here. Yeah. Yeah. So see, can... I tell you, uh, we have discussed several times in the facial nerve course as well. Ah, uh, Deepak. Yes. you can go to the marginal branch you can go to the buccal branch you can go to the zygomatic and come retrograde from the virgin area to the operated area where the, the uh, identification and you know following the nerve is difficult that is what dr siva is saying and that's a amazing um, thinking in the uh, particularly in the revision situation in the primary situation we do that retrograde only when the tumor is centered right on the main trunk here or towards the mastoid so in that situation we come from anteriorly because the identification of the trunk is little difficult as you may have to go across the tumor that are the two indications we use Need now to coming to the you. final field final field final picture for everyone the landmarks again i'll reenumerate see this is my tragal pointer here can you see yes sir yes. one centimeter below and one centimeter deep is the now yes. and this is where the you know the digastric is attaching yeah lagana see just above this is the digastric which is attached to the mastoid process here just above and deep to the anterior border of the digastric is the facial nerve these are the two landmarks this is your posterior division of the retromandibular uh, this thing uh, you know posterior uh, the uh, this uh, greater auricular greater auricular now yeah. then your facial nerve main branches This is the retromandibular vein. This is the cervical branch going. This is the marginal mandibular. These are the two lower buccal branches and lot of intercommunication. See this going and intact. Now superior uh, uh, division. See this is the frontal branch going with lot of numerous divisions of the frontal branch as it ascends over the zygomatic arch. It becomes more and more superficial. This is very important if you go above the level of the zygomatic arch, it comes to the level of the temporoparietal fascia. this is more important in a sub temporal skull base approach we do here it is not so important to go above that then your zygomatic main branch that you have to preserve going to the orbicularis there and then the upper buccal branch i have sacrificed and see how radical i have been here in this particular region that is the message and i stayed you know over over being over conscious over radical in this region sacrificing the upper buccal branch that is the only thing i have done now how what will happen to the upper buccal branch see this since i preserved the lower buccal all lower buccal branches these buccal branches as you go anteriorly they have a plexus here about the zygomaticus major muscle where more than 50 numerous filamental branches joined together to form a plexus about the zygomaticus major and whatever upper buccal branch loss you have given here that is automatically recovered because of numerous interconnections we have seen observed in many of these patient i have shown in cadaveric dissection several times and this is how i don't mind resecting this branch for the oncological safety satish think- just for, for the sake of all just just in a revision case you said retrograde yeah. dissection so what is steps you do after raising while raising the flap also there is risk of damaging the facial nerve yes then Dr. after Shiva then already- you raise Shiva has already mentioned the, you know, the invaluable role of nerve monitor number one for the identification. Sometimes identification is difficult, or more than that, in revision there are a lot of fibrosis, lot of you know traction on the nerve when you try to dissect around it, and your nerve monitor will warn you every time that your nerve is under traction. You have to stop, and that warning is so important from the nerve monitor. Dr. Shiva, I, I, you must be doing most of the revisions in being in the Premier Institute, Tata. And what is your experience uh, in the revision cases? How, how so, often yeah, you are able to preserve a functioning cranial now? And what are your uh, tips to prevent facial nerve injury? After raising the flap, you identify the masseter muscle or the buccinator. What are the steps? You please tell us in that way. Masseter is something you don't need to look at. 
Okay. While raising the flap, if you go anterior to the pectoral on the masseter, it's a disaster. I tell you, you okay. will end up all these branches running anteriorly. Uh, beyond the parotid are going on the masseter. If you look at the masseter, there is no nothing to prevent injury to these nerves. So no. that is a very important point. The, the That's one why I have included in the flap raising. That is so important. So the one way of uh, identifying the nerve in a retrograde uh, in a uh, uh, redo case, that is mm -hmm. in a uh, redo case, is that many times they are high grade. You probably will have to do Ajay a neck dissection, or at least you are going to go into your one B area to, you know, or in the level two area. So one way to do is to do it like a SND, you know, just look into the level one B, identify the submandibular gland, just go above, then you identify the marginal mandibular nerve axis. You would often do it in a neck dissection, and then trace it posteriorly. Yes, so, you know, that is one way to go about it. If you have a nerve monitor, then again you can use the nerve monitor at each step whenever you are doubtful that you are having some. Tissue which is neural tissue in your, uh, you know, which you are going to cut. You always use a normal monitor to touch the tissue, look for an activity, no activity, then cut. So it's a step-by-step -step approach that way. And someone was asking about that now monitor used by the anesthetist. What we do? We just use that needle, and we uh, they use for brachial block. What we, then we just use that needle and put on the nerve area, and we see the twitching over the face. Yeah, usually for the parotid also it's like that. So you put same, the same. Uh, the electrodes in the you know for uh, the mental area and in the you know forehead area. You know, and the angle, uh, angle. So you put electrodes in, sorry, yes, electrodes in, the, electrodes in yes. four areas for the re representation of all these branches, and then which yes. is connected to the nerve monitor, like how you would connect it for an intraop. I mean, for a thyroid intraoperative nerve monitoring. So it's essentially the same. So will you combine the level two neck dissection? See, this patient I had seen on imaging was absolutely clear at the level two, hmm. and looking at the, you know. Uh, uh, Mucoepidermoid carcinoma, the low grade. Doctor, she had already mentioned it's better to take lower uh, level two once you are going into the neck. Yes. I could take, but what I believe there was nothing in the lower pole and nothing towards the level two, so I uh, didn't take. But there is no harm in taking. I would say. Satish, what no do you do for a cosmetic? Uh, you know, to prevent the cosmetic depression in large tumors that you resect. Yes. You know, so many so times. You abdominal fat. You rotate the. Yes. Yes. Rotate there are many ways. In the small defect, I can rotate the sternum mastoid anti-grade up. Right. I can bring in the platysma also. I can bring in the temporoparietal fascia and the part of the muscle as well. Or you can put in free fat as well. Many things you Which can do. Which works better in your hands? What do you prefer? Free fat. Free fat. Free fat. Yeah. It works very well. Yeah. Why do unnecessarily, uh, you know, uh, rotate the muscles? Yeah. Number two, coming back to the previous question, had this been a Still, our uh, frozen section report is awaited. Yes, Had this been a non-high grade carcinoma, yes, not sir. only level two, I would do at least a selective dissection of level two and three. Yeah. Okay. So that's fair enough. So uh, any you know elective neck dissection in a parotid is one of the indications is high grade or a T3 T4 tumor. Or T4 you know? tumor. Or yes, sir. A clinical radiologically suspicious node. So yes. even T3. Uh, so T3 T4 high grade, uh, you know clinical radiologically suspicious node, you would end up doing an SND. No, but only, I, only negative point I found in this patient, hmm. the way it was adhered to the, uh, you know, masseter, hmm. it I would say as a focal extraglandular extension, hmm. and this is um, only negative point in this low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Otherwise, it is all favorable tumor as far as the resection and everything was concerned. So probably hmm. that is hinting towards uh, some sort of an, you know. Uh, the grade may not be low. It may be something intermediate. Yes, yeah. So I'm intermediate. Waiting, I'm awaiting the frozen report. Okay. In the meantime, our next case has uh, already sir, taken. Uh, yes, sir. Before you move on to the next question, the uh, next case, there have been few questions on the phrase syndrome. How will you uh, approach? Uh, how will you treat if there is a uh, phrase? Okay, phrase syndrome is a difficult to treat. I think in the easier to prevent. Number yes, one. Sir. Number two. A lot of anticholinergic local ointment and all those things mm. are initially tried mm. uh, to cover up. But mm. mostly, once mm. it is a classical phrase, it is better up, better to open up. We have done. Mm. Better to open the wound, rotate mm. the temporoparietal fascia and interpose between the tumor bed and the mm. skin. That's it. That is the final answer. Okay. To segregate the nerve endings going to the skin, going to the dermis. That is... One and only final answer. 
lot of people yeah. do tympanic neurectomy because ultimately the stimulus is going through the jacobsons now yes. to the parotid to hmm. so the post ganglionic fibers to so the parotid are going going to the jacobsons hmm. now so a lot of people are doing trans canal uh, tympanic neurectomy as well and it works a lot of people are giving botulinum toxin so hmm. many things but hmm. best is if it happens to occur confirm by the starch iodine test hmm. if it is classical interpose some fascia and get away forever rather than doing this monkey business of some or other thing something works for some months and again the patient comes back again the patient comes back and it is going to give problems later on okay root fistula how you manage the fistula you develop later on after surgery fistula mostly conservative by means of pressure dressings yeah. sometimes now it is what we are doing your parot fistula are not uncommon so what we have been doing now injecting hot hypertonic saline to induce fibrosis hmm. is easier to do that is simple thing hmm. and now at days we have been using the hmm. platelet rich fibrin hmm. you know to induce um, uh, uh, fibrosis at that place and that works well yes. but most of the time uh, the pressure dressings works you can ask the patient to avoid more of sore things to stimulate the it remain residual parotid mm-hmm. and all that and it settles down it's no longer yes. a long lasting and problem. if the patient yes. has to receive radiotherapy that will take care of it yes. yeah radiotherapy itself will take care of it okay <laughs> and sir uh, so Shiva, can i ask one thing yeah. if you have not done a elective mm-hmm. neck dissection yeah and you have not yeah, done sorry. elective neck dissection yeah and your tumor turns out to be a mm-hmm. high grade with intra parotid lymph nodes positive okay would you go on to neck and dissect it or would you irradiate with the primary see uh, that's why the policy in our hospital is to do a level 2 sampling now with a level 2 sampling i mean of course you would, uh, again the same question comes as to whether you have the facility for frozen or not so so the, to be safer we do a level 2 sampling and then move accordingly so if you don't have a s- frozen if it is anywhere intermediate to high grade i would recommend a level 3 1 to 3 neck dissection that's because for a parotid if it is in a intermediate to high grade the radiotherapy will not be able to take care of the nodal metastasis mm-hmm. you must understand that the parotid uh, tumors are radio resistant mm-hmm. what is more effective for uh, parotid tumors are neutron beam radiotherapy Okay. Whereas what we give is then ele- uh, you know uh, f- photon or electron based uh, radiotherapy, which will be a uh, you know a mop up kind of you know to take care of a microscopic disease that is left behind, but not for a disease which is uh, you know grossly left behind. It's not going to work. So a neck dissection will be better. So you have to plan that preoperatively just to mm-hmm. get things right as much okay. as mm-hmm. as often as possible. Okay. Ramita. And so is there one more Ramita. last question? Yes, sir. we are moving to the next major case is a yes, large sir. parapharyngeal vagal schwannoma yes sir with a intact vagal nerve function yes sir yes sir that sir. is the next case and uh, yes, i have already washed up yes sir before i go to the vagal schwannoma mm. the, uh, the small case the step is ready okay. the flap is raised the uh, overhang is curated so i will spend 5 minutes there Okay, and go sir. straight away to the vagal schwannoma. Okay, sir. Yes. So, so I would like, I would like Dr. Shiva, if you can, if you can stay for the vagal schwannoma case, I uh, if we can spare some time. It's up to you, boss. Yeah, sure. I, I'll just take a break in between and then come back. Maybe okay, I'll join you. Great. And thank you again. Last, Sorry? last yeah. question. Last question. Sure, What that's... about pressure dressing on the drain in these cases? Do you? Uh, so the other most important point actually uh, uh, even though it's the last point is we don't keep a romavac drain the please do not keep a romavac drain because yeah, yeah. if you put this it on the nerves that you've dissected like uh, and then you put a romavac the constant negative pressure also can add, uh, you know uh, contribute so, to the post op palsy yeah, so, so we, all, drain, we, we just put a glove drain negative we just put a negative pressure gives you a bad cosmetic depression okay yeah. so then glove drain just the glove drain and then okay. dressing the glove drain can come off in 48 hours max and then okay. it heals well Okay, and that's it. So we so because do, uh, this is also a very important point that we that, all should yeah. know. Yeah, and again, that is when you don't do a neck dissection. Now, if you do end up doing I a do level do. one, two, three, you will you will have to put a drain and see mm. to that the drain does not go into your parotid region and stays only in the neck. Okay. And your parotid region, you can you know maybe have a couple of sutures loose so that you can just drain it out. Okay, sir. Or this drain can take care. But then the most important point is the drain shouldn't be sitting on your nerve branches that you've dissected. Yes, sir. Yes, okay, sir. Okay, thirty, sir. Thank, yes, you. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to the stapes for five ten minutes. Then the vagal schwannoma is ready. Yes, and sir. after the vagal schwannoma, we have cases lined up. 
like two cases of cs of otoria hmm. and yeah. a glomus tympanicum before we move on to the other yes sir so i'm ready with the stapes now okay sir and uh, hello yes sir uh, i have already washed up so not showing you the uh, the scan of this patient hmm. uh, a colleague dr ayub has already opened up he has raised the flap curated and let me see what is there inside yes sir <coughs> uh, can you give the microscopic picture there hello hello are you getting microscopic picture yes sir yes we are getting isse bada de so in the previous case from dr parekh madam from uh, sir we have learned a lot isn't it? it was a great discussion on parotidectomy yeah it uh, it's a, you know i am so grateful to them for yes sir enlightening us mm. and the dr shiva was amazing you know yes yes you know the kind of knowledge he has the kind of commitment mm. and the surgical hand it's all amazing yes and he's uh, there is never a no from his side for mm. any you know academic work that's a great gesture yes sir this is one doctor john shadow from australia he just sent message sent message me he is he did one uh, uh, acoustic neuroma last week after seeing oh. you after, after long time he did his this surgery oh, no. very Credit goes to you. He says he just this this surgery. I did it, and then it, it took a lot of time for for three hours. But I think it is because of you. You think now? Are you getting the uh, microscopic picture? Yeah, yes, out sir. Of, out of out of focus. Focus a little. Now see the thick posterior crust. So so you can't see sir. Need to focus. Okay, pakarna isko. Some picture is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will, I will uh, change the focus. No, previous case was uh, microscope was different. I think this one is better. Uh, is, is the picture better? Yes. Yeah, better. better. Yes, yes. Yeah, different microscope. The same vario. We have two vario. Okay. We have already checked the mobility. See the alias, uh, the incas. Mm. So good. Mm. And the stapes is fixed. See the foot plate. Mm. Completely fixed. So our uh, what i want to show again it's like video game my first would be to disarticulate the joint see the joint see keep an eye where the joint is yes sir joint space is medial there see this if we go with a false impression laterally you can injure the lenticular process that is something you are not supposed to be see this way not showing the flap elevation in the every case i i told you we organize an event in jaipur in 2013 the stepis carnival with ashish and ashim we did 50 stepis in two days with a great discussion with these two people see now the joint is disarticulated can you see yes the next is i will take the you know laser now pakadna pakadya dur ha great yes this is my laser beam and i will first vaporize our next case is already induced ready and that's a interesting one vagal schwanoma are you is showing this case in a different manner or the same uh, manner ready karna <laughs> same parameter there are the posture across you see how thick it is yes these are ideal cases for the laser the reason is this suction you are keeping just to suck the vapors so to prevent yes. the corroding yes. to suck the vapors you know and now my posterior crust is there in front of me see this yes sir additional cover the beauty of the co2 laser is it is absorbed by the 
you know water hmm ah huh. now the next is to vaporize the what is the setting of the laser for this 8 the power is 8 watts for the tendon it was 4 watts you know okay for the posterior cross it is 8 watts see now it has been hollowed out and the beam diameter beam diameter was 0.3 okay. and now the anterior fracture it is being fragile and now i am taking it out for sets can you see very clear yes sir so centralize sir little sir. yes sir this is one of a very common surgery we are doing at our uh, you know uh, at our center the autosclerosis surgeries hmm. see now the remaining posterior cross and now your foot plate is completely in front of you okay yes, right now give me the pakadna give me the measuring gauge posterior crust remain inside so we should take it out in all the cases or just you can remove if it is bothering you i stamp out the posterior crust if it is not bothering you yes it, it is, is not the cause of floater yaar if you try to remove it yes sometimes why to unnecessary yes. it was 4.5 little longer yes this is fine absolutely fine correct sawa char what is the commonest length you use in your cases 4.25 but it's variable i have seen one patient requiring you know 5 mm. oh one patient requiring 3.75 it's like you know you never know फोकल Of the microscope and the micro manipulator should match. Yeah, give me. See now, with my twenty watt shot, mm. it didn't go completely through. I can see the glimpse of the bone. Yes. Now what I can do? I am not going to fire it again. Mm. Can you see now? Yes. 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 It has already thinned out. Yes. If I try to fire more, I can end up giving more energy to the labyrinth, and that will be a disaster. Mm. See that? Yes, I sir. could easily, you know, do it with my. Yes, now yes. give me. You want? You know, and finally, I am uh, putting my piston now. So five to ten minutes. and the simplest part is the piston now because this piston doesn't need any crimping hmm. with laser you have a sense of security that you are not going to hmm. mobilize anything hmm. see how can you improve your outcome simply hmm. see this see this movement is very important hmm. in one go i left my piston in the finestra can you see mm, yes sir at the same time the loop of the piston taking on the incus mm -hmm. at the same time at the right place roughly 0.5 mm mm. above the lenticular process can you see yes sir and then last thing left is yes that's it mm. can perfect. you see yes sir perfect so that's why i call it always like a video game yes See this? Everything very well, possible. very well in Fenestra. Mm. Absolutely, uh, atraumatic. And I will just use a micro drop of blood or the Fenestra. If your piston is not over long, believe me, nothing will happen. 
all post operative issues major post operative issues are related to an overlong piston right? Mm. It throws some light on round window auto sclerosis. In how many of your cases you have seen round window auto sclerosis? Not common, but yes, round window or cochlear auto sclerosis. For us now, a lot of cases, um, you know, which require cochlear implant. You have to do cochlear implant with all difficulties and all. Mm. It can happen. You can get. You have to be careful. So all those patients mm. having a mixed hearing loss, you have to be careful. Mm. You must assess on radiology properly. You know. Yes, sir. Don't recommend fat or gel from around. Yes, see the blood. Yes, sir. In the oval window, and since the vestibule is full of myelin. Yes. With the more pressure inside the vestibule than the pressure in the middle ear, hmm. this blood is never going to trickle yes. into it. Yes. That's it. Are you done? Kar dena. So, Doctor Girish is asking uh, from Bilai, can one? Uh, is to eight lakh xylocan adrenaline be used in stapy surgery in the ESC for better hemostasis? We use one is to two lakhs. Okay, for better hemostasis, is asking can we use one is to eight lakhs? I generally, you know, avoiding um. Hmm. Hmm. I think he's gone offline. No. I think there is something, uh, some issue with his internet. Okay. Uh, uh, Doctor Doctor Ramandeep is back. Doctor Ramandeep, sir, you're back. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, Ramandeep, what is your opinion about that? I why I am asking this question. Sometimes after putting piston and even the mobility and everything is okay. When you see in the post-operative period, the patient may have persistent conductive hearing loss. What may be the other causes? In spite of right assembly, everything is right. Uh, see, assembly is one part. Then the patient can easily have a third window phenomena. Yes. So you have to rule out all this on the scanning first. Please scan. Sir, uh, many are asking about the frozen report. Is it yeah. come? We are waiting. Waiting. Okay. Okay. We have not closed that case. So, Doctor Jeevan Vedi. Ah, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, we are ready with the imaging of the next case. Okay, okay, sir. That is vagal schwannoma, and why I will tell you why it is vagal schwannoma for us. Hmm. We have we don't have histopathological evidence. Okay. But the radiological evidence which I want to share with you, hmm. and uh, we have Madam here, Farida Madam must uh, you know the Madam is a head and neck surgeon by and large, from heart. And Madam must have been doing a lot of peripheral tumors. Right. You know, in head and neck, peripheral have their own place. Vagal schwannoma is not so common. You know, schwannomas are very common everywhere. We have seen the vestibular schwannoma surgery, that is acoustic neuroma, we call it, hmm. in the CP angle. Hmm. Then we have schwannomas along the seventh nerve, facial nerve schwannoma. Hmm. Schwannoma can occur anywhere along any nerve. They involve more often the sensory nerves than the motor nerves mm. because they arise from the Schwann sheath of the and the mm. myelin uh, from the sensory nerves. Mm. And this particular schwannoma, why it is schwannoma first of all, and mm. why it is vagus. Mm. And this answer can be given by one and only thing, mm. MRI. Mm. Otherwise, there is no way preoperatively to distinguish this from any other tumor. Mm. So there are a lot of questions. Why it is not? Are you getting the picture? Yes, sir. MRI picture? Yes, sir. So the questions are why it is not vagal paraganglioma? We had a vagal paraganglioma last week. Mm. Why it is vagal schwannoma? Number one. Then, if it is a schwannoma, why not other nerve schwannoma? There are so many nerves in the peripheral space. Mm. Why not, uh, you know, uh, sympathetic nerve schwannoma? Why vagal nerve schwannoma? Mm. So all these answers can be best given by MRI. Is Dr. Shiva logged in again? Yes, uh, he yes. is logged in. Yeah, he is logged in. Uh, hmm? Dr. Shiva, sir, are you there? I'm he... on the Just so, number... uh, Satish, Satish, besides uh, uh, imaging, can we make the difference whether it is sympathetic trunk schwannoma or vagal nerve schwannoma? No way. No way other than MRI. As simple but as that. Horner, Horner syndrome is not there when it arises. It's already so there. 
Okay. Very rare if there is a preoperative Warner syndrome, this could be a sympathetic nerve schwannoma. But it is not always there. How not always. In very few patients, very few percentage of patients, you know. Sometimes preoperative vagal palsy could be there. But again, in very few percentage of because these schwannomas, they arise from the epineurium of some nerve fiber. And then they keep on displacing the other fiber. That's how they grow. Mm -hmm. Yet the facial nerve function is preserved. Even if the few percentage of the vagal nerve fibers are working, clinically you may not uh, appreciate a clinical vagal nerve palsy. That is how somehow we have seen more than 70% of the nerve is involved by the tumor with displaying all fibers, yet the clinically nerve is normal. So clinically there is no definite way of, you know, distinguishing between the vagal and the sympathetic nerve fibroma. So my coming to the MRI, number one question, why it is schwannoma, why not paraganglioma? See this, this is T2 weighted picture. On paraganglioma we saw last time, paraganglioma is a vascular tumor having flow voids, having a classical salt and paper appearance because of the vessels. Salt means white, white dots, slow flowing vessels and paper means large black black hollowing uh, you know dots bigger dots <laughs> because of the large vessels and here in schwannoma that is conspicuously absent that clearly distinguishes the schwannoma from the paraganglioma number one okay now here see on the t2 weighted what you will find instead of that there could be some internal necrosis because of the large size hypoxia, necrosis, you know, cystic changes in the schwannoma, giving them heterogeneous appearance. That is classical of schwannoma, for any schwannoma. So that is classically a picture of schwannoma, number one. Number two, why it cannot be a other nerve schwannoma? Why I am saying vagal? Now see, in the parapharyngeal space, how the structures are oriented. Anteriorly, in the carotid artery, and the laterally, anteriorly and medially is the carotid artery which divides into external and internal and laterally is the internal jugular vein. And deep to that, posteriorly, medially, deep to the carotid artery is the sympathetic chain and between the carotid and the jugular deeper is the vagus. Okay? So, if a schwannoma arises from vagus, would displace these vessels anteriorly. What my point? And since it is between the vagus and the carotid, you will find classical displacement of the carotids medially and the vagus laterally and all anterior to the tumor. Now see, in this tumor, see both the external and internal carotid anteriorly and the jugular is completely compressed. I will show on the coronal. The jugular is completely compressed. Let me put up the uh, coronal together. See this. This is your schwannoma where the jugular is going and completely compressed laterally and the carotid you see is medially. See here, the external carotid and the internal carotid and the jugular is collapsed there. And all are displaced anteriorly. That means the lesion is coming from behind the vessels. Number one. Dr. Shiva has come back. Yes, Hello? yes. Oh. Yeah, hi. Hello. This is classically a vagal schwannoma, what I was discussing. Yes. It's not a vagal paraganglioma. Last week we did a vagal paraganglioma. And that had a classical flow voids. Yes. And since there are no flow voids in the parapharyngeal space, with the carotids both displaced anteriorly, and the jugular displaced laterally, it cannot be anything else than vagal schwannoma, number one. To rule out a sympathetic nerve schwannoma, what would have been the picture had this been a sympathetic schwannoma? As I mentioned, the sympathetics are just behind the carotid artery in the neck. And as they ascend towards the bifurcation, they come exactly behind the carotid bifurcation. In the lower neck, they are little medial to the carotid and deeper. So what happens if a schwannoma arises from the carotid? It will displace both the carotid and the jugular laterally. 
number one and if the shonama is at higher up at the level of the bifurcation you will have a classical splaying of the internal and external carotid like you seen carotid body tumor that is classically a, a radiological sign of a vagal now uh, sorry the sympathetic now shonoma and this vagal now shonoma is classically something different than uh, the the sympathetic shonoma now we have this since we had mri so we got the mr angiogram as well now see this is the carotid artery here this is the carotid artery this is the tumor the carotid has been displaced medially anteriorly and medially had this been a uh, sympathetic schwannoma both carotid and jugular would have displaced laterally never medially yes, number 1 then as you go up this is the internal and external carotid and as you go up see i am going up at the level of bifurcation and you see a classical splaying of the internal and external carotid artery which you in a case of schwannoma looking like carotid body tumor which has a flow void which schwannoma doesn't have is a classical thing you can find in a sympathetic which you will never find in the uh, vagal schwannoma now let me reconstruct this uh, this mr angiogram this gives you a very good insight of the vessel supplying it uh, we believe in ct angiogram most of the time like i showed in the jna case today see this see this carotid is displaced medially that is classically seen in a vagal schwannoma had this been a sympathetic it would have been displaced laterally for the simplest understanding you can assume like this anteriorly and medially that is classical of a, a vagal schwannoma there are no flow void see this even on the mr angiogram you remember last times vagal schwannoma the image in the kind kind of flow voids that patient vagal schwannoma has you can clearly distinctly uh, you know find the appearance of these two lesions any questions Oh, very well said. Very well illustrated. So yes, now, sir. yes. How is how miss is the FNC role is there? Pardon? FNC role or FNC over here? The FNC can pick up the shonoma. Yes, very well. And since your radiology is the final answer, with a well circumscribed lesion, see this, such a well circumscribed benign lesion, displaced in the vessels anteriorly. with a capsule around it cannot be anything else than a schwannoma whatever investigation besides that you get done is aa gaya hamare us cheez se photo liye naya wala hmm hmm okay any other question yeah you start the case i think now the important thing is whether we can say the vagus nerve or not i will tell you this is the hallmark of the technique we follow majority of the people don't look at the vagal nerve function believe me this is the real truth and once you remove the schwannoma i told you schwannoma arises from the epineurium of a one fiber and displaces the sheath or the other fibers completely and when you remove all those splaying of the nerve fibers over the tumor all around is difficult to save them here the technique uh, which uh, i am going to show you microscopically you can find those nerve fibers and splitting between the nerve fibers and doing a subcapsular dissection 80% of the time they are able to save the nerve function whatever big schwannoma it is this is huge one still we can now the third thing you need to see on imaging is the upper extent see the upper extent on radiology on the coronal how far it is from the you know how far it is from the skull base you have to see yourself on imaging see this this is the upper limit of the schwannoma and this is skull base let me uh, measure how it is it is roughly over 3 cm you can say away from the skull base and that is good enough you can remove from below most of the time the maneuver like i have shown several times in the carotid body tumor in these webinars you can increase your exposure by means of dividing the digastric then go up 
if you need further more exposure you can divide the styloid process and the muscles attached to it and the stylomandibular ligament and it opens up the gateway many people try to you know bring in the mandibulotomy in the higher up tumors believe me for schwannomas we have never done and you don't need to maximum at the uh, max if you are not able to get you know get above the tumor to control the vessels what you can do mandibular subluxation or you can do a vro vertebral ramus osteotomy at the most but for this schwannoma now we have stopped doing all this what we are doing is if it is going too high up i will go inside the tumor in size use my micro debrider debulk it and it will fall down and then i can get over the tumor and remove my with my finger you never have to do a mandibulotomy for such schwannoma we have done couple of times that so there are many ways to protect the function to prevent the morbidity in these tumors any questions any suggestions i can understand regarding the micro debrider what do you do with the micro debrider i would inside at one place go inside with a micro debrider uh -huh. and keep debriding hollowing it out from inside oh, oh. hollowing it out staying intracapsular and it will fall down it will leave uh, above from the skull base if it has gone up to and you can go about get about the lesion with your finger and get it down without so doing yeah. a mandible saving any fibers right then you won't be saving any nerve fibers no we are going inside the lesion inside the capsule okay all fibers are outside the capsule you know okay yeah this so, so sometimes a schwannoma can be cystic so will your approach be different no same okay sometimes almost always these schwannomas have internal cystic and necrotic components as they enlarge Okay. This tumor also has a cystic and necrotic component. You see the heterogeneity inside. Mm -hmm. See this yes, heterogeneity. You know, that's the nature of the schwannoma. Any schwannoma. Mm -hmm. You saw in the last week uh, when I demonstrated the vestibular schwannoma at the CP angle, yes. how big the cysts were. There were mm -hmm. two large cysts. Mm -hmm. So that's the nature of the schwannomas, very commonly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, sure. So, uh, Dr. Satish, and if I can just add one point. Yes, please. Yeah. So uh, you rightly said that for a vagal schwannoma, you might not have to do a mandibulotomy most of the times. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the decision for that would actually depend on the extent of tumor. Of course, the methods you have described could be alternatives to that. But for the beginners who are just looking at it as to when you will have to do a mandibulotomy or not, would be depending on the extent of the upper, you know, the extent of the tumor which is going up towards the skull base. And the other important thing while looking at imaging, as what Dr. Satyajit rightly said, is that look at the distance from the skull base most importantly look at the stump that is available for you in case of an event you should have some amount of stump of the carotid artery from the skull base in case you end up with an event you should have the end in control so that is most important and then that will actually decide as to whether you will do a mandibulotomy or not okay. yes yes so what will uh, be the stump, what will be the stump which will be safer safest for you dr shiva at least 1 cm of stump should be available for us uh, uh, to have Hello, a control the skull higher end. from the skull base that is from the skull base for us to same, same for schwannoma and the carotid uh, body tumor or different for carotid body tumor usually you know uh, carotid body tumor that is going higher up so much higher up it will probably be a shamblin 3 most of the time yes okay. so in in which case uh, you know you're better off to do a mandibulotomy because you'll have that control same thing for the Uh, paragangliomas as well if you are planning to resect the internal carotid artery and if you are planning to do a you know reconstruction of the vessel okay. especially so you need to have that stump you and know, yes your point is valid but you know what we do instead of doing a major parotidectomy what we are doing is a vertical ramus osteotomy okay. it's a very simple procedure what you can do from the mandibular notch to the angle of mandible we divide the mandible vertically Hmm. behind would be the uh, uh, condyle of the mandible and the rest of the mandible anteriorly agreed the entire mandible can be rotated anteriorly and you just put a two plates the rest of the mandible need not to be disturbed no neurovascular structure is you know uh, affected right rather than doing a mandibulotomy where you can see be a lot of nerves the mental now the inferior alveolar and many things So mandibulotomy, you don't have to serve the mental now. If you do a paramedian mandibulotomy, paramedian you can still save. So 
the thing is that with uh, the approach that you're mentioning, if, um, a maxillofacial surgeons could be a bit unhappy because uh, we are always a simple approach. Yeah, agreed. Yes, that might to... suit you. That might suit yeah. you. Agreed. I'm not challenging that. But what I'm trying to say for the uh, audience is that when you cut at the angle. and when you make it the angle is the one which is the most unstable part mm. you know which is more prone for pathological fracture mm. you know that's because when you eat and all that so that you have to play it really well and as yes. for the maxillofacial technique intermand you know intermaxillary wiring and all will be required in, in the uh, you know for for some time in the post operative period that said apart you can choose your method but paramedian mandibulotomy is a safe technique where you can you don't have to damage any of the nerves and it can be very effectively done with the uh, acceptable morbidity yeah, so yeah, you, the point i'm trying to make is that you don't have to shy away from a mandible otomy because having a vascular uh, you know catastrophe is much worse than doing a mandible otomy so yeah, be safe for your patient is what i'm trying to say absolutely okay. important point this is a take home message for everyone hmm. not to compromise with the exposure hmm. particularly lesions vascular lesions the carotid is affected hmm. you may have to reconstruct or repair the carotid you hmm. cannot take a chance of you know compromising with the exposure and this what dr shiva has rightly said never compromise if you can do a good paramedian mandibulotomy nothing mm. like it out of all mandibulotomy is described paramedian is best function preserving mm. and you can get a amazing exposure you can go right up to the skull base with that mm. okay so any other questions uh, as i am moving to the case now the case is ready and what i am looking at the csf case yes so we can discuss anything meantime i wash up oh uh, yes sir anybody is has any question regarding previous case cases done so far you can ask dr shiva is here madam farida wadi is here dr ramandeep is here mm. so any such lesions arising from the phrenic nerve uh doctor uh, fazail from pakistan is asking i have not come across one arising from the uh, phrenic nerve but the vagal schwannomas lower down in the neck is mm -hmm. pretty much uh, a known phenomenon so that is common okay phrenic i have not come across or heard in literature okay heard in literature sir. i can okay. see dr sethi on screen so what was you the come, com sir. what were the complaints of this patient this patient had she presented with cough she she has a funny finding hmm. most of the schwannoma hmm. even if they grow larger hmm. they are they remain asymptomatic hmm. the symptoms come when the nerve is severely affected hmm. or the compression compression to the surrounding hmm. and majority of them come either with dyspnea dysphagia hmm. you know all that hmm. this patient presented with a chronic cough hmm. she went to all uh, physicians and all Mm. and when we found such a big tumor mm. we went to the literature and this is one of the presentation because of the irritation mm. as it supplies the airway as well mm. this is how we uh, picked up this mm. we couldn't get the electron neuronography of this patient generally we get when the nerves are involved mm. yet clinically normal like i mentioned in the patient mm. now earlier in the vestibular schwannoma as well we get the pre op electron neuronography to predict the likelihood of preservation of the nerve if we have a pre op electron neuronography showing less than 50% response yet clinically functioning normal now it is difficult to preserve the function the moment you handle the nerve it is going to go okay so this is like that so this patient is now presented our goal is we have explained her about the vagal symptoms majority of the vagal resection after the schwannomas these patients is still showing the normal now clinically yet they have a ability to withstand vagal resection because of the long standing compression of the nerve fibers their ability to compensate becomes better so in these patients even if you see the the long term results even after the vagal resection majority of the patients improve well compensate well and they have hardly any Or, you know, long-term aspiration and other issues, but with the end capsule, this um, uh, you know, uh, uh, keeping the capsule intact, the technique which I am going to show, majority of the patient in our series, eighty percent, still we can preserve the function. Leaving the capsule intact since they are slow-growing tumors, 
they are rarely going to recur back. They have a slow growing, long natural history. And in the literature with the encapsula uh, encapsulation mm. technique, patients followed up up to 20 years with hardly any recurrence. Mm. That cannot be uh, better safety than this procedure. Okay. Because preservation of the vagal function is the most important. So now in the surgery, the most important part is the exposure. Like I've al always shown in the, the series of carotid body and the vagal paraganglioma, they have already shown. The first and the foremost thing is the exposure. And the first and the foremost nerve to be protected is the hypoglossal. Hypoglossal run lateral to it and we have to retract and preserve it. We have preserved all hypoglossal nerve so far in this series of webinars. In three or four carotid body and vagal paragangliomas we have demonstrated. Then the second thing, to gain superior exposure, I will definitely divide the diagnostic and if I find reaching problem to the upper end, I will not think twice, dividing the styloid process and the entire styloid complex, including muscle and the stylomandibular ligament. And then I'll have an open gateway to the skull base. Majority of the time, you know, I would say in such phenomenon, 99% of the time, you don't have to go anything beyond this for the exposure when you divide the styloid complex. That opens up the gateway. Okay. The other point I would add is that, uh, as Dr. Satishan uh, rightly said, hypoglossal nerve needs to be saved for better post-op uh, you know, recovery of the patient. The superior laryngeal nerve as well, because the area where you are working there, it's very important to also identify the superior laryngeal nerve, dissect it and save it. Otherwise, the patient might have constant aspiration in the post-op mm -hmm. and various other problems. Dr. Shiva, yeah. I have a habit of doing neck dissection also in the microscope. Mm. Great. Now, whatever suits you. Uh, suturing, um, my assistants do. Hey, meaning so, to say, uh, whatever method is comfortable for the surgeon, they have to follow that. Yes. Even in the last of the webinars, I demonstrated one SOSD, uh, you know, under microscope. See, it's a good teaching tool, number one. Mm. Number two, it cannot be any way uh, you find value or not is a different issue. It cannot be inferior to the open eye, naked eye. Yes. It cannot be inferior to it. That's it. Sir, uh, if we can take... And, uh, yes. See this, even this initial skin incision I am giving under microscope. Mm -hmm. The only disadvantage is your field of vision mm -hmm. become narrow uh, you, under magnification, you know. So I can mobilize, I have a habit of demonstrating under microscope. Mm -hmm. I can do that. Yes, you are making any so point? If we can take if we can take few questions from one, two questions from the previous surgery, is that okay? See this is um uh, plate is my yes, Pramita, what you are saying? Carry on, carry on. No, no, so you carry on. So uh so there were few questions from the previous surgery. So can we take it now or later? Yes, 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 please. Uh, so Dr. Girish is asking, does keeping free fat in the parotid lodge defect will help to prevent facial nerve injury in the revision surgery by preventing plastering no, of facial no, nerve no, and no, skin no. flap? Fat is the best tissue, you know. Okay, let me tell you why I said fat. Why not muscle and all? It's mm. not about a closure, I tell you. Mm. In the post-operative follow-up, you know, mm. this. that's why I'm always against the muscle flaps in obliteration. Mm. Try to avoid as much as possible. The reason is, particularly in tumors, mm. in the parotid lows, if I obliterate with the fat and I have to follow up radiologically, mm. in the fat suppressed imaging, I can always see the recurrence so easily. You know? Yes. What my point? If yes, I yes. use the muscle, the muscles variably enhance, enhance and it is so difficult to distinguish between a recurrence or the muscle. Mm. And that is yes, so frustrating. Yes. So frustrating. Mm. That's why I always mention, use the fat for obliteration because you can get the fat suppressed imaging and you can have mm. a very good picture, you know, mm. if there is a recurrence. That is the major reason the behind it. Also Second good. is, any time you, you re-explore, Okay. The fat you can easily remove rather than a muscle flap. Okay. You know, with a lot of adhesions. Yes. Fat will not have 
that much of adhesion and you can remove it easily easily most easily what you can remove is the fat okay uh, dr farida ma'am was saying the something? contour is also good with the fat the facial oh, contour okay. also is much better than with a muscle yes okay you okay. can use as many fat as you want according to the contour and mm -hmm. i wanted to add a point to dr shiva's advice regarding mandibular tomy we used to do a lot of mandibular tomies for uh, tumors we thought would not be i mean we were closer to the skull base but one of the complications we found initially was a salivary leak right. if the closer was not meticulous and then we found that uh, of course uh, you need not do a mandibular tomy for everything you know mandibular tomy approach is uh, a beautiful approach the tumor just pops out on your face it's a beautiful uh, approach to do but then it's uh, a pain closer do the closer and all so this method if you could do it through the neck i mean it is much more uh, convenient and with lesser complications that's what i felt Okay. Definitely, I mean, uh, as much as possible, if you can avoid a mandibular tomy, nothing like it because it definitely oh, adds mobility to your face. But then, so many mandibular tomies and mandibular like tomies. You like to go in for a mandibular tomie? So yeah. What, what the heck, yeah? You love that approach also, but I think the cervical approach, as far as possible, is much more better. Correct. But the point I was trying to draw, trying to drive home so was that starting. when necessary, don't yes, don't uh, shy away from a mandibular tomy. That's the point. Yeah, that is important point. If required, don't think twice. Never compromise with the exposure. And regarding that's why, you know, Tata is the center. Believe me, this is from my heart, where the evidence-based practice is prevalent. Completely pure evidence-based practice. I can say for one center, for sure, where this is something practiced routinely. Routinely, it's it's not something that. somebody likes something and is doing something it is something uh, never happens in tata tata is pure evidence based and they have been organizing every year you know the workshop only and only the theme is evidence based medicine ebms and those are worth attending for everyone now coming to the very important point i always mention when i open the neck in this region about the marginal mandibular now like i demonstrated in the you know Uh, all carotid body tumors sosd some mandibular gland resection every time the identification and preservation of the marginal mandibular are, there are many ways direct indirect ways let me tell you the direct way mm. see this point what i am mm. showing where my finger is what is this point gonian mm. gonian yes, yes. is the point you need to take mm. into reference and the marginal mandibular now is within 1 cm vicinity now see at this point i raise my flap subplatysmal mm. and now see i am raising elevating this tissue mm. can you see something coming mm. can you see something yes, yes so simple mm. i we always believe in positive identification of the nerve rather than so many many over described all indirect methods this now can have a variable course mm. all indirect measures may not work mm. if you try to pull the vein up this and that that may not work always mm. you know suction the so best is utha dal dal artery artery suction yes From where to where exactly do you dissect this now? I I don't intend to go right into the parotid for that matter. This I am leaving it at the upper limit. You know. Okay. We are not supposed to bother about uh, you know the course and dissection of the this, this now right into the parotid. That is not needed. You know this now is left below and going deep into the parotid, which I am not going to go. This is. Uh, going to be my upper limit as i am going to go along the margin of the mandible kai pedal point regarding the drain what uh, dr shiva said not don't put a romovic drain in parotid he is against uh, drain um, uh, romovic negative pressure in the parotid but if you put that drain 
in inferior to the posterior belly of digastric in a u shaped manner then there will not be any risk of uh, facial nerve so whatever uh, trying to say was when you done a neck dissection you like to put a drain make sure that it doesn't go into the field of parotidectomy where nerve is exposed because a constant oh, negative wow. pressure might add to the post op yes. paresis <laughs> if you have done only a superficial parotidectomy you can do away from you know without a, a, a negative pressure drain that is a romovac you could just put a glove drain and in 2 days it will be out and it's and it's safer for the patient so we have done uh, we have done away from using a romovac drain for superficial parotidectomies and we just put a the reason sometimes the soiling of the dressing is so much but it should we wouldn't be a problem if we can just do frequent dressing it will take care of it and uh, it can i mean you just need to do a appropriate dressing and that's not a major problem the main problem would be to you know save the nerve i guess Yes. See now, this is just flap breathing. I never say that you raise the flap under microscope, but you start doing it, you'll get used to the microscope so easily. So now we are going into the parapharyngeal space quickly. In next few minutes, we will be right on the lesion. And our next case is ready. Yes. And after that, yes. So next case would be a glomus tympanicum. We have already uh, demonstrated a couple of glomus jugulars uh, okay, involving the carotid, the skull base, and all that. So today would be the glomus tympanicum to add on to the variety. See that's the enter the tractor lagam. See that's the enter border of the. That's the. Can you see the internal jugular? Hello. Yep. Close yep. the enter laterally. See this? Yes, yes. Enter jugular, uh, internal jugular, post enter laterally. It's a treat to watch the Dr. Shiva doing neck dissections. I have seen a couple of times, and watching him operate is a real pleasure. Thank you for those kind words. It's really I am talking all very honest. See this all the vessels are pushed anteriorly and the tumor is deep to these vessels what we uh, uh saw on the scan they can make a pagal now Anterior medial, you can see all these nerves which are veins which are angles. I coagulate them. That's the submandibular gland, and here medially would be the carotid artery, and that too anteriorly placed. Okay. these are the nodes at the level 2 tributary tributary short short ah oh. tai tai so i'll quickly open up the plane to reach onto the tumor i am right on the tumor already on the tumor I'm uh, slowly, slowly opening up my, you know, space. Okay, okay. So please orient again. So many people are there. Okay, okay. For because the field is narrow. Yes, okay. Sir. 
this is inferior this is superior i am on the left side so this is lateral this is medial this is superior this is inferior and superiorly this is your marginal mandibular branch okay now a tumor is deeper here i can feel this tumor laterally this is the internal jugular and at the medial end you will find this tractor the carotid vessels which i am going to show you very soon and satish you may have observed also that always you see these lymph node enlargement before the tumor at level these are all reactive vessels you are right veins engorged because the tumor size and these are all uh, you know related findings hmm? and see where the carotid artery you pull karna isko see here is your carotid artery yes sir i can show you see this carotid can you see yes 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 so just mm -hmm. so dekh ke dekh ke mm -hmm. that's the carotid which i would like to trace as the tumor is deep to these two critical structures so what are the chances Chikata, of malignant transformation in these tumors Vagal stronomas rarely. The vagal stronomas, I mean, uh, okay. the one thing is the malignant peripheral uh, nerve sheath tumors. That's a different entity altogether. But the transformation of a vagal okay. uh, uh, stronoma into a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor is very, very rare. Okay. But then uh, the rate of growth of the vagal stronoma is like one mm per year. One, two, three. So some, some are fast growing. Sorry. Nay, that in general the literature says yeah. is one mm for a vagal schwannoma. It's not going okay. to be beyond that. That's the documented rate of growth. Now see the tumor, okay. and the most important structure, as uh, Doctor um, uh, Shiva has also mentioned, is the hypoglossal. Uh, yeah, now and see, the, yeah, we all the know hypo hypoglossal crosses the carotid vessels. Hmm. See, this is the surface of the schwannoma. This is schwannoma. and some vessels on the surface you know yeah so that is why it's very very rare and uncommon for malignant transformation the tractor laga upar 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 and no. that is why uh, the philosophy for treating vagal schwannoma also is changing over the years like in this case it's a symptomatic case and that's why you are operating in this Other, patient otherwise asymptomatic case yes you know, asymptomatic the patients, patients you can observe you can observe oh. safely you can observe safely so you don't have to jump into a vagal schwannoma the moment you see it in an mri you know can we discuss something about carotid uh, body tumor also here yes yes so like suppose if a patient is having bilateral carotid body tumor then which side you operate first and why i mentioned this um, uh, if you remember last time when i was showing the carotid body tumor deepak for anyway you asked for first of all i missed that if, if if there are no cranial nerve symptoms so far first you operate the side where you can preserve the cranial nerve better you can preserve the carotid better see the hypoglossal now can you see yes 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 sir hypoglossal crosses the carotid vessels and that's how see in all a carotid body the first nerve we encounter was the hypoglossal mm -hmm. Yes. Jala, jala, jala. So, first you operate on the side where you can preserve the function of the cranial nerves and the function of the carotid as well, much better. Where you have a better chance of preserving. And once you have done it, mm. once you have done, like we have done a lot of times mm. in bilateral tumors, after seven days we went to the other side and operated. Mm. Oh. If you have given any cranial nerve palsy. any injury to the carotid or any reconstruction you are done then you cannot do on the other side better so uh, dr dalmia the philosophy for treating bilateral uh, you know paraganglioma is, is uh, evolving and it is changing over the time so uh, surgery is not the answer all the time it depends on case to case basis and most importantly in these patients you have to do uh, genetic yes. counseling and search for 
any other uh, paragangliomas that are there you know in the body other than just in the neck because bilateral you need the imaging for that to rule out yeah, other areas yeah uh, yes yeah uh, yes, deepak imaging deepak yes either you get the you know genetic testing like dr shiva is saying that is a uh, succinate dehydrogenase mutations number 1 or sorry gma labels that is succinate dehydrogenase mutations pakad le oh main nahi or all these testings are available in india yes yes yeah, or or what you can do is a dota testing you know dota that uh, fix uh, dota pet you know they use the dota yes. uh, that is one of the you know the uh, radio pharmaceutical you know radio yes. uh, uh, pharmaceutical you tag uh, yeah and you imagine. know there are lot of advantages of it number one i tell you okay sometimes you may f- as as you may the paraganglioma and you are still in a fix whether it is paraganglio or not the dota testing will confirm number one number two it will pick up any where lesion anywhere else in the body at the same time number 3 in the recurrences is a big role see the vagal nerve fiber can you see here yes on the capsule yes yes, yes. no no this is not vagal nerve fiber this, sorry this is hypoglossal this is ansa ansa yes, yes absolutely it's coming from the hypoglossal see this like sorry that. yes yeah. yes yes yeah, cut cut ansa here i don't think twice before you know cutting the ansa away and that is the carotid i am trying to separate so the thing is that you need to counsel the patient and you know just see as to how you deal with it because we have many a time many times quite often we have seen bilateral you know carotid bone tumors with a vagal schwannoma or a jugular uh, you know glomus uh, vagal and things like that so it's a very tricky decision as to how how you operate which one you operate so there's no straight forward uh, answers to this it's a you know you're here you to talk to the patient the family and it's a you know a combined decision the other thing is always remember surgery is not the only option you have non surgical options as well for these patients if if required like so radiotherapy has shown like radiotherapy actually beam radiotherapy young, has shown young female hey, that's what so no i'm not talking about individual case i'm just telling an option so that option will depend on again as you said the age of the patient you know uh, and various other factors whether it's unilateral bilateral which one would you want to you know irradiate whether the patient has cranial lump palsy or not at this present you know actually uh, i want you know, to present a case scenario like uh, suppose a 25 years female with bilateral mm-hmm. carotid body tumor mm-hmm. just only symptom mm-hmm. is swelling over the neck on one side yeah. so how you will proceed so it or I, how I, you will okay. manage so it so it also depends on you know uh, whether this is the first time the patient is coming to you if it is the first yes. time the patient is coming to you not symptomatic you just want to do an imaging for this patient mm-hmm. and just check what type of you know carotid body tumor that is mm-hmm. and then observe over a period of time and then sometime you might have to operate at, mm-hmm. at least one of them and the question is at which point so like what dr satish jain said whether the nerve is involved or not whether you'll be able to say whether shamlin 1 2 or 3 you know uh, if it is shamlin 1 then one, you probably will have to go in and operate one on one side uh, and shamlin 3 on other side sorry shamlin 1 on one side and shamlin 3 on other side yeah so pro- so in this situation what i would do this is a young female so probably i will just operate on the shamblin 1 because i'm sure i'll be able to get it out and give uh, the option or keep the option of radiotherapy on reserve in case she becomes symptomatic right. then yes, i would yeah. suggest radiotherapy rather than resecting yeah. the nerve the carotid and reconstructing because you really don't know how the patient will uh, you know uh, react even if you have a balloon occlusion test done which shows that there is an intact uh, circle of villus circulation you 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 never know 25% of the times the patient may develop stroke despite a patent uh, circle of villus mm-hmm. so you have to be very careful in choosing uh, that again depends on various other things you know so there's no right or wrong in this and there is a lot of philosophy that is changing and radiotherapy uh, has shown good control rates it can definitely be one of your options also remember observation is one of your option radiotherapy is one of your option surgery is one of your option so you so, can quite diligently choose enlarged. one modality for different type of patients yes. with the situation that you have that so, you are so like deepak yes if it is an elderly patient yes you can observe and if it is showing growth you can take the call of radiotherapy because it is slow growing tumor and radiotherapy contains the growth 
Yes. It, it there is a lot of tumor. Now see, see radiotherapy will not shrink the tumor. Yes. It will, it will just control it will the tumor. It will induce fibrosis in the vessel supply. And, yes. and it will probably prevent the palsies of the cranial yes. nerves, which is again also important. Hello? Yes. See what yes, I am doing here. Yes, dissecting the hypoglossal from this the tumor. This is hypoglossal? Yes. I'm. Yes. See this. Toward the upper end. Now, now I don't have a control at the upper end. See now. Mm. What is this muscle? Digastric. See this? Yes. yes. I mentioned a couple of times to go up what all you can do, all maneuvers. My first maneuver would be artery dolmiche. First maneuver would be to cut this. Cut yes. this. And see, you have to be careful. Just deep to the digastric, you may come across the occipital artery. These are two muscles. The one is digastric, the other one is stylohyoid. Yes. And this will, see this? See this artery? Can you see this? Yes, yes. This yes, is occipital. Yes. Like it. This is a very important vessel. And we have uh, discussed a couple of times. Why we do Sometimes we have discussed the occipital artery base flap we use during mastoid surgery. What is the, Satish, what is the use of doing this genetic study? What it you gives know, you know, the succinate dehydrogenase uh, mutations are responsible most of the time. And there is a good information you can get out of it. Number one, if the patient has a SDHB mutation, there is high likelihood of developing into malignancy as well. Paragangliomas. I mentioned last time vagal paragangliomas out of all yes. jugular, carotid and vagal paragangliomas, vagal have a highest chance of converting into malignancy. And those having yes. SDHB mutations have a highest chance of converting mm. into malignancy. If you have a SDHB mutations, mm. there are higher chance of having multiple tumors. And then mm. you need to have information of all tumors by means of doing systemic studies angiographies, dota mm -hmm. studies, and all that. Mm -hmm. So mutations have a, a value in terms of counseling the patient, in terms of overall management of the patient. Mm -hmm. And it's available in all India Institute. Okay. In Mumbai, actually, now see, so there have been this, is my yes, this, this is my hypoglossal. Can you see? Right. Clearly. Yes, sir. And here is the tumor. What so is there the are various studies on the intracapsular excision yeah, versus that's what, the that's extracapsular what I'm, resection. That's what I'm telling you. The, that's yes, what I'm coming yes, to. And that's what I'm yes, going sir. to show you under high magnification. Okay. So do you do, sir? Which is your preference? I mean, no, no, no. See... What I'm so I think the intracapsular. You, yes. Yes. See this. What I'm trying to show you. I yes. have to keep an eye on the fibers. Yes. Oh. These are these are vagal fibers. Can you see the fibers? Yes. Hello. Yes. Can you yes, see sir. the vagal Clearly fibers? See. see here. Yes. 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 Uh, this is the hallmark of our procedure under microscope. Yes. See this? Yes. So, sir, sir, so can you focus a little? Life. So can you focus a little more, sir? Yes, yes. See this? Yes. See the vagal fiber? Yes, yes. And what I am going to do is I am going to incise the capsule here. Capsule, yes, sir. See this? Yes. See this? Inside the capsule. Yes. yes. Inside the capsule, and this capsule will have all around mm. the vagus fibers, you know. Okay. You have already separated the great vessels. Yes. And I believe this will preserve my vagus now function to some extent. See this? Mm. Out. See this? Yes. 
what yes, this sir. is the capsule intact yes yes over and mm -hmm. see this capsule has fiber now fiber see the lot of now fibers Excellent. yes sir yes yes, yes sir no, no, it's no, amazing sir and this is intracapsular dissection mm. see everything all structures were around the tumor we mm. went inside the capsule you don't have mm. to bother about the jugular carotid all nerves mm. see the hypoglossal all are outside the capsule mm. you know yes sir is there just out of curiosity i am asking is there any study of doing this intracapsular or extracapsular you know, Deepak, yes. I will mail you tonight several studies. Okay. Several articles, yes, sir. Uh, so so the, recurrence, the recurrence rate now, in these. Now, uh, now the important thing after this, hmm. since this capsule contains now fibers. Yes, sir. Now the only disadvantage is you have to be very, very, you know, cautious about. We are not supposed to use cautery at any point of time now. Hmm. Because on this capsule all around, where the nerve fibers hmm. are, you know, hmm. if I happen to use cautery, I will end up damaging what I preserved. Hmm. What's my point? Yes, sir. So what we will do, we will use a uh, surgical uh, surg cell hmm. wrapped over the gel form mm -hmm. this is strongly contraindicated here to use any cautery you have to have patience it stops mm -hmm. because this capsule of this tumor mm -hmm. contains the nerve fiber see the nerve fibers are splayed like this all around the tumor yes. like this yes sir splayed all around like this mm -hmm. and this tumor starts from one of the fascicle of the nerve and mm -hmm. then keep displacing the other fascicles and all mm -hmm. the nerve fibers are on the capsule and tumor mm. is inside. Mm. So now, once I have uh, preserved the capsule, all nerve fibers are supposed to be there. I just inside the capsule parallel to the nerve fiber, mm. then a finger dissection inside, mm. and now this is a thin capsule. Mm. I can't even think of using cautery anywhere on the capsule. That will ruin everything, what I have done. Yes, sir. So this yes, sir. is the best way, I believe, it's pure evidence based and we have done couple of times. See, this is the capsule. This is the capsule. Yes, yes. Excellent. Yes, sir. Very excellent. Uh, so, so, which cases will you do the extra capsular resections or yes, there is yes. immune transformation that you are... Hello? Hello. Yeah, we got yes. you back. So, oh, am I so can you hear? Yes. Yes, yes, yes you are. Yeah. So, your question is when I would do extra capsular? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. In which case? The vagal is already gone. Okay. Then what, what I will preserve when the vagal function is already gone, mm -hmm. I will do extra capsular. Then I will just cut it across and remove it. See now what I've used. This gel form on the marrow cell, uh, on the uh, surgery, uh, see this, surgery cell on the marrow cell. gel form around, can you see yes. this? Yes. Then we'll keep a gauze piece for five minutes, we'll put a corrugated drain and we'll come out. See this, it will stop, we'll never use the cautery. My great vessels are there on both sides, can you see? The nerves yes. are there, this is the hypoglossal, here, see this? Yes. Yes, sir. And the marginal mandibular up there. You can see. Yes. That is the marginal mandibular. Just, I want to know excellent dissection, Satish. I want to know the cost of the balloon occlusion test. Cost of balloon occlusion? Yes. 
with the cost of dsa yes a balloon lot of people use a balloon again and again the disposable balloons are available not very costly but dsa cost depends upon the hospital to hospital but here in jaipur our uh, dsa and balloon occlusion we done we get them quite often uh, and uh, the cost around uh, 30000 or so the complete dsa wherein we do three testing for the carotid mm. i already mentioned in the previous one of the webinars mm. what why we are doing in case we need to you know resect the carotid in any unfortunate situation mm. whether we have adequate cross flow coming from opposite side so mm. in that dsa we get three parameter tested number one mm. number one the venous phase difference between two sides and it should not be about 2 seconds that venous phase is difference in the cortical filling veins and that gives you good insight uh, about the you know the cross flow coming from the opposite side if it is not delayed more than 2 seconds number 2 is balloon occlusion test in hypotensive condition you know all these tests for the carotid artery occlusion are never 100% safe in spite of all these tests you can still get a stroke the reason is very obvious because your cerebral vasculature has to adapt to a new circulation wherein the circulation coming from one side to the entire brain and the vasculature has to adapt to it in any given situation in the post operative period the patient undergoes hypotension and what balloon test you have done under normal intensive condition may go in a stroke so the balloon occlusion test under hypotensive condition and if the patient passes that balloon occlusion under hypotensive that is much more reliable than any regular balloon occlusion test and the third parameter is the stump pressure you occlude on one side and the opposite side carotid stump if that pressure is more than 2/3 of the systolic pressure that time is a is something you can go ahead with the carotid resection i can say so these three okay. parameters is the patient passes they are close to 100% uh, uh, safety towards preventing stroke in case the carotid need to be occluded so a single okay. parameter of balloon occlusion test doesn't carry any value what i mean to say yes is there any uh, role of just pressing by finger yeah. if you are yeah. not doing balloon occlusion test pardon by just pressing with the index and middle finger for that is of any use uh, that that is never reliable man stokro dipak you can't rely on that yes how can you i am just asking here i am just this is such a critical decision yes such a critical decision rather many a times you know in a skull base we do so often many a times we had to take this call of carotid resection or completely you know coiling the parent artery in case we have a tumor around looking at a good uh, you know anterior and posterior cerebral artery Uh, uh, cerebral circulation, uh, the circle of village. In spite of that, even when you resect the carotid or coil it completely, what we do? We keep the patient in the ICU and keep the patient in stimulated hypertensive condition. Keep the patient on norad at least for seven days to prevent hypertension happening. If the patient passes those seven days, you know, the cerebral vasculature develops accordingly. and you can almost nullify the you know the incidence of stroke after that that this is such an important parameter so we keep post operatively in icu under no red for hypertension under hypertension you know you have to prevent stroke that is a disaster in spite of all tests still you can give stroke because the cerebral vasculature is not adaptive to the new uh, circulation phenomena anything anybody wants to add on to this case or any discussion we have done so far? So, so in vagal paraganglioma, so then in vagal paraganglioma, we are doing end block excision. And end block excision. Uh, Doctor Palani Appan is asking, in vagal paraganglioma, we are doing end block excision. La Where is in vagal? Last week I demonstrated vagal paraganglioma, wherein at both ends I resected the vagus nerve. in vera vagal paraganglioma the vagus nerve resection is inevitable no one on this planet can preserve the vagus nerve in paraganglioma 
Vagal paraganglioma. Paraganglioma is a different etiology. Neurofibroma, again, the vagal nerve neurofibroma is a different entity. Like I said, schwannoma arise from the epineurium. The neurofibroma arise within the nerve from the perineurium. And they infiltrate the nerve. That is impossible to preserve. So depending, you need to understand the pathology, what we are operating for. And that's how we need to counsel the patient as well. Tell us something about yes, urine sir. catechola means that 24 hours, what we say, the collecting urine. Uh, initial testing, if you have a, you know, the symptomatology warrants towards a functioning tumor, like functioning carotid body or vagal perineal. Yes, you need to do that. And anyway, if it is, you have to operate. The, the, the plan is going to be same with additional, you know, anesthesia care, perioperatively. Okay. Additional anesthesia care. So the next case we are going to take is a glomus tympanicum. And before that, I'll quickly go for 5-10 minutes for STPs in between. And then the next case will be ready by then. That is glomus tympanicum. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, let me show you the pictures, the scan. Though in tympanicum, the scan hardly carry any value. उनका and the glomus, yes. So, can, can you share the screen, please? Glomus tympanicum are the tumors which are generally picked up by the clinical history, clinical examination. You put your endoscope in the ear or otoscope and you find a, you know, bluish mass behind the tympanic membrane. A limited bluish mass with the added on CT scan showing no extension anywhere out of the middle ear. Is a glomus tympanicum as simple as that. Dr. Shiva has left, and I really want to thank him for his inputs. We really enjoyed his. Uh, yeah, yeah, we are. I am so grateful yes, to him. Yes, yes. Yeah, he has been. Yes, uh, yes. So good, and mm. I am really uh, grateful to him from bottom of my heart. We've learned. For yes. really yes. sparing his valuable time. Thank you, Dr. Shiva, once again. So. In glomus tympanicum, what you will find on the CT scan, hardly anything. What all you can find at the most is some mass in the middle ear like this. Can you see? Which may be yes, extending sir. anteriorly towards the used chicken tube or sometime extending towards the atic. So that's how if you go to the Mario Sana's classification, the glomus tympanicum or the type A paraganglioma, the right term is not glomus tympanicum for that matter. For our convenience and for understanding, this is a more it's popular glomus. term, glomus tympanicum. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the paraganglioma is a more appropriate term. Mm -hmm. And for these uh, glomus tympanicum, they are type A paraganglioma. Type A are mm -hmm. further divided into two types. Type A1, when you see the entire circumference of the tumor through the tympanic membrane, that mm -hmm. means it is limited to the promontory and not extending anywhere. That is type A1. Mm -hmm. And those are the tumor you can simply remove by the same transcanal approach like you use for surgery. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And the type A2 are the tumor when they extend beyond your visualization of the otoscopy. Either they extend in the eustachian tube, atic, or they could be extending into the hypotympanum or mastoid, maybe type B tumors. You never know. When yes. it is beyond the scope of visualization on otoscopy, it can be anything but it is at least type A2. And for that, mm -hmm. you need a post-auricular approach. What we do, like we do for any tympanoplasty, I'll show the simplest way. There are many ways. Still, you can, you know, raise the flap like tympanoplasty and coagulate the tumor and come out. Or this may, many a times, you may end up damaging the tympanometal flap by means of your cautery and any other thing instrumentation by means of handling the bleeding and all. What we can do, that's what I'm going to show you. You can elevate the entire cuff of 
tympanometal flap 360 degree bring out in the saline drill away the canal properly so that you can see the tumor all around better and then remove the tumor and replace your cup of skin of the uh, external artery meatus along with the tympanic membrane back after the temporal fascia mm -hmm. grafting this is how mm -hmm. this is the safest way of doing this uh, you know such tumors which are going little beyond the tympanic membrane confines but anyway you have to preserve the ossicular chain that is the main goal and that can happen only when you have a good exposure yes so this is to me is a type a2 tumor i don't know even on the ct scan you can't make out much see this tumor which is on the promontory this is the promontory here that's yes. a cochlea and this is going a little bit for sure it prolapses easily into the eustachian tube and simply you can pull out of that that is hardly any big issue the only issue is whether it is going in the atic this is doubtful i have a doubt this tumor is you know uh, deep to ossicle these are malleus and incus mm. and if this is a tumor you can't differentiate uh, between the opacities you know you can't differentiate between tumor and secretions so easily and that is how it may be in the atic or it may be going from there towards the antrum not very sure but by and large it is a2 tumor and let's see what it is we'll follow it and remove it most okay. likely i'll be raising the cup of the uh, canal skin along with the tm and mm. make it free and replace it later on mm. this is the plan let's see if i raise the flap and i find the tumor easily i can bring it into the field by mobilizing it i may not do it mm -hmm. so that will be a purely intraoperative decision will you okay. not keep that uh, cuff attached at the uh, short Are process of malleus or at 12 o'clock why still uh, that will create problem if you are drill, drilling ext extensively into the canal or using bipolar cautery everywhere that may damage the we are preserving it by bringing it out we are preserving it not damaging it yeah i know but sometimes it is not so easy to keep in a right manner same way how we lift it uh, in the canal pardon sometimes sometimes you are confused after uh, taking it out where is the upper and where is the lower sometimes the exact repositioning of flap is not so easy no it falls short you know once you drill the canal and reposit the flap back all <laughs> hello hello yes sir yeah can you hear me yes yes so in that situation if the flap falls short after drilling mm. you may have to use some additional thin skin from the post auricular region you can use that okay so now i have washed up for the stapes case mm. and 5 10 minutes will be going to the uh, glomus tympanicum that is already induced question khulwa de canal khulwa de that case will be ready with the uh, posteriorly canal opened up and will go directly to the tumor okay any questions meantime uh, sir on radiology how to differentiate type a2 paraganglioma from the cholesteatoma type doctor radiology Yes, the paraganglioma will enhance on contrast. Mm -hmm. The, the collagen one will not. Yes. Paraganglioma is a tumor. बड़ा दे. सबसे बड़ा दे. तीस स्क्रीन को थोड़ा सा ऊपर कर लेगा. या या. ये क्या है ना तो? रिस्क लगाया यार. Forceps. Are you getting the microscopic picture? Yes. Okay, no. Do it, okay. Do it.
Yes. How's the picture now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thoda watch kar. Ye sab karke rakhna tha na. Watch. So what is the uh, what is the management for crocodile tear? Dr. Uh, Rama Subramaniam from Chennai has been asking them this question quite several times. Difficult. First of all, mm. that is a difficult occurrence, and then tympanic neurectomy. So, what all you want to do? Okay. For all these issues, finally tympanic neurectomy, you know. Because that will take away the salivary gland stimulation completely. Yes. As simple as that. All problems related to hyper stimulation of the salivary gland, you can do tympanic neurectomy. Mm -hmm. Now, can you see the whole window? Yeah, we can. Little narrow, you know. You can see little narrow. Yeah. Can you? Right. Yes. Space between yeah. the crura and the facial nerve is the space he's talking about. Yeah. It's see this less. incus and amelius. Amandi. Yes. I'm alive, Babi. Bhai chala gaya ho. Ab to lagta saal nahi chalega. Nasi, I'm taking away this joint capsule. I found the joint and passed my instrument to the joint. See this? Yes. Yes. Sir. Laser. Hmm? Where's the beam? Satish, beam. do you believe yeah. in a reverse stapedotomy? Yes or no? Yes, I demonstrated it last time. No, the uh, it's not. Thing. It is not the belief. It's a matter of once I have a laser, I need not to do that. Exactly. So uh, many times if you, people uh, say no. It has to be done every time. I want you to, uh, you know. No, 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 no. Yes. If you have a laser, you don't have to do all that. So there are only certain conditions, and especially if you have a laser, you really don't need to. Uh... So So the reverse step dot we discuss in detail in the step B webinar. One of the case I demonstrated, and the idea is in the favor that can be done only in certain favorable situation, not always. And you when know? and when situation is favorable, you really don't need to do a reverse because the anatomy. You can do regular one. Yeah, you can do regular. Reverse is to add on to the safety. It's not about the need. If you don't have a laser, you don't want to risk the foot plate coming out and all that. Lizing, no. You can add on the safety by means of, you know, fenestration and piston application, keeping the entire stapedial arch intact. That is the whole idea. Uh, can you move the, uh, uh, I mean, screen a little up because uh, the tendon is not in uh, the center. Yeah. Perfect. Now? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So what, now, what, what is the wattage you are firing here? First is the tendon. The tendon is 4. So you are using 4 watts, depth of 1 two. and a round two, shape. Two, depth two, of two. 2 and a round shape. So tendon gone? Yeah. Now, now for the thrust. So you will put a gel foam in the foot plate? Yes. Most of the time. Then come here, come here. This is always good to keep it. Yeah, because many times the laser beam overruns yeah, the edge. It may overshoot. It is always good to have this protection. So, which company is your titanium piston? This 
many doctors have called kurz kurz and kurz only are ye hill kyon raha hai yaar ye bin kyon hill raha hai kitna bhai bada do so if everyone notices carefully once the char gets formed the laser's effectiveness reduces ye kyon ho raha hai pabas laga isko so do you advise post op on table tuning fork test and Pardon? sleep surgery do you advise post op on table tuning fork test in stepy surgery on table why post operative dr girish is asked not needed on table why see if you have done everything to perfection and uh, on table uh, even if you do and it is not coming okay Okay, that means there is a problem which so your diagnosis was wrong or the round window artist process. Anyways, you won't have to do anything. Niara. Okay. The hill raya. This is dark. हो गया. अच्छा light कम किया. Hmm. See why it is jumping? No, why it is blinking? हाँ, उसको सदी start करना पड़ेगा laser को. बंद करके चालू कर प्लीज सी इट इज ब्लिंकिंग यू री स्टार्ट इट आई हैव ऑलरेडी यू नो होलोड आउट द पोस्टिंग क्रस कैन यू सी ऑलरेडी वी कैन डेट कैन यू सी दिस यस यस सो एट दिस पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम इफ यू वांट फाइन पिक विल फ्रैक्चर इट यस सी सी इजीली Easily you can fracture. This is the anterior crust, mm. and it is out. Mm. Forceps. Yes. Once you have this, um, Ashish does very uh, frequently. He calls the thinning of the posterior crust. And you know many of the patients, which are not good candidates for the reverse. You know, you can make good candidates for the reverse by means of thinning the posterior crust. See now. So plate level. Yeah, yes. and do you see the right. little part of the posterior crust which was left? He has fractured it and put yeah. it posteriorly. Yeah. So my uh, exposure is not compromised. Yeah, so the foot plate is. Yeah, la. Oh, do na mere ko measuring, measuring. Oh, ready? Are next? You can actually see the focus also anteriorly and anterior superiorly. If you see the color is like. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes. 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 So now measuring gaze, I'll keep at 4.25 common. What loop. is exactly fistula antifenestrum? What is this fistula antifenestrum? Fistula antifenestra is the area of this, uh, you know, anchondral bone. Just see this, absolutely befitting. Can you see? Yes, sir. Fistula and so much. Fistula antifenestra is just anterior to the foot plate. Where the part of the you know inner ear on con and contral bone, which is cartilaginous to begin with, rest of the entire labyrinth, you know, doesn't change. The entire bone remains same. There is no change in the bone after the birth, except that area and that leads to turnover. That's how the autosclerosis develops because that bone, which is inactive. and hard mm. changes to this hypodense and vascular bones and that leads to regular uh, intermittent you know sclerosis that's why autosclerosis and sclerosis go on so that area is immediately anterior to the foot plate it's basically a connective tissue filled cleft mm. yes And it is only found in humans. That's another thing. That's why otters lose. Hey, the put the circle here. Yeah. Species. Okay. No. Now see my laser beam. Yes. I remember. I have seen Raman Deep couple of times doing with the same laser. I remember when you do came to Jaipur last time in yeah, the workshop. Yeah, yeah. And I am sure you are not doing without laser anymore. No, for the last eight years, no. 
सी नाउ हटा लो पिक पतला पतला सो मेनी टाइम्स विद द सेटिंग्स ऑफ द लेजर योर the hole might not be perfectly circular because there can be difference in thickness of the yeah. plate and then you see what i have done yeah he's just circled it made it completely okay. round with a okay. gentle uh, motion of the pick of the yeah. okay so my vestibule should be full of fluid hmm. that is my safe to you if the vestibule is full of fluid that acts as a shock absorber for the laser you know yes this laser is not going to this energy is not going to be transmitted, transmitted. to the yes. inner ear inner ear structures yes membranous labyrinth and even for the laser which is absorbed by the few few hmm. hmm. lot of studies have been done hmm. you know about this laser hmm. how much it you know irradiates the fluid how much the temperature increases hmm. and the recent study done hmm. a temperature increase even up to 7 degree mm. transient mm. is not detrimental to the membranous labyrinth so now they even say that let's say had he fired the first shot and the laser had not gone through due to mm. the, no, no, then, never a second one never a second one then oh. use the cold instrument to cold instrument okay that doesn't mean that you fire a second shot mm. you can fire on the edge away from it But, but not there. Hmm. So the advantage of Kurchin you know, is it has two loops. Hello. Yes, sir. The same thing. All three steps in one go. Hmm. My piston at the lower end into the fenestra. Yes. My uh, the piston, uh, you know, the mouth of the piston is taking on the incus, hmm. and it is roughly 0.5 millimeter above the lenticular process. Hmm. Yes, maybe a little shorter. Can you see this? The pistol little shorter. One size bigger. Can you see this? Yeah. Yes, yes. So you can do the bending test and the hanging. Yeah, it is. Uh, see hanging out. Yes, yes. That's what I observed. See this. Yes, sir. One size bigger. See this? Yes, sir. I can easily remove the same way. See this. Mm. So it has two loops. Hmm. So it has come out. Yes. Next size, brother. And now I can use. I can autoclave this piston. And reuse. This is autoclavable. Mm. Plasma it or autoclave it. Okay. Then ah. And also notice he has not done any suction on the open foot plate. Ah, uh, sir, doctor. Disaster. What we uh, mention if you do is a disaster. Uh, not only S N loss, you can also cause post-operative severe vertigo. Ah, uh, sir, what sir? If you suck on the open foot plate. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Yes. You have chances see of the, loss. See the same thing I am doing with a one size bigger piston. Yes. Can you see? Yes, sir. What I mean to say, number one. So ease of piston insertion. Mm. I've seen people really struggling for half an hour or so with the pistons, mm. with the crimping, mm. and ultimately, when the piston is gone, whatever the crimping, they will leave it, leave it, leave it. We don't remove it. Mm -hmm. It will be difficult. See now, this piston doesn't need any crimping at all. Yes. It is so tightly holding like a clip mm. onto the long process. Mm -hmm. Blood. Yes, sir. Sir, But amazing. It will uh, so the, the two surfaces. It will not. What, what I have been showing with these number of tapes, the reproducibility. Hmm. Again and again, you can do with the same ease and comfort. Hmm. We have been doing almost three uh, fifty or so tapes hmm. every year. Hmm. With the same techniques, same piston, yes. with the same ease. If some yes. anatomical abnormalities doesn't make any difference if you have a laser. Yes, sir. Uh, so, what is the cost? What is the cost of this piston? Uh, uh, Thirteen thousand or so. I don't know exactly, but okay. is, the cost is rising up. Rupees falling, euro is rising up. Yes, sir. 
Uh, so, Doctor Jeevan Vedi from Nagpur has a question that overhanging facial canal unable to do fenestra. Then, what will you do? Yeah, many a times uh, you have seen the video of Ashim that day. If you uh, not seen, you must go and go back to the YouTube recordings. Uh, first of all, with a dry gel form, wet gel form, you go to the lower edge of the facial nerve. and try you can mobilize a little bit and get a glimpse of the foot plate majority of the times even if it is prolapsing prolapsing doesn't mean the facial nerve will come right in the middle of the promontory every time that is very rare that is anomaly this is because of the descent now which can be pushed down simple it's not a congenital anomaly you can say it's an abnormality anomaly displays because of the descent and majority of the time you are able to push it little bit up mm. get a space you may have to lend them the incus a little bit sometime and you may have to drill the lower edge of the promontory a little mm. bit sometime and by all these excess maneuvers mm. uh, many of the times you are through mm. you can uh, you know mm. place the piston mm. but this is a difficult problem if you have a pre or ct scan in hand you can counsel the patient accordingly mm. that we may have to abandon the surgery it depends mm. upon the intraoperative conditions okay. and with a little uh, you know uh, consult toward the facial nerve as well mm-hmm. because of the chances of paresis or something in remote situation in the experience hands mm-hmm. that is not going to happen but at least you need to have a consent for that mm-hmm. okay and so one more question dr rajesh choudhury from amritsar is asking what could be the reason for profound deafness after 2 to 3 months after successful yes. steptotomy what is the reason for profound hearing loss after 2 to 3 months after successful step hearing loss after 2 to 3 months after a successful stepotomy if patient comes to you with profound hearing loss what could be the reason put the slide mentioning n number of reasons beyond the surgeon's control can lead to profound asnatal some of the reasons are preventable like ramandeep mentioned mm. never to suck over the fenestra mm. this laser we are not mobilizing the you know inner ear fluid all of a sudden by mobilizing the foot plate mm. by means of using laser and all that mm. you can avoid mm. but there are many reasons beyond your control mm. because of the change in environment because you open the inner ear which is so uh, you know mm. uh, close otherwise from the outer environment mm. so sterile environment mm. and then the change in the inner ear dynamics mm. inner ear fluid situation mm. the there may be high drops developing mm. there may be you know the the molecular changes happening mm. inside the inner ear fluids and all okay, that okay, can sir. lead to but those are beyond your control that's why you should always take a consent mm. in spite of a uneventful step mm. not me still there are chances of snhl that those are beyond mm. your control in very very small percentage of cases yes okay uh, and sir uh, one more question from dr nvk mohan what are the chances of uh, long process necrosis with these pistons yeah, that's a very important nvk mohan from kolkata kolkata yes good evening namas first of all pistons can lead to necrosis of the long process by various ways the commonest way is a loose piston a loose piston into the vestibule inside and a loose on the incus can keep on hitting and erode number 2 the piston which got fixed at the lower end at the edge or out of the fenestra in the old window or anywhere with a vibrating incus can erode it both ways third is over crimping can also be a cause of you know necrosis because the antero inferiorly in the incus run the vessels which mm. you may strangulate because this is less likely to be a reason mm. you know in these titanium pistons mm. that is the beauty they clip they take the incus you know like a clip mm. less than 30% of the circumference of the incus is in contact with the piston which is less likely to erode mm-hmm. number one there is no play between the incus and the piston that's why there is no need of 
crimping with a teflon if you are very experienced you can still do a very good crimping adequate crimping neither over crimping nor under crimping you have seen ashim and ashish in the stepies webinar through their cases they have been doing with the teflon with same ease and comfort and uh, you know results otherwise the crimping is a very demanding procedure you know hmm. over crimping and under crimping both are hazardous and hmm. that yes, part is overcome by this titanium you don't need crimping it takes on the incus that too very rigid so there is no play between the pinkus uh, incus and the piston and there is no question of all those piston related problems are over with this titanium that's it if it is properly used with the adequate length okay forget about it Mm-hmm. So when uh, okay. Satish says he's also that, asking how to Raman Deep was mentioning something. Yes, yes sir, go ahead. Yeah, uh, remember we had discussed that article in which they had shown that if the piston is small, it comes out of the fenestra, it gets fixed at the lower end, but vibration still continues to come, and the underside of the incus gets necrosed. Yes, that is a very uh, you know common reason for this necrosis. Okay. and uh, what about uh, he is also asking how do you deal with an obliterative foot plate with a laser obliterative foot plate need not to be dealt with a laser you know number That's one killed out whatever obliterative foci is mm-hmm. first of all you can pick up by means of a uh, good uh, ct scan ct, CT scan. scan yes number two if it is obliterative you have to counsel the patient accordingly because results in the obliterative can never be as good as in a regular foot plate number yeah. one short term or long short term thing. it calls for a huge experience to deal with a foot plate because this focus can be dealt with only by one way that is proper drilling of the focus with a micro drill onto the oval window So ideally, you need to drill away the entire focus, keeping the foot plate intact. Mm. Then you bring out, discover the blue foot plate below, and mm. then use the use the laser for the finestra. Mm. And it calls for a amazing work kind of a thing. Mm. You know, it's not mm. all that easy. Mm-hmm. That's why the obliterative foot plate or difficult foot plates. Mm. Okay. so the vascularity can be uh, taken away a little bit by firing a few defocus shots on the surface then you start your drilling and once mm-hmm. you blue line it then you can fire a shot again to create a hole okay so i am washing up i am ready uh, getting ready for the next case yes sir and that is a tympanicum means yes. you can take more questions yes uh So, Dr. Ramesh Rohiwal from Aurangabad is also asking any difference in incus necrosis with the titanium piston. With titanium, it is unlikely to be. If it is properly used at the lower end, hmm. it is unlikely to be. Okay. and usually in obliterative focus the size of the piston is usually which we have to use is longer okay you have to measure at the end when you flush the foot plate foot plate and it will usually be 4.5 4.75 little longer yeah uh sir in the previous case actually few uh, doctors had this uh, query about the mandible atomy uh can you uh, elaborate little bit on that vertical mandible never required i mentioned it is never required mandible lot me for the schwannomas yes. is uh, we never do it you can increase your excess by dividing the digastric yes. by dividing the styloid complex yes. stylo mandibular ligament yes. and then by even if it is still uh, you are not able to go about a lesion Hmm. then you can using i i mentioned use your micro divider and hollow it out it will fall down right okay it will fall down kitne kholi hai kanal hmm 
See now this lesion. Can you see something behind the eardrum? Light ban karo upar. Hello. Yes, sir. Can you see something behind the eardrum? Yes. I see you have given trauma while opening the canal. Oh my God. See some trauma on the canal flap. Mm. Can you see the tumor behind the tympanic membrane or not? Yes, the bulge. Here? Yes, yes. Brother, this one. I never wanted this trauma on the canal. Now be careful now. Can you see the tympanic membrane intact? Little yes. trauma over it. How could you give trauma during canal opening? Yeah, oh, come on. Ridiculous. I am first elevating this flap, the posterior part. Okay. Hello. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible, sir. My. बाइपोलर पतली वाली अब से पतली पतली क्या केस करवा रहा है रमेश और पतली रस्ते So, what was the uh, hearing status of this patient? A little conductive hearing, mild. Okay. Not much. Okay. See, the hearing loss generally appears when they immobilize the auricular chain, mm. when they occupy a large part of the middle ear, mm. when they occupy a large part of the eustachian tube. Those are the reasons for hearing loss, mm. and mostly conductive hearing loss because they do not erode much. the anything mm. It is. I am reaching the annulus level to see inside first. Yes. Before taking any final call, mm. that what I am going to do. See the tumor. Mm. Can you see? Yes, sir. Very clearly. Big one. It is not a small one. Can you see? Yes. Better I take the cuff of the skin out. Mm. I see this trauma on the skin. I never appreciate this. I'm just opening the canal. What was he doing inside? So, what are the symptoms of this patient? Hearing loss, tinnitus. Okay. Tinnitus is the major presentation, as mm. the tumor comes in contact with ossicles, mm. and give rise to tinnitus. See entire cuff of the skin. I am raising. Mm -hmm. I hope the picture is good. Yes, sir. very good
See, circumferentially, I am elevating the skin. Mm. Now, the final decision to free it or not, I have to take again on the table. Sickle. Whether I push it superiorly in work if the tumor is not going superiorly or I need to. See the tumor occupying the entire middle ear space. <laughs> See the entire middle ear cavity. That is called a Fume elevator, fume elevator. So, this is never A1 tumor, it is beyond A1. So, fish? Yes, yes. Hello, Satish Maruti. Yes, Maruti. Yeah. Uh, would you like to disconnect the incodocipital joint before handling this tumor? Yeah, yeah. That's first of all, I am ascertaining. As there is a no. Um, See, there is a minimal is conductor. Yeah, yeah. First of all, for everyone, this should be started dealing inferiorly because the vessel comes from inferior side. Okay? Now, before taking yeah, the final call, bipolar, kidra, final call of removing the cuff, what I will do, I will shrink the tumor. Kidra, yeah. See this? Point all. See this cauterization result into tumor shrinking. Can you see? Yes, sir. Yes. And the vessel to the tumor comes from below, so always it should be manipulated from below first. Can you use intermittent with the adrenaline so uh, cotton balls to minimize the bleeding along with yeah, the bipolar cortex? Uh, that doesn't make any difference. Because this is, uh, you know, there are bleeding vessels into it. Uh, adrenaline is not going to affect much. It's not a, a mucosal bleeding, it's a tumor bleeding, you know. See this tumor which was going in the use taken tube, I have? Elevated. Yes. Very nice. Very nice. I have elevated. I will cauterize it and see how it has shrunken now. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. See, more and more you cauterize the tumor shrinks. And you get more and more space. See this, how much the space now we have gained? Yes. See this little bit of the capillary oozing, you know, there you can put your uh, gel form or the cotton ball. And now I will show you the tumor vessels. So Dr. Fazali from Pakistan is asking if total flap is removed and repositioned, any chance of necrosis as... Canaloplasty not really. Not really. It, 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 it is taken up so well. Mm. And we do a couple of times. 
because the vascularity to this tumor uh, to this flap comes from the underlying bone see this promontory attachment can you see yes yes clearly see my incus above Let me know if I go out of the field or anything, please. It's perfect. It's perfect. See what I am trying to take away: the promontory attachment. Yes. these are most important still my cuff is inside you know i have not removed the cuff yet that depends upon the superior extent of the tumor then if it is going i will have to then we have to remove it yes sir come out see it has come out mm. that is a vessel on the promontory you see see that right yes can you see that vessel yes clearly yes jira the moment i cauterize this vessel this will be over uh, even the ball ball probe is a good instrument here see now the circular thing. It is out. <laughs> See this vessel on the promontory. What's up? What's up, then? I am putting. See the tumor is out. Very nice, Satish. Very elegantly done. Now see the vessel there. It's still bleeding. Let me show you. So the Jacobson nerve will be uh, will be injured on yeah, promontory. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. See this vessel. Hmm. Now it is over. See no more bleeding. Yes. yes. Give me a small gel foam over there. So that tumor vessel over the promontory was the key. Hmm. I was all yes, set sir. to remove the cuff. just the one attachment i had to remove you know mm. which i was waiting for had this tumor been going up in the atic mm. difficult to mobilize from the ossicles i would have to remove mm. what the strategy prevented me from removing this cuff number 1 mm. remember always start from inferiorly yes number 1 mm. this is what i'm saying what mario sanas concepts are yes start from inferior kya de gaye kya de gaye gel form yaar number 2 start from inferiorly and number 2 keep coagulating the tumor to shrink it because mm. once you shrink it then only you will be able to see where at all it is going yeah. visualization yes for visualization yes. and you can see the tumor vessel well i saw the tumor vessel the moment i saw the tumor vessel i told you it is going to be out uh, so dr girish from billa is asking if high jugular bulb high jugular bulb occupying the whole of the middle ear space also looks like glomus then how will you differentiate yeah, yeah. radiology 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 will tell you whether it is high jugular bulb or a tumor in this case the jugular bulb was normal yeah why would jugular bulb be normal that's why it is glomus tympanicum yes i will show on the ct scan again i am repositing if there is a small tear anywhere you can supplement with the graft i am not happy with the way the canal was opened By our mm. colleague, so they graph lagai the. 
I will ask him to put a graft. You know, everything is done. We have to just reposit the flap back. Okay. Hmm. I was, I was, uh, you know. Give me a cotton ball. Take a Ayub. Come here, Ayub. Ayub, take a fascia graft and apply. Yeah. Huh? We'll just prophylactically put a fascia graft. Okay. Yeah. Better. Otherwise, there is no perforation at all. But mm. I had uh, when they opened the canal, there was some abrasion of the epithelium of the TM, some canal injury. I don't want to leave a chance of perforation. So we'll just put a graft around. Sir, doctor. Yes, sir. Yeah, that is done. Sir, doctor Narayan Jay Shankar is. Yes, sir. Narayan. Sir, doctor Narayan Jay Shankar is asking you to explain the different approaches for B-type tumors. Okay. First of all, I'll congratulate Narayan for writing a nice book in the lateral skull base surgery. Uh, that is something must read kind of a thing, wherein he has put in his hard work of years together, compiled everything, and it's amazing. Number two, for the B-type tumors, can you hear me here outside? Yes, 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 yes. yes. So for B-type tumors. Hmm, there are three types of B type tumors. What Mario Sana has described. Uh, sir, sir, we can't see anything. It's a black. Pardon? We can, there are we B can categories see, divided see. into B1, 2, 3. Hmm. B1 are the tumors after the A2. This was A2. Because the entire hmm. tumor was not, uh, the circumference of the tumor was beyond the tympanic membrane visualization. You know, what you see on hmm. autoscopy. Hmm. B are the tumors. B1 when the tumor extends to the hypotympanum. Hypotympanum is the area. Hypotympanum is the area where the tumor goes towards the jugular bulb mm. and difficult to remove. So that is B1. B2 when the tumor extends to the mastoid. Mm. And B3 are the tumors which extends anteriorly to erode the carotid canal, the petrous carotid. Mm. So simply looking at the classification, what you can do? B1 going to the hypotympanum, what you can do? Come from behind, mastoid side. Do a posterior tympanotomy, extended posterior tympanotomy by sacrificing the corda. Mm. And besides the anterior approach to the canal, you have another approach from behind. Mm. To the extended facial approach towards the hypotympanum. You can go right into the hypotympanum through the extended facial approach. This is and that is best for the B1. Mm. For B2 tumors extending to the mastoid, again the same mm. approach, but mm. they extend to, towards the facial, you know, retrofacial recess into the mastoid. Mm. So besides, mm. now you, you can use three approaches. One through mm. the canal, second through the facial recess, you know, mm. canal, then second through the facial recess, and third through the retrofacial recess. <laughs> So you can have three entries, uh, you know, three uh, avenues to access the tumor right from the hypotympanum to the mastoid and the middle ear. And B3 are the tumors which erode the carotid artery. And those are the tumors because you have to clear, uh, clear around the carotid ear to drill the peritubal cells, pericarotid cells. And then the eustachian tube function is, you know, Compromise and better, mm. the best approach for them is a subtotal petrojectmal blind sac closure. Mm. That is the answer mm. for B3 tumors. And yeah. this, it, in the coming webinars, we'll keep all these varieties mm. whenever possible. So you can address yes. all the reasons differently. Mm. Any other question? The next, Karen? Yeah. Yeah. Next? Okay. Any other questions? And so that this quartry which you used is the, is the usual quartry or any special quartry? This is a regular bipolar. bipolar. Regular bipolar. Little smaller. Little smaller. Mm. Because uh, the regular one will not be accommodated mm. in the uh, extraordinary canal. Mm. A little smaller. Mm. Yes. And it's a diet laser? Uh, that is not bipolar, boss. Once these vessels, you know, the best for them is bipolar. 
so many by a time, the... many a times we have tried you know insulating our uh, uh, that uh, micro forceps only the tip remained open and you catch the vessel and coagulate with the monopolar we have tried that mm. but that mm. is not safe mm. bipolar is best mm. okay uh, so sir dr jeevan uh, vedi is asking by this cauterization tympanic neurectomy was already occurred so any post operative effect that you will see in this patient? not really mm -hmm. okay There are many alternative pathways which open up. Mm. There are lot many, uh, you know, interconnections of the glossopharyngeal nerve in the jugular foramen with other nerves, mm. and in long term they really, you know, give any morbidity. Mm -hmm. One question regarding tinnitus is: What could be the cause of tinnitus after one month of the stubby surgery? And uh... yeah, so I just answered. See, this is a you know adaptation, cortical adaptation after the hearing loss. Mm. It becomes hypersensitive, and uh, there, there is the a lot of un unexplained things. But majority of the low frequency tinnitus disappear. Mm. Mm. So, in any of your stapes cases, do you use vein graft ever for any? Yeah, many times. Many, many times. Okay. I used okay. to do earlier a lot, and um, this is what okay. Ashim was saying. He always uses a vein graft, except mm. certain circumstances in a deep hole window or uh, obliterating and all. Obliterating so is a contraindication for that matter. Mm -hmm. But if you use a vein, can ossify. Okay. So so then you, maybe in... when you use more perforator or the drill, that time you have to we have to use. Sometimes you get a half full plate comes out or. Mm -hmm. In that case, uh, vein graft is one more good option. If your foot plate is out, or in the laser, I think there is no chances of floater uh, or this thing. So, and wind graft is should we everybody should know that how to take the wind graft and how to use it. Right? That is a thing. Okay, and in one of the should... next time in one of the case. We'll yes, sir. Can we? Yes, sir. So that uh, many are requesting you to uh, demonstrate the harvesting of the wind graft. Okay, we'll show one uh, in the one case at least how to harvest mm -hmm. and use the wind graft. Basic. Yes, principle. sir. Yes, sir. Actually, what I learned from Professor Desai, if when complete foot plate comes out, then you use perichondrium, yes. and when part of the foot plate comes out, then it is better to use vein. Am I right, Satish? Okay. Yes, 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 exactly. And another thing he used always when the entire stapes came out, total platinectomy done. He was by and large against using the piston. Mm. The reason was, being the you know the vestibule having the more pressure than the inner ear than the middle ear, whatever membrane you seal with this vestibule, it bulges towards the middle ear because of the high pressure inside the vestibule. Mm. And if you use a piston, what he believes, it may lead to perforation of the membrane. So once you are doing a total platinectomy and covering the foot plate with perichondrium, anything, he prefers to use the cartilage. That's what Ashim showed that day, if you remember. Yes. He used the cartilage, and that is the uh, something important to learn from. Mm. Now the next case we are moving to, and this is a very interesting story. Mm -hmm. This patient, you know. I don't know what I'm going to get because currently this patient has developed meningitis thrice. Has developed meningitis thrice. And on radiology, finally found to have a defect in the tagmen. Has intermittent history of rhinorrhea. Not exactly otoria, though his tympanic membrane and everything is also not normal. But a history of intermittent rhinorrhea. At present, for the last uh, couple of days, there is no rhinorrhea. We got the scan done, and I will share with you the scan findings, and then we'll explore and see what it is. Now, having developed meningitis thrice, with a defect in the tagmen with, you know, meningocele coming, 
in itself is an indication to close it to prevent future meningitis now which he has developed already three times it's not necessary to have active discharge now once this patient has already uh, you know suffered so much so let me uh, put you uh, this one the 3d mr cystinography mm. Mm. okay this is 3d mr cystinography which i am going to reconstruct in all planes this one see mr cystinography means everything the csf is bright and rest of the things in the background are suppressed so you can become even as small as the csf coming down in the dark background you know that is what mr cystinography is it is a heavy image so let me share you the positive finding this patient has see the coronal image right and if i go behind at this point of time see something compare this side to the opposite side okay is a small this, perforation yeah yeah this looks like a meningo seal coming down and see this right see this in continuity here right with the brain gliosis in the vicinity and hyper intensity of the residual brain that is classical of the changes going on and opposite side absolute normal sulci and gyri mm. and here the gyrus is obliterated yes. you know sulcus is obliterated here yes and this is something which is coming down from here now right. what is this level uh, let me change the sequence what is this level exactly let me show you see this level can you see this can you see this coming very out very very clear the coronal picture this is meningo seal see this right the defect at the skull base the tegmen right and the opposite side normal with the gliosis around and see the area what area is this see the area of the cochlea yeah. see this yes see the defect i see this is the semicircular canals behind Right. Now I am going anteriorly. I am going anteriorly towards the cochlea. See the towards the cochlea and just anterior to the cochlea is this defect. So you can gauge the site of defect as well. Cochlea is in the anterior part of the you know the, in relation to the tegmen. Cochlea is in the uh, in the medial wall of the middle ear. The semicircular canals are behind. Cochlea is the anterior most part of the labyrinth, and this defect is Tegmenetra. superior to the level of the cochlea. See this cochlea? Yeah. Superior yes. to the level and little anterior to it. Mm. That means in the anterior most part of the atic tegmen, it has gone. And this kind of a meningo seal which is coming out, so clear it is. do presently for last couple of days it doesn't have any discharge surprisingly because it is intermittent and because of that it has been overlooked and this poor patient has developed meningitis thrice hmm. so this is one finding second is if you look at the same thing into the ct scan carefully hmm. you know mera bag dena iski cd lagao the ct scan if i show you the level of the defect as well the other ct scan this is not good kaun sa no this yeah among these mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let me put up the right CT scan picture. 
Yeah, it is here. Here, here it is. Invadik from yours. Just a minute. Because that is important to understand the relationship with the ILAGA on the CT scan because it corroborates with the MRI same. The defect is in the anterior part of the tegment tympani and laterally, not only anteriorly, but laterally as well. And that's what I want to show you. This will help us reaching to the level of defect easily. Yeah, I'm opening the uh, DVD. MRI gear. Let me open the same. Okay. Let me show on this. This is also reasonably good. See, this is the regular high resolution CT scan. Let me open up in the coronal plane. See this defect in the tagment on this side, can you see? Very clear. Yes. Let me reconstruct and show you on again uh, in a better way. See, is, uh, the importance is the radiology to clinically evaluate such cases properly. See this. Can you see the level of the defect? Hello? Uh, we can see very clearly. And this is the level of the defect. And see, if you see in the coronal, uh, in the sagittal plane, such defect. See the defect. Yes, sir. Here is the defect. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And in the sagittal plane, anterior to posterior, this is the level of the TM joint. Mm. Behind that, in the anterior part of the tagment, behind the TM joint, and just behind is the superior semicircular canal arm. We know the superior semicircular canal anterior arm is in the atic and it is just anterior to the arm of the superior semicircular canal. Can you see very clear? See how in three dimensional CT scan you can pick up the lesion, the defect so easily. It is so important to reach to the site of the defect. Size of the defect, site of the defect, Everything is so obvious now. So now we have opened the case already. I will go it's and reach to the cost. side of the defect and let's see what best we can do to this patient. How old is the patient? How is the... Pardon? How old is the patient? And what, what could be the reason for this thing? Trauma. He has a history of trauma. Long back. More than no two way. years back. Then hearing loss. How much is the hearing loss? He has a uh, sensory neural hearing loss. Okay. So main, year, symptom is, main symptom is repeated attacks of meningitis. That's how he came through the neurologist because he has developed meningitis thrice and okay. finally he got this defect. Okay, okay. But the cochlea is not ossified that side. Cochlea is not ossified. Okay. Uh, so was there any history of trauma you said? Hello? 
two years back. Two years back. Hello. The his history of trauma was two years back. Yes, yes, yes. That's how uh, he developed this defect, mm. and it was intermittent leak, hardly observed. The anterior part can be overlooked. Presented with meningitis. See the gliosis of the brain because of the repeated meningitis in that region, and. Then finally, the CT scan, uh, this uh, this imaging picked up the defect. So presently, it is uh, not active. Let's see the defect first, and we have to close this defect to prevent future meningitis. Anyhow, what is your surgical planning, Satish? Approach uh, the same postural. I will see, assess the site and size of the defect, and then accordingly take a call. If it is little bigger. I will uh, don't mind. Middle kind of. I will not mind using the middle first approach. Middle first approach. That is simplest and most reliable. You okay? Hmm. Hmm. Hello. Yes. We are ready now. Yes, very much. Yes. Sir. So now, after this, quickly three more cases to follow quickly because those are not big cases, and we'll keep something uh, you know ready to save time. The parotid, parotid will keep the flap raised. Just show the facial now and remove the tumor. Next JNA limited one. I'll keep the dankers done already so that I can show the removal of the tumor and uh, you know a single-sided AFRS in a child quickly. So but all those three that, will not take long. But before that, you have to tell us the secret of your energy. Huh? <laughs> Come on, Deepak. Now, are you getting the picture? Yeah, yeah, very clear. Yes, yes. So, for that matter, even Deepak Darmia sir, uh, is a super fast surgeon, has keep so many cases in his hospital in a day. Yeah, Deepak is champion, all rounder. Mm -hmm. Next week will be, uh, you know, advanced endoscopy. We have skull base, like uh, pituitary and more intracranial cases or skull base cases. Sir, sir, there have been two requests from uh, the uh, queries that I get always that they uh, they all want to see a septal perforation case one, and also want to have a good discussion on malignant otitis. Huh? Yeah, we'll keep a case malignant otitis. Yes. Sir. And the malignant otitis external good discussion, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. That is a good topic. Now, see, are you getting the picture? Yes. yes. Now, yes. see the surface of the mastoid bone, the fracture line. Can you see this? Yeah, very yes. clearly. Past fracture line has been in two years, so it has become like this. See the see the condition of the uh, you know the tympanic membrane. This the base. entire bone is you know broken and see this how this it is tinting. Yes, the bony spicule is yes. Don't not choti patli. CSF autorhinorias are many times, you know, very often they are overlooked. Many of these patients come via this after developing meningitis. Nice.
तो बताता हूँ Besides you, Satish, I salute the dedication of Parumita and Rajiv. Also, they are amazing. Completely with you, and uh, we are enjoying because of them your excellent demonstration of all the surgery. Entire credit uh, go to them for these, uh, you know, webinars for yes. their commitment, dedication, and the hard work. Yes. yes. See how it has become because of the trauma. Yes, fibrosis also is there a lot of. Ball and drill. What you are assessing? What you are assessing? He will do inside out or outside in. What you are assessing here? Yeah, that is not the goal. Inside out, outside in. Here we have to reach to the site of defect. Oh. And we have to seal it. So site of defect you will do by which approach? No, no, no. Thodi bolu cutting da na bande. I will uh, open from behind. I will follow the tagment entry anteriorly. Okay, this is just the fracture line. See the fracture line behind. Yeah. See this? Yes, very clear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Okay, cotton ball. This will ultimately use the cartilage, sorry, the fascia to repair this thin drum. See, the, that is the reason for the hearing loss. See, this ossicle all fixed. Yes. Oh, you have definitely had uh, your bleed after the head injury, you know, with the CSF leak. Yes. Yes. He must have had post head injury. But we must have been missed. Yes, madam. Uh, uh, sir, uh, Dr. Prashant Kiyore from Mumbai is asking uh, even after opening mastoid, uh, you can go via middle fossa approach. Yes. Obviously, the middle fossa is above the mastoid. Middle fossa is above the level of the mastoid. I will show you in case required. Let me first find out the problem. The only thing which concerns me is not having the active discharge. It is always better to go from the normal area to the disease area so that you can appreciate 
what exactly is going on better that's it With a nice tag, absolutely good. Not center left. You are talking. Hello. Yes, Satish. Yes, madam. Yeah. See the nice tag, good. Now we will move on anteriorly. Also, uh, Sunil, some from Jaipur is asking what percentage of cases. Right angle. Yeah. Of meningitis, of meningitis, develop uh, labyrinthitis ossificans, and why some do not develop it? Yeah, it depends upon the pathology, the pathologic organism, and the immunity and resistance of the patient himself. So mostly, but by and large. The meningitis patients who develop, you know, it's a slight chota jada. This thing, uh, labyrinthine ossificans are mostly after pneumococcal meningitis. Still, I'm not reached to the level, you know. I'm going quickly, more anteriorly. This is far anteriorly. Yes, I can see. Also, glimpse. show us the glimpse of something. I will show you. Yes, you are asking something. See, see something. Can you see? See the glimpse of the meningo seal, most likely. See that. Ah, uh, yes. I'm not yes, sure. It now, yes, yes. That is something abnormal there. Ah. So you can just show us the landmarks. Yeah, I am going towards the anterior atic. You know, see from behind. That is the area of the lateral semicircular canal. You can see. Can you see the lateral canal here? Yes, we can. We can. This is lateral canal. Lateral canal, right? Yes. Uh, these are the ossicle completely fixed. I don't know ossicle or a bone. See this. And this is something the meninges which is collapsing. See that? See here. Do you see the glimpse of the brain tissue? Yes. We can. Yes. That is the site. Brain. Right circular. See now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. See this. Yes. The meninges yes. got impacted. Yes. So, so will you expose that area more? Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, I have to expose that area completely because that region is far anteriorly. Mm. See, I can see there. So, doctor, 
Oh, got a good, good lesion, you know, big one. See that below? Yes. Hello. So, Dr. Jeevan Vedi is asking if it is an anterior attic, then why not by zygomatic approach? You can go by zygomatic as well, but the zygomatic doesn't mean that zygomatic approach was invented to come from anteriorly for the labyrinthine facial now, you know, where you need a wide approach. Mm. See the meningo seal coming? Yes. See this one? Yes, sir. What an amazing finding. Mm. See that? What a radiology it was which could pick up. Mm. Now I got the lesion very nicely. Mm. See this? Yes, sir. So what was the hearing? What was the hearing status? I had a profound loss. Also, very little profound loss. Okay, sir. Side side now. See the CSF. Yes. See this? Yes. Reason for developing meningitis again and again. See the reason. Yes, sir. What's up? What an amazing finding. See, I have segregated this tympanic membrane and whatever the retracted portion was. See this? Mm -hmm. yes. See this? Yes, yes, yes. Please. This is a little bit of the bridge we have kept intact. And for that here, mm -hmm. we'll put a cartilage and put a graft to reconstruct later on. Mm -hmm. That is the secondary part of the reconstruction of everything with the CSF. See the site of CSF? Yes, yes, yes. I yes. told you, so, so above, you uh, yes. above and anterior to the cochlea and see exactly where it is. Yes. Can you see? Yes. Yes, sir. It's a big defect. defect. Yeah, yeah. So then will you uh, remove the lateral part of the bone as well? Yes, yes. I will completely, you know, Expose the defect. First of all, diagnosing such a condition is difficult. Yes. Most difficult part. Number two. A good imaging. Yes. I could pick up only because of this good imaging. Otherwise, it is so easy to miss. Mm. So this is the defect. Bipolar. So this is a defect. Right. Yes. Hmm. Circular, circular. Oh, there. A pick, pick, pick. Ah. 
So will you do a blindside closure in these cases? No, no, no. Not so big. Though this is, uh, you know, in profound loss cases, one of the indications. See, this is the defect. Yes, oh, yeah. yes, sir. So clear cut. Yes. Uh, this is the area which is most difficult to be dealt with with the middle force approach, I tell you. Because there are, the bone there is not flat. When you come from the middle fossa, it is quite deep. Can you see this? Yes. Really not. Yes. And there are the bone, uh, when you come from the middle fossa, there are a lot of curvatures, you know, in that bone there. Difficult to place a bony graft from above. Mm. So, first of all, I'll try from below. Set, you know. Set. Are you quiet? See, this is the size and sight of the defect. This one, can you see? Mm. Yes, yes. Diamond, diamond. All patients who have history of trauma and develop meningitis should be, you know, carefully scrutinized. Thoroughly look for. Yes, yes. You know, there are a lot of cases reported. The post traumatic, even a perilent fistula, you know, led to meningitis. So now, I have this area of, you know, interest to be closed, this defect, okay? Yes, yes, yes. And I have a good access to close this defect as well. I have very good access now, diamond, it's a chotty. Pratish, where is the eustachian tube site? Eustachian tube is much below, madam, here. Here, the middle layer is here inferiorly, far below. See this here. Okay. Middle is here where my suction is. And this defect is there. See, in the tagman, ah. <clears throat> in the most anterior part where we expected above and lateral to the cochlea and anterior to it. And this is exactly where the defect is. So, sir, uh, many have this doubt that why have you kept the posterior wall intact? So, you can just give them the explanation. Posterior? What? The strut of the anterior. Why have you kept the, post the posterior cannot, yes, the bridge intact? Why have you left? Yeah, we'll reconstruct. We have to give him a grinder as well now. What I will do? We'll put a small graft here in this, you know. See this? TM graft and reconstruct this rest with the cartilage. This canal wall we have to reconstruct with the cartilage to segregate this area completely now. This is a different reconstruction. This is going to be for the CSF. Okay? Okay. And here we have to reconstruct the canal wall and the temporometal flap as well. Yes, yes. Okay. As usual, that is simple. We'll use a graft and uh, we'll put a cartilage like I had shown in the intact canal that day. Yes, yes.
So this, this area can be completely reconstructed. We have to just put a graph to see this. Hello? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, we will put a temporary facial graft here. Yes, sir. And a cartilage behind it over here. Here. Yes, yes. Okay. After bipolar. After closing the leak. You know? Leak is very high. High pressure leak is there. It's very high. Uh, yeah, the flow is good. You cannot say high pressure like this. CF has CSF is always under some pressure in the brain. Okay. Okay. So now I am going to repair this defect. Facial. Hmm. Guru facial. Cotton ball. You have already harvested the fat. Look for a fish of the gallo. You have a So like any CSF, any other CSF leak, we are going to seal it in multiple layers. Yes. Okay? This is yes. the end where the meningo seal was coming out. We have coagulated. Mm. And this is the end. Mm. The site is little tricky. No, this is too big. We'll use the fat facial glue. Uh, sir, please uh, orient uh, everyone where you're working once again because there are a few queries on that. Orientation? Yeah, which area exactly is the defect? At the anterior superior part of the attic. Okay. I've been persistently telling from the radiology about the area. Yes, 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 yes. So anterior, anterior and superior to the cochlea in the tegmen, you know. Let's hope that uh, comes in and. Uh... See this leak stopped? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much the loss is hearing loss is there? Essential loss is there? Profound. Then we could have gone for this uh, obliteration also. This uh... yeah, yeah. It's not a big defect to warrant that. Yes, sir. Cotton ball. So if there is holy. Marcy, after closing with the fat and the surgery cell, see completely. Stop. Can you see? Yes, yes, wonderful. Absolutely? Yeah, yeah, ultimate. Yes, sir. So, if there, is, if there is herniation of brain tissue, then how will you manage? Yeah, I would uh, excise that particular, first of all, the herniated mm -hmm. part. And if it is a bigger defect, then I would do a sort of, you know, structural reconstruction. Mostly, uh, what I was telling about the middle first approach, middle first approach is what mostly we do for the tegmen entry defects, back to lateral ones mostly. Suppose you have a one by one centimeter defect here, okay? Mm. I will make a 1.5 to 1.5 centimeter this bone graft, mm. okay? Mm. Bone graft from here, I will mm. thin out uh, because we don't need a thick one there. Mm -hmm. And then elevate after elevate the dura. After elevating this bone graph, there will be dura. 
then i would retake the dura from above to go above the defect mm. and from intercranial side i would place that bone graft okay that to prevent the brain falling down herniation yes herniation yes yes you can wrap in the fascia to prevent the leak and prevent brain herniation with the brain pulsations mm -hmm. that bone will be mm -hmm. kept in place between this bone below and the brain above mm -hmm. so that will yes, and we got the best technique yes we'll keep that case also sometime okay so okay. this is so easily controlled yeah a very unique case satish very nice <laughs> and you know yes. this poor man developed meningitis thrice mm. yes see that was the glue right fisha chota de aur kaat nahi socha tha chota kar and i will put a layer of fascia as well additional mm. Mm. are you Sir, can you show us the facial canal, the horizontal canal? It can be seen. Sir, canal लगा दे ना जरा, हाँ, काट ले जरा फेशा, हाँ, pardon? Sir, can you show us the facial canal? That is here behind. I will show you. Facial letter, I think. Looks like facial letter. Yes, yes. Too big. Other day. Yeah, facial canal. See the facial canal in the floor. So centralized. Could you see? Yes. 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 So nothing to do with that. Here is the lateral semicircular canal, right. and see yes. here the facial canal. Right. So after this, what we have to do a small work. I'll show you that day. My associate would put a cartilage from here to here, and a small graft, and this will, you know, this will be replaced like this, like this. So focus. So focus. That will be segregated. See this. Hmm. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. That is the simplest way. Now I am putting some fascia plus repositor gel form surgery cell. See this beyond the margins of perforation. Can you appreciate? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Very nice. Beyond everywhere. glue hey sir and now a little bit more glue to fix it so dr nvk mohan is asking will you use the lumbar drain in such cases no no not really traumatic no need and will you be blocking the eustachian tube opening no no why why the we have a good middle ear we are reconstructing the canal wall and the tympanic membrane to have a natural middle ear see now after the yeah. glue i pack with the gel form see everything closed completely yeah, i hope the picture is good there yeah it's okay yes sir very good you know the yeah, fat and uh, the surgical cell combination is hit now i think i think most of us <laughs> it's a wonderful i used in one or two cases wonderful thing so this was all about i uh, usin so, uh, cartilage graft laga dena so uh, the cartilage and graft will be placed by my associate and we move on to the another case so we are quickly now three cases in one and a half hours less than that Satish, do you do you keep this patient on diamox or something? Hello. Yes, yes, I think. Oh. 
Hello, Sati sir. So, what about post op? What will you? Uh, uh, what is? What will be your post op management for this case? Like any ear surgery, but traditionally we'll add on uh, Dymox. Okay. Okay. So now three quick cases left. Yes. We have already done probably eight eight cases, I think. Yes, sir. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Anyway, this one. See, this is a child. This Game boy, is a, how old is the child? This is Master Hitesh, probably seven years or so. The age is not written here. Uh, it is, I know, it's a small child, seven years. You know, his initial picture, see this? Right. Huge. Yes, huge. Expand soil, heterogeneous density, mass lesion. A lot of polyps coming out, cannot be anything else than AFRS. See the expansion. Guru? Hydrolibride. So, this is heterogeneous density, see within the sinuses. Then we have a soft tissue window. See on soft tissue window. Yes. These heterogeneous densities. Mm. See that? Right. This is yes. typical of fungus. Now coming from anterior to posterior, I am not going details of radiology, we have already discussed. That's the frontal sinus. Mm. See this erosion of the intersinus sept and all the way filling up both sides of the sinuses. Mm. So this, it has to be thoroughly washed, 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 washed. That's it. Mm. Then completely expensile, you know, pushing the lamina papracia, mm. pushing the nasal septum like up to the lateral wall opposite side. You can see. Mm. Yes. Everything, all fungus. That's it. Mm. Nothing else than fungus everywhere. Hmm. Huge. And but hmm. thankfully the sphenoid is spared. Only thing the hmm. this side is sphenoid is a small one with some opacity hmm. and doesn't look like a fungus within. That is because of the blockage of the sphenoid model recess. Secretions, hmm. yeah. Hmm. It looks like. Hmm. So and uh, we can always reconstruct in uh, you know. All three planes, and you can, if you want to see. You can see all three planes. Right. Mm -hmm. That is the region of the lamina papracia. You can see yes, all yes, the way. Yes. That's the region of the frontal sinus. All the way, completely gone. And you know, you know this is hyper osteosis of the bone all around. This is classical in fungus. Many a times you will find. So quickly, the next case is uh, I am getting the dankers. Then already we have seen dankers. Several times now. Many, many times. Yeah. Many times. So no need to, you know, we can spare some time mm. uh, without showing the dankers. Then seven-year-old boy, how, what are the possibility uh, causes of this uh, allergic anything? Because at so early age. What is the reason for? This uh, AFRS at this early age. This is reaction. This is type 1 hypersensitivity to the fungus. Yes. This patient inhaled the fungal antigen, which is ubiquitous in the air, you know. Yes. And because of its hypersensitivity, the eosinophilic reaction body you know, reacts to the fungus. And this is how it has led to this kind of phenomena. This is mm. so now the goal is remove everything and give access mm. to the steroid because this is reaction for which is steroid is the answer. Mm. After removal mm. of the antigen, we'll give topical steroid, no need of oral even later on. It's a straightforward mm. situation. Mm. Really? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It has to be in regular follow for a long time, many years, many years. Mm 
ma'am vedha uh, madam and deepak we go to the earlier stage you have done fast in this like afrs case for arfs yeah afrs 6 year old in uh, medical college okay okay i did uh, about 12 years of age because these and are i have got this surgery Hello? was done three four times so this yes, sir yes. yes sir so what about the frozen section of your vagal schwannoma case no we didn't get the frozen section in vagal schwannoma we got in parotid oh, uh, parotid yes sir what about the uh, frozen section same low grade yeah. mucoepidermoid okay vagal schwannoma no need of frozen no 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 not frozen so now we are all set for this uh, AFRS quickly and the meantime, mm. in the other theater, the dankers would be done. Mm. I will go directly onto the tumor. That's mm. not a extensive one, and will be good for the beginners to see. Mm. And once they start taking up the smaller tumors and doing dankers more often, they can tackle the big one as well because it is all the dankers which matters. That's it. Mm. Nothing mm. else. Exposure. Mm. So then, after yeah. the dankers, we'll finish up in ten fifteen minutes. maximum and mean time the parotid flap will open up and then will be the last case okay so sir in this case uh, did you give uh, pre operative uh, antifungals as you had advised that you usually Not give really. operative antifungals or afrs we have already discussed several times this is non invasive fungus and there is no role of antifungals as such yes completely yes, only ek jana ko bola no role of antifungal at all are you getting the picture yes yes See, yes sir the polypus is fungus yes now is the test for your suction yes high pressure suction no <laughs> suction ko the brider see the suction we have pachari boss yes yes i have traveled worldwide to the best of the centers and the the thing which i am always disappointed at most of the places the suction suction yes yes see here ours is a very very high power suction here yeah look please tell us about suction which company and what no, this is um, we got you know developed this is tailor made okay. and we have i uh, generally i advise those who are using micro divider and all to use at least one horse power suction for the longevity of the longevity of your machine micro divider longevity yeah. of your blades yes yes so it it improves your timing so in such lesions if your suction doesn't work you get frustrated yes sir see the power of the suction ultimate the suction the suction and tract that's why wherever i go i first thing i ask about the suction and same thing i have seen in agra as well at boss's place there were high power suction there uh, we keep three four suction connected see this cheesy material you know clogs the suction very often still this suction is not getting blocked See the blade. We yeah, are ultimate. See the so far the only instrument working is the micro divider. Hold on. What will do for this? This septum is diverted toward left side. So what you will do for this septum? Pardon? Because of this uh, polyposis, the septum is totally deviated to one side. 
So I will we'll do cytoplasty. Obviously, we'll definitely do cytoplasty. Otherwise, you know, see this opposite nose. Yeah, totally, totally block. Now then, we will complain of the obstruction. He will not be happy. Find out, sir. Practice. Done. No, the bridal. Not now. See all this CG material. Yes, yes. That is all about this case. उन्हें डंक कर चालू कर दिया करें। See, right now I am just removing the bulk of the lesion, you know, quickly, as quick as possible. Now see this. You see see how the lateral wall is pushed. Yes, yes. This is lateral wall. See this. Good. This is lateral wall. Lateral wall of nodes. Ah, lateral wall nodes means. I mean medial maxillary wall. Yes, yeah, sinus medial wall. Which is pushed by which is pushed by the lesion, and it is giving rise to this nasal blockage. Dal point dal yar. See, still the airway is not opened up. Yeah, it's still a lot of tissue is there. Yeah. See the continuous irrigation. We have already discussed these all these things in first webinar, but again I will ask: uh, Will you go for all allergy tests in this case, this child allergy test, or what in, uh, investigation would you prefer for the further management? See now the nasal pharynx behind. Yes. Yes, yes sir. See why I was saying the lateral wall push. See this. Yes. This is septum, and see how the lateral wall is pushed by the mass lesion. Yeah. Mass effect. Mm. See where to see kind of a thing. Mm. So, sir, have you uh, uh, done the serum eosinophilic count in this patient? Yeah, high, huge, huge, twenty-six hundred something. Okay. See, this turbinate collapsed. The inferior turbinate. Because of the Push of the fungal mass from inside the maxillary sinus. See this turbinate collapsed. Yeah. See this. Yes. This four mm endoscope, two point seven endoscope. Pardon? This end is two point seven mm endoscope or four mm? Four mm. Three days before we did a DCR in a five-month-old child. That too with a four mm. Four mm. See, I have to remove the part of the turbinate as well. Irrigation, irrigation. Partial gag. This maxillary sinus is widened like anything, and we have to really remove the fungus completely from the maxillary and give it a huge opening. It will be like a medial maxillectomy. Yes. 
we have seen how big the maxillary sinus was. The entire floor, the medial wall of the maxillary sinus is gone. Suction. चालू कर दिया सी नाउ द नेजो फेरिंग इन व्यू बिहाइंड I think without good suction, you cannot do this case so fast. Yeah, without a powerful suction, is a uh, can't think of. It will take hours and hours. Suction should not get clogged, blocked, and that is the principle of micro divider. It should be. Backed by a high power section. You know. And see, this is all maxillary sinus now. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. What I was removing until now was the medial wall. Yes. जो सेक्शन कर सेक्शन लगा सी यू कैन फ्लैश 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 एंड रिमूव दिस यस रे ना वो जेक्यूरेट पकड़ आई विल मोबिलाइज दिस फंगस मोर See, this is pure non-invasive fungus. Yes, yes. It doesn't invade the mucosa. Had this been a case of invasive fungus, it would not have been so extensively occupying the sinuses. Yes, yes. there would be minimal intrasinus component and maximum extrasinus and for them surgery is not the first line treatment yes obviously you need a tissue to prove it fungus to culture so you can give medical treatment and for them medical treatment is the answer antifungals In this case, you have to teach the child to do nasal brushing every day, regularly, and everything. More so, family also. See the huge maxillary sinus. Yeah. yeah. So, Dr. Nityananda from Kanhagad is asking that will this patient develop atrophic rhinitis post-operatively? What? No. What? Will this patient develop atrophic rhinitis post-operatively? Not really. No. It's all mucosa lined space. Yes. See, we are not removing the mucosa. Yes. And for that, I would use the term suction record excessive dryness. 
you know atrophic rhinitis is an immune complex disease You could imagine from the CT scan how big the fungal mass was. Yes, yes. And here, the man of the match is my suction. Yes, that's true. Very true. The rest is hardly anything. Look, look, look. Believe me, in the biggest of the hospitals, mm. they will not invest in the section, good section. Central section is of no use and the... See this? It's pure beauty of the section. Yes, sir. Curve divider. Maxillary is out now completely. I will check with a 70 degree. I will watch more. The majority is out. Find out. See the maxillary sinus now? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, now we see something. Wash. I will see later with a 70 degree. Not now. Looks clear now. Now the rest of the part is not much. It's more than the frontal. Like the bride, the bride, the bride. Sit. Move the leader. See the ethmoids? Yes. I have already, you know, cleared in the beginning. Mm. And you have to be careful laterally about the orbit. Yes, yes. Because mm. the lamina is partially mm. gone. Yes. In children, lamina is more prone to get breached. Okay. In children, Lemonade is more prone to get breach yeah, as yeah. compared to children. All septation, not only lamina. Look, look. See the ethmoid cavity along the lamina? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. See, we have to 
preserve the mucosa maximum. We are not supposed to remove the mucosa at all. Now, this is the post-ethmoid. Uh, sir, any proptosis or vision loss? Dr. Riaz is asking from Pakistan. Yes. What? Is is there any proptosis or vision loss? Yeah, yeah, it's a mild proptosis, not vision loss. Not significant. That is because of the pressure. Okay. So, sir, while you're operating, uh, though you have uh, discussed it, quite several times about the post-operative management. You can just tell us in brief, sir, again, once again, many are uh, requesting uh, to... I didn't get your question, Paramita. Sir, the post-operative, the post-operative management to avoid crusting, uh, what will you do when you're operating? You can Irrigation, just, uh, douching, douching, douching. Okay. Uh, anything about... Um, uh, what irrigation, sir? Budana side. Ringer lactate and budonocyte. Yes. Budonocyte mixed in ringer lactate of saline. One less cool and four hundred ml. Yes. Now ethmoids are getting cleared out. Yes. Hold yes. on. Everywhere is fungus. Yes, yes, full of. There is a hydro repair now. Now it will. Dal pad. Look, when you look, you can see it. That is the skull base behind. Yeah. The wall skull base behind. That's the superior turbinate. Yes, remnant. The brighter. Maybe the area of uh, artery. Yeah. Yeah, see now my skull base is cleared in this region. Yes, yes. And now I will take the superior turbinate here to open up the small sphenoid. Right. Yes, yes. We saw yes. this patient that a very small sphenoid mm. and that is here. See there behind. See it. This patient has a very small sphenoid sinus. On this side, yes, the brighter. Oh, wash now, washing away everything, reorient, and we'll show you the sphenoid now properly. 
My sphenoid is here. I could see the glimpse of it. See this? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. But we'll show you properly. The man of the magic section. Yes, it is true. That is a sphenoid. Very small, very small. So how much septum how uh, what will the septum last in this case? How much septum you will take it out or no, we will not take out, we will not we'll just correct. Little bit just of the cartilage you may have to. Why to take out? I just uh, correct, just take it out and correct it. Limited septular Yeah, this is because of this pathology. Yes. Sir. Yes. So now the last part of the ethmoidal work, and then finally we'll go with seventy up. Counter. So far, I didn't change the scope and did the entire work with a zero. See that? Right. Yeah. Very clear. Not much is required here to be done now. See, all these bony spicules should be taken care of from the healing point of view. Catch you. Hmm. Yes. See this part is done? Yes. That's the ethmoidal artery. Yeah. You may find anything decent in such a case. But there is already so much of bone expansion and all. Suppose you get a, a large adenoid at this level, would you uh, take it out mm -hmm. right now? Yeah, better to address. Yes. Why not? Mm -hmm. Is a seven year child right it age was, for that? Luckily, it was not, but sometimes we, we may get it. Yeah. Now, I finally, after doing this, will go toward the frontal sinus. And next five, ten minutes will be through. Or already the denker is done on that side and next 15 minutes will be through to the angiofibroma as well. So now with the 70 degree, first we'll see yeah. the maxillary. Give me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, wash it. Yes, over there, yeah. So, Dr. Riaz from Pakistan is saying that suction is the man of the match, but Sati sir is the man of the series. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Riaz from Pakistan is very sincere. He is uh, he has very been, all of the webinars and this. He is the biggest of the Corona warrior. Yeah, he was. In, in his duties, he developed the COVID 19 infection. Hmm. And by God's grace now, has recovered, but even during that COVID period, when he had infection, he used to watch our webinars. Yeah. So, what is the reliable landmarks uh, landmark in this kind of cases? In this yeah, situation? the disease itself is the landmark. Disease okay. is taking you all the way. Okay. 
it has expanded everything all sinuses okay. see this yes. see this i am with a yes. 70 degree now yes wherever the disease going you have to follow it has destroyed all landmarks yes such cases you don't have to apply your brain much for the landmarks just follow the disease obviously for the critical ones the skull base and all you have to be careful see now and now i am going in the frontal see yes i am widening the opening before entering not in hurry of entering the frontal see now the last part of the surgery yes yes this is your frontal and this is already expanded by the fungus disease yes fungus such patients we give at least 2 to 3 weeks of oral steroid in tapering doses yes sir and uh, topical from the day we remove the pack yes three weeks of uh, oral steroid and any pre operative steroid sir yes yes that so, is must So, Doctor T K Hazra from Calcutta wants to know what doses do you give, sir? Pre-operative steroid for this Pre child, especially. Pre-operative steroid, same uh, one milligram kg full dose. Pre-operative okay. steroid, you know, will improve the surgical conditions, will decrease the disease burden by reducing the inflammation and eosinophilia. See this? Yeah. Going to the opposite side from here. No intersinus septum. Right. Yeah, Now the last part is left. Okay, get it? This one. Oh, sir, medial maxillectomy, inferior tobinectomy will affect the facial development in a seven-year-old child till his adolescence. Not really. There are a lot okay. of studies done. It doesn't affect. See this? Okay. Fungus coming from the opposite side. See this? Yes. Yes. See with a seventy degree. Some more. Yes. Right. See this? Oh my God, it's terrible. <laughs> this is I am removing from the opposite sinus. Look, look, look. Now, now it's through a little bit. It's still there. Need to wash it more. Yes. पतला दे वही वाला दे सक्षम लगा। See that one fungal material mass lesion is still there. Give it a 
इसके लगा के देवाइज विल यूज द हाइड्रो डिब्राइडर सी इट इज टक देयर बड़ी वाली सी द मोस्ट इन एक्सेसिबल एरिया यस out little bit more you do know see this is my 120 degree blade and all could you see reach right there hello Yeah, yeah. This is one hundred and twenty blade. Okay. Right into the lateral part of the frontal sinus of the opposite side. See yes, that? Yes, 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 yes. Completely out. Now. Yes, Use a hydrogen pedal. No need. People want to see. It was ready. It needed. It was ready. See now, there is no bleeding. Yes. We will wash with the saline. We will wash with the Dexona. Yes. That the steroid. Yes. And then pack with the Dexona impregnated packs. Yes. For two days. Mm. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes sir. Yes. Amazing. That's sir. That's it. Very nice. Thank you. Very nice, sir. And Very. the next case is ready. The dankers is already done. That the Again, a 15 minutes case that is JNA, mm. and I will take you to the, uh, you know, the connector mm. to the imaging. Yeah, I am. Yes, sir. So, sir, yeah. more than 5,000 viewers are watching you right now, and just to announce, we have completed almost more than uh, 120 hours of uh, uh, webinar till now. Yes, sir. Oh really? Wow. One twenty hours. Yes, of live surgical demonstration. Marathon. Marathon. See, Marathon. see this tumor. This is world record. Tumors. This is for the beginners. The tumor in the nasal cavity, little bit going. See in the terebellatine fossa. Yeah. Yes. Why I am saying for the beginners mm. because they are not supposed to compromise with the access. Yes, I can do such lesions, you know, with now, without much struggling with the endonasal root only, without doing a denture even, not going far off. But if some beginner who is doing with this and not having a control over the vessel over here, can be a disaster. And if the bleeding starts, be disappointed. So best is see this denture with minimal extension over here. We can remove it. So in next ten minutes time, we'll remove this. Okay? Yes. So that's a very interesting. I would suggest the beginners to start with the less extensive cases. Once you get used to denker, you can do any given extension. So first thing is uh, get used to denkers. Good evening, sir. This is Rajat Jain here. Yes, Rajat. How are you, dear? All fine, sir. So this, these are cases for people like us. Pardon? These are the cases for people like us. Your voice is breaking, man. Now these these are the cases like for people like him. Maybe he is the skill based surgeon doing wonderful. So it is not for you. It is for more junior people. <laughs> That's why. That's why I purposely kept in the end. We have But shown the extensive is... case in the beginning in the morning. and this i kept in the end to show that you can do it easily and that will give you confidence and once you know the dankers we have seen so many jnas now we have shown any given so with this kind of extension are we supposed to do with dankers or can we just do a wide angle without, without dankers as well i can do it without yeah. dankers as well but you for may have to struggle a little bit at the posterior end 
but once you have a cobulator there is never a problem the thing is we are supposed to go in the pterygopalatine fossa at the lateral end over here right. yes catch the vessel and push it down that's it that's the only role uh, yes, we sir, have yes. and if i see in the coronal see this lesion so you yes, have sir. to struggle without dankers you know because yes. vascular tumor the vessel slips yes. see this Yeah. This is the pterygopalatine fossa extension. Right. Yes. And this is like the previous case, uh, pushing into the sphenoid. Sphenoid, right? Yeah. The floor of the sphenoid is also eroded, sir. And this is the you know, uh, you know the pterygoid, which is yeah. eroded. Mm -hmm. So once the pterygoid eroded, going in the pterygopalatine fossa, little bit sphenoid, in the nasopharynx, why to take a chance with the exposure? very true yes see it will come very fast so i am going to do this and the last will be a superficial parotidectomy for benign we have seen for the we have shown the uh, you know the extensive lesions earlier the jna parotid so those who cannot sustain for long cannot watch at least they have seen the major part this is for the junior colleagues who really want to see the smaller cases they can continue so last will be the adenoma and in the last case i had shown the importance of the flap in parotid the most important is the incision of flap raising all complications are related to that part maximum except the facial now and the rest is the facial now which i am going to show you so in the last case the flap will be automatically i you know i'll get Very it raised and i will go directly to the facial to show you again the convergent approach so again i'll take 10 minutes for the last case so now from on now Uh, we have half an hour to finish up these two cases okay sir so recently one of my juniors did uh, parotid by your convergent approach sir. hello uh, recently my junior he did uh, parotid from your convergent approach and he was very happy about it the yaar Go Moshka, Moshka, Moshka. We will clean it. Don't do. Yes, boss. Uh, anything? Any questions? In couple of minutes, I'll be back with the endoscopic picture. So I was just telling sir, one of my juniors did a parotid by the convergent approach, and he was very happy about it. Oh, great! That is, I believe, is the simplest, like, simplest of the approach. Ah, uh, you know, simplest of the approach for this, like. There was one question by some. Uh, Is there possibility of self regression of angiofibroma at any time? Pardon? Is there any possibility of self regression of angiofibroma after the age of twenty, twenty-five years? Not really. I don't think. I have, uh, you know, done one angiofibroma. It was a forty-eight male, and that was at N V K Mohan's place. N V K Mohan was there uh, sometime back with the coach in Kolkata in a workshop. Hmm. that patient on uh, 25 or 30 year back angiofibroma surgery and he presented with a recurrence massive recurrence the cavernous sinus involvement this that every possible area was involved and was too vascular i don't think it at a time Umar, my goal is will straight away go to pterygopalatine fossa, dissect the do a inferior ethmoidectomy, ethmoidectomy, tie into the and will dissect. The denker is done. The rest of the time, uh, we are going to take is going to be less. 
Βλέπω τώρα. So we are going to start soon. Sir, what is the size of the vessel which you uh, take control by using cobblation? It is breaking. Boss, what is he asking? Uh, till what size of the sphenopalatine do you use cobblation and after that you use starting clips? Still, I didn't get the question. Your voice in, day in daytime, you uh, miscobulate the vessel, then you clipped it. Any advantage? Yeah, to minimize the blood supply to the tumor, obviously. I know that is not a foolproof vessel. So, uh, you know, cobulated the vessel, pressed it, the bleeding was minimized. And when the lateral component was being removed, the vessel was obviously in front of us. You can easily clip it. Yeah, can... These are variations, you know, according to the situation, you can take a call. So, till date, we have done, I think, almost eight or nine vascular tumors in head and neck. I think nobody, no case has been, uh, you can say, embolized, all without embolization, all the cases. So, none of the cases in the webinar. Yeah, we know the cases, all glomus, jugular, whatever, acoustic neuroma, all unembolized, angiofibroma, and all non embolized, and no transfusion required so far. Good, touch wood. Yeah. Touch wood. Yes, <laughs> we have tested it. That is a plus point. That's a good point. Bless you. Hmm. Tell us again. Next week we have we can have that neuroblastoma case, olfactory neuroblastoma. Yeah, we will have pituitary, olfactory neuroblastoma, something uh, skull base. That is yeah. like we had a lateral skull base day. We'll keep like endoscopic skull base day. That patient is up to you. up to you. Tomorrow he will meet you. Light come, Karna. Come, Karna, light. Light come, kar. Come, kar. So there have been many messages from many doctors who are saying that they've started using the conversion me the conversion method oh, really if yes, they, i would like to have their feedback is it really you all the good points should have followed yeah i told dr satish yesterday i did all three implants yesterday with uh, inferior cochlear to me uh, that was good to know he did inferior cochlear to me uh, yes, the Pachori boss yesterday he did three implants and All for right. the first time he did an inferior calculus. Now see, are you getting the picture? Yeah, wonderful. wonderful. Yes, sir. sir. Perfect. See, now what has been done? This is our... Uh, see our team. How nicely the yes, anchor yes. has been done. Wonderful. Yes, wonderful. Sir. And yeah. see, this is the navel acrimal duct. You can see. Yes, yes. sir. Yes. Perfect. And this is the tumor there. And this yes, is the cabinet. Yes. yes. So now, so sir, for any given lesion, do you do uh, modified dankers? Most of the time. Uh, this is fortunately we got this patient at this stage. Generally, we don't get so early. But even for this patient, there are indications for dankers, and I will suggest. Uh, the people, uh, you know, who are starting angiofibroma surgery to do such cases with dankers, they will give them more confidence to get used to dankers. You can avoid problems with uh, less exposure. Once you get experience, you can do without dankers even. Okay, sir. Hmm? Right
maybe i happen to enter the tumor somewhere see this yes sir yes sir just to expose the tumor more and more just for your to show you this is the terminate below now see the posterior wall yeah yeah thick so you will be drilling it sir to take control pardon you will be drilling the posterior wall of the maxilla to uh, get yeah, the control uh, of yeah obviously body. obviously the yes. tumor is a supply coming from the internal maxillary only yes sir oh, didn't i show you the ct angiogram sorry no in this case I will show. Then, yar, choti chota gudi la. Chota gudi la na. See, this is the posterior wall there. This posterior wall of the maxilla. Yes. And Or it will thin out. Yeah, you can flake out most of the time this bone. So so usually, you it. use kerosene here. Uh, some this time you are using a uh, different yeah. instrument yeah yeah you can use anything boss actually we are so much in routine to see kerosen work by you so other instruments doesn't suit our eyes yes one day hmm? so uh, for the sake of everyone can you just tell uh, layer by layer what you get first after the posterior wall of the maxilla then what you encounter and then how to trace uh, the vessel properly this case is not a big problem though what you are asking we have been always been telling and discussed several times that once yes, you remove the bone you will have the periosteum coming and then after the periosteum the vessel coming Everything in order. We have discussed, but this case. Watch. 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 एरिया Yes, thick bone. Yeah, you can remove more precisely the carison as well. You're right. Yes. Carison works perfectly in your hand, sir. Yeah, carison is the one of the best tools. Yeah. section the grader wash sit now i have to jaldi se wash sir uh, this time when you were doing afrs you didn't use that jet thing which you had this time i didn't use sir you once showed uh, one jet kind of thing which you used to put in the frontal and then used to take out all the muck from the frontal i did have had a rebatter that makes your life so easy that makes your life so easy yeah that is hydro debrider i mentioned several times see the suction was so good 
then feel like using the hydro debride at any point of time yes sir now this is the turbo pipeline force here sickle give me a sickle i i will open it give the carison there thoda widen a little bit carry yes sir mangni padti so many are requesting uh, your email id so i'll just uh, say it is uh, jain satish3 at gmail.com yes yes e numeric 3 at gmail yeah numeric 3 j jain so this is what exactly you were telling yeah it is yes yeah. sir yes sir this is more safe and more, i think yeah it is an amazing tool we are used to see it like this see the same thing can be done by various ways i am more and more you know widening this profile more and more we expose and better we have the control yes coordinator sikal so this is the periosteum with so many prominent vessels Now I am opening the periosteum. Yes, sir. And you know, just behind the periosteum, it is fat. See this? Yeah, yes, yeah. sir. And in the anterior part of the fat plane, we have the vessel. Yes. I will show you. Uh, so, for the sake of everyone, can you just tell once there is a tumor in the yes, tumor line fossa and infratemporal fossa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. We can see that. Yes, sir. See the vessel. So, once if there is a tumor in the tergoverdan fossa, then what is the usual displacement of the vessel, sir? It is displaced more and more anteriorly. Bigger the tumor, more anteriorly it is displaced because the tumor is coming from behind. and okay. that is the advantage of endoscopic approach yes sir this because this vessel lies in the most anterior part of the compartment yes and sir so the tumor comes from the end see the vessel yes sir we can see that perfect beautiful in the morning that that case there was lot of tumor in the maxillary sinus so it was creating problem that makes your life difficult Yes, yes. So, if somebody doesn't have a clip facility at his house, so what all the measures are like we can take control other than uh, coblation? See, I am going to use a clip. Simple. So, supposing somebody doesn't have a clip, then. If you don't have a clip, then you can use a bipolar, monopolar. See uh, which company is, clip do you use, sir? This is Carl Stones. I call them. I call them one more. See, this is Carl Stones. And from the Carl Stones. Sir, team, uh, what's the cost of these clips? Clip cost is you know the applicator and the clip. Hata. Uh, yes. There are thirty-six clips. With this applicator, cost uh, you know something like two lakhs. But see how amazing it is. Who is? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Perfect, sir. We have. It holds. It holds so well. Both the clips. 
you can use the caloric clip as well okay yeah uh, for 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 start for people who are starter i mean that is a good option you know i have divided the vessel yes sir can you see yes yes sir yes sir yes sir with so much of ease after clipping it that is a beauty the sense of security you get after clipping is amazing yes a great yes now the last part good now i will remove this turbinate going to the thermoid go behind and quickly remove this my most important job is done that is taking the vessel in control yes sir now this turbinate i am taking out so in usually all in all the glasses uh, you trim down half of the remnant trim down Uh, yes, usually sir. you take down half of the debris yes, in all the yeah, cases yeah, yeah i keep the upper stump intact yes sir that is not a uh, something which is bothering us here and yes, here it is important yes, to you know go about the tumor how will you go about the tumor otherwise yes sir it gives us more area to work around see now i will quickly do this Lower it more like to me now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. To ensure that no tumor is there in the tumor series. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So vascular clip, which uh, which company services? Calsos, Calsos. This clip is little costly, but it is so you know reliable. We don't compromise with the instruments. at any point of time if something is good you have to respect it and in jna imagine post operatively if your vessel happens to open what is going to be the scene how can you take a chance yes sir yes sir lock of letter cover letter and watch See now the tumor. Yes. Wash करता रहना थोड़ा थोड़ा क्या करता तू? See this tumor attached to the septum there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now the thymus is pretty clear. What I will do now? Hmm. This is the region of the. Hmm. Imagine the situation without the dankers. You could have been, you know, struggling a lot. Yes, sir. yes. Yes. Once you are dealing with a vascular tumor like this, why do so, you say you have stopped? You have stopped embolization at all? Adam, have you stopped doing embolization? Almost in selected cases, you know. when i have multiple vessels supplying the tumor vessel coming from behind wash 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 of uh, what are the what's your protocol in the recurrent cases sir do you embolize or not recurrent are more difficult you know yes sir in recurrent the vascularity is always aberrant because the previous surgeon must have you know Uh, ligated or closed the internal maxillary, and now the aberrant vessel coming up to supply are more difficult to handle. Yes, sir. Revision surgery for anything is always difficult for that matter. Yes. Okay. Now see this tumor. This was the attachment to the septum. Right. And see yes, here. Sir. That is the sphenoid. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
सर डॉक्टर सत्यप्रकाश दुबे सर इज आस्किंग रोल ऑफ स्टिलबेस्ट्रॉल इन द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ जेन रोल स्टिलबेस्ट स्टिलबेस्ट्रॉल द इस्ट्रोजन यस हार्मोनल थेरेपी में टेस्टोस्टेरोन इनहिबिटर और इस्ट्रोजन ऑल दीज हैव बीन यूज्ड and you can use them to buy the time to reduce the tumor or whatsoever in post pubertal patients you know they are supposed to contain all these receptors into the tumor not pre pubertal yes they are separated from the septum here right yes this is a sphenoid this is the mucosa inside which i am removing yes sir and see the sphenoid sinus here yes sir nicely so that's the superior control yeah i, I will remove the the wall of the sphenoid as well here because yes. some of the tumor some yeah. of the tumor was riding yeah they, we oh, could see that in the ct scan yeah i i that's what i'm showing Now yes, see to yes, the yes. floor of the sphenoid. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes. Sir. See this? Right. This is towards the floor. Now see the interior of the sphenoid. So in this. Yes, sir. Yes. So in this case, will you be doing the posterior septotomy, sir? <laughs> Let me try without that. Okay. Sir. That I can combine any point of time. Retract the risk. Put out. Put out. Put out. Put out. So, sir, uh, this uh, part of the tumor. Have you? Uh, Hello. Yes, yes, sir. We can. We can hear you, Satish. Yeah, this part of the tumor. Right. I am separating in the subperiosteal plane. You can see now. Right. Yes, sir. and this is the little bit of the tumor which is riding into the sphenoid let me show you see i have left a little bit of the tumor here in the uh, as usual i i told you we take all the you know the steroid tumor in the end okay yes sir now see the sphenoid and this was the component sir sir this one square inch always is a trouble yeah now this is going to be out soon what definitely i am doing uh la 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 salva salva sir not i think there's a sino branch of sino bertine that is bleeding yeah 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 what up no now see i am not remove the part of the septum now you can imagine the struggle removing the septum makes your life so easy this is the part yes. i should for you several times now you are not removing yes sir so you may have some struggle here body dal le you know pani dal endoscope pe Three tumor taken down in the superiorial plane, right? And this is yes, how sir. it can be pushed below. Yeah, these are superiorial attachment, you know. So these usually are, these are difficult to take down. Sometimes they are highly adhered. The coblator, coblator helps you. What I am cutting is cutting through the periosteum. So at this time you are using ablation. Yes. When you are supposed to cut, you are supposed to use the ablation. Ablation. And now, lastly, this periosteal attachment, you know, in the sphenoid or in the nasal pharynx.
down 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 yes sir wow great a little bit of this periosteal attachment you know simple so this free yes sir i can remove it easily and then we'll concentrate only on one part here in the telvoid yes yes that is a very important yes. area and will be true see the dankers gives you opportunity for the proper instrumentation see now yes, i am putting this so that it doesn't jump up back when we remove from inside yes sir cool and now simply i am removing from the video that was the tumor see this yes yes good wonderful yes yes Yes. And now, great. back wash. So, wash, which wash. which instrument did you use to pull up the uh, soft pallet? Uh, that was a pillar retractor we used to retract the soft pallet. Tensile yes. pillar retractor. Okay. See this? Give me the brother. This. Yes, sometimes the remnant of uh, this uh, in. in fear tabinet if you get a ct then ct contrast post operatively it is an answer and they write it as residual tumor <laughs> oh my god back now on the adenoid surface we will give um, you know there is no tumor attachment never what you can use if you have abraded somewhere you can use the cautery later or the coblator later on now the most important area is this pterygoid pterygoid because you have to drill it that is there is there is personality is also clear yes sir so there is a lot of fear among people like how deep can we drill into pterygoids right you can remove the pterygoid completely You can remove the existence of the pterygoid. It's not a bad. It's a safe place. Not very easy. You can. You can because, remove uh, the existence of the pterygoid thoroughly. Wash. So this is our vessel. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this is the. I have to thoroughly clean this area. Give me the carburetor and the drill. Sir, do you also send samples for virion uh, artery or nerve? What? Sir, do you uh, like? I look at us send samples for median canal do you also send samples for median canal we always assess the median canal by default and i will i have shown in the afternoon in the previous case how the median canal see now yes sir. this above uh, chuna this here is the now above which i am going to see the above now yes Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is V2. Yes, sir. This is interval. And that is the median artery, you know. Yeah. That is the median canal here. Let me show you. See here. That is the median canal, which I am going yes, to yes, sir. completely drill off. 
rest of the tumor is out yeah. and this part of the pterygoid is so good see that yes sir so yes sir great give me the drill so you recommend drilling in all the cases whether it is available always always, always. this is the common site you know residual tumor yes yes this yes and sir usually we have seen like we have got few references that uh, surgery was done now the recurrence yes, is there in the pterygoid region and it has gone uh, towards the greater ring of the sinoid your half of the voice is not understandable it is breaking maybe because yeah, there of the is internet some internet, internet issue yes yeah. so internet have to miss put off your video then uh, the Uh, sir, there are like few cases I have seen. Sir, this is the pterygoid like, muscle below. Yes, sir. I am coagulating everything. Yes. Uh, sir, can you hear me? Well, it is hard. Oh. Yes, yes. Uh, See, sir, I have removed everything. I did not get pterygoid. Let me. Then a little bit of the baby is still no idea. This, you know, the you can't take a chance over here. That is the region of the carotid canal. See this? Yes. yes. Which I have coagulated. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. This part of the anterior wall of the floor section under. That is the cancellous bone of the sphenoid. Yes, sir. See this, and that's the final picture. Uh, sir, uh, can you just throw light in something? Are there? Sir, uh, there is there. Uh, we just op we just got a case which was previously operated. and now there was recurrence in the pterygoid region and the tumor was going towards the greater ring of the sphenoid well, that is the common site man so like that is not recurrence uh, the, first yes. of all that is not recurrence that is a residual tumor which is yes 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 from, yes that is a, yes see this is the sphenoid and in the floor yes, see sir. the median canal See this? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes sir. Yes. Which I have coagulated completely. Yes, sir. The floor of the sphenoid. That is the sphenoid. This is the pterygoid process. I have completely drilled off. You can see. Yes, My sir. V two is above, and this is the clipped vessel. See this vessel? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Two clips. Yes. See now the pterygoid process. Oh. Absolutely cleaned up. Which are you doing? Yes, absolutely. No question of leaving any disease behind there. Perfect. Perfect. This is how you know, spend five minutes extra to the steroids and see this. This bone of the cancellous bone of the steroids. Here also sometimes the tumor enters. See this? Now yes, completely yes. cleared off. Wash the dump it. Mama, mama. Look at this. Only like a girl. Hello. Yes, sir. Mama, mama. No, that is mama. Don't touch that. Mama, mama, don't touch that. What is it? Can you show me the final picture? Can you? No, no, it's clear. Yes, sir. Very clear. Someone has someone says someone's voice is coming. I think someone has to yeah, mute. Yeah, who is there? See, the most important thing is drilling this bone of the pterygoid. Pterygoid, yes. And sir. the cancellous bone of the sphenoid. See yes. the interior of the sphenoid very clear. Yes, are, very clear. These are the two clips on the vessel. The tumor are not going laterally over there. And this is V two. See inside. That is V two here. Right. Yes. This one not disturbed at all. Yes. And the, the tumor is completely removed. Yes. And we had some uh, 
you know, I coordinated some uh, areas of the periosteum in the major pharyngeal root. Mm. That is clear. And see the adenoid surface. Mm. It is always innocent. It doesn't give rise to any attachment. See this? Yes, yes. Wonderful. Yes. In the periosteum, yes. that's why I specifically drill this sphenoid cancellous bone over here. Mm. That is the site of, you know, sometimes the disease in the bone marrow and this median canal and this terrible process. Yes. All are absolutely clear. Okay? Perfect, yes, sir. perfect. And now the last case, which we have already raised the flag. Yes, yes, yes. Chaudhary ko bhoha thana? Thana ga? Lai bota. Kun jay karayya? Hello. Thank you, sir. Chaudhary. Chaudhary. Hello? Yes, sir. The yes, next five yes, minutes, sir. we are going to start this. There's a uh, two and a half centimeter to three centimeter size pleomorphic adenoma. Yeah. And uh, the thing to be shown again, we have shown that earlier also a couple of times, is the convergent approach. That's the only thing. Yes, this is sir. not a big case. Pleomorphic adenoma, once you have seen the microepidermoid carcinoma, so pleomorphic adenoma is not a big case now. Yes. But the important thing is convergent approach. Any questions so far for the day? This was Anything one of the best have... case of, this was one of the best case of for the genius, I think. This would do. Yes. Is the recording every time. Very clear and very nicely. And now, I think uh, by now, uh, all of us are. Sir, has made JNA like a ball game. Huh? JNA is understandable tumor. You know, this has a, a pattern of spread, which you can understand. Pattern of vascularity, you can understand. And certain principle not to enter into the tumor, stay around, catch the vessel and remove it. Yes. The simple philosophy you follow, whatever the extent of the tumor, the treatment remains same. Yes. Yes, sir. Doesn't change at all. Now, are you getting something on the screen? The MRI? Yes. Yes, yes, we can see. MRI. In the last case, and see this tumor on titulated. You see on the axial and see this is my retromandibular vein right. and tumor is far laterally. Mm. Have you see? Right. Far superficial in the deep lobe. It is not malignant. Why I'm not saying malignant? You know, there are certain features on MRI itself. It mm. tells you it is not malignant. Number one, see how circumscribed it is. Mm. If it has been malignant, it would have been diffusely, you know, going out of the capsule to invade the parotid tissue. Hmm. This is so homogeneous and uh, pleomorphic adenomas are very tight according to the cell they contain. You know, pleomorphic means variety of cells they have. Hmm. Hmm. Now, this is contrast and this is uh, contrast here as well I will bring. Hmm. Yes. So now, if you see on the contrast, see this enhancement. Yes, yes. Now, I always make it a point to go to the diffusion that clears whether it is benign or malignant to a major extent. See now, this lesion, see on the diffusion here, it is enhancing, it is not restricting. Right. Yes, Had sir. there been a lot of cellularity like malignant tumor with a major uh, and a big nucleus cytoplasmic ratio, more cells, less water content, it would give diffusion restriction. And it is bright on diffusion means more water content, less chances of being malignant. As simple as that. This is pure bioimaging. It's so reliable. It's so reliable. By means of looking at the diffusion, I can say whether it is benign or malignant 95% of the time. And this adds on to your decision making. Sometimes you are not very sure on 
uh, FNSC or core biopsy or whatever, and this diffusion MRI with all these features of MRI are suddenly very, very important in those situations. Yes, sir. So, uh, we are going to start in a couple of minutes. The flap is raised and um, this will be the last case of the day. Anybody, any question? Miss, uh, you advise MRI. Any role of CT scan, Miss uh, Ultrasound okay. and then MRI CT only? Has, CT has role only, only for the bone. For soft tissue, soft tissues, MRI. Only and only thing is MRI. Yes. So in overall our practice, now the role of the CT scan is reduced down to less than 20%. For mm -hmm. CT or the PNS for the sinusitis and for CSOM and other autosclerosis and cochlear implant and those mm -hmm. for the temporal bone. For mm -hmm. rest of the pathologies, it is all MRI. Mm -hmm. Even for the bone, for certain regions, MRI is more informative particularly giving the information of bone marrow invasion. Hmm. Marrow canal invasion, like in oral cavity for the mandibular invasion. For cortical hmm. invasion, CT scan gives you a picture of early invasion. Hmm. But beyond the cortex, it is MRI. Yes. Medullary canal, it is MRI. For perineal spread, it is MRI. So the role of the CT scan is reduced more and more. Because of the versatility of the MRI, it can give rise to, you know, more than 1,500 different sequences. Every sequence has a value for certain indications. As the MRI is so vast, so difficult to understand. But there are certain common sequences by taking use of them. You can reach to our differential diagnosis most of the time in your clinical practice. Mm. So I am uh, washing up now. And, uh, yes, sir. So what's the FNSC finding of the case? Leomorphic adenoma. Straight forward. Mm. Okay, sir. Sir, also uh, while uh, doing, uh, Dr. Dixit had asked this question no, no, no. even in the previous parotidectomy case uh, about the types of parotidectomy. So we have discussed about uh, adequate yeah, paratectomy, superficial. And... There are so many classifications existing. Yes. Everyone has its own classification. The European system, European Salivary Gland Society is a different classification. The Spanish Society is a different. Boston Society is a different. And every individual is a different. From extra capsular dissection to superficial to very superficial parotidectomy to extended superficial to total, near total, subtotal, extended radical, extended radical. There's so many things to confuse you. Mm. By and large, by and large, the standard classification system involves extra capsular dissection is what? When you remove the tumor from one subsite of the parotid, there are many subsites of the parotid defined. Like in the superficial lobe, there are two subsites. The one in the superficial lobe, superior to the main trunk of the facial now, one inferior to the main trunk of facial now. They are again subdivided by the branches to 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. Then the same thing in the deeper lobe, level 3 and 4, Above and below the facial now. Hmm. Then a level 5 is accessory parotid along the duct. So yes, if you are removing one level superficial with cup of tissue around with no hmm. localization of the facial now, just go around it like excisional biopsy is extra capsular hmm. dissection. Hmm. A lot of people consider it as standard dissection in limited tumors. Hmm. Then comes the superficial parotidectomy, the gold standard procedure. Hmm. No term like for us, very superficial parotid acne, it doesn't exist. Then a total parotid acne when you remove the entire parotid tissue deep and superficial lobe. Mm. Extended, or uh, I would say the radical parotid acne when you involve the facial nerve in resection, mm. when the facial nerve is involved. Mm. Extended when the tumor extends out of the confines of the parotid, mm. the subsite like mandible, Extraortic canal, meseter, skull base, 
and you go on to remove that extended subsoil along with the parotid is extended parotidectomy entelase yes there are many ways can you see the tumor yes yes the flap has already been elevated yes let me give you a good focus Can you see better? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. now this is much better. Okay, so the theme is we have discussed the parotid in detail today. The only thing we are going to discuss here now is the facial now. Okay? Yes. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, first of all, before the facial now, is another now. Can you see this? Greater auricular. Yes. And we are supposed to preserve the posterior division. Mm. Don't ignore yes, it. It's very important it's for or anybody who wear earrings. See this? Yes, yes. Beautiful. Yes, sir. That's the anterior branch which is going to be divided. Ah, no, my sir. Give me the one. What am I asking? I always mention there are two landmarks to be taken into consideration, and that is what using them. Converging onto the facial now, known as convergent approach. See what I'm defining is the anterior border of the sternomastoid. Yeah, yeah. See this vein. See this vein. I was telling you the landmark for the the last case we could find that landmark for the greater auricular. See this. Yes. One centimeter below and parallel. If you remember, I mentioned. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See this? Right. In the last case, it was missing. Venous abnormalities are more common. Check. And now we have two landmarks which we have to follow and complete this parotidectomy. Number one, superiorly, is the tragal pointer. See, this is the tragus. Yes, sir. Uta uta. Counter tension. This is the tragal pointer. Can you see cartilage? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, we have to look at the lower end of the cartilage, which ends as a pointer. Yes. Now I mentioned to Dr. Shiva, if you remember, as mm -hmm. as you are superficial to the lower end of the cartilage, yes, sir. you are miles away from the facial now. Yes. This is the cartilage, mm. and this is how it is ending here. See this? Yes, sir. As a pointer. This is the pointer. See the pointer? Can yes, you? Yes, sir. Yes. Can you see here? Very clear. Very clear. Very clear. Now, the second landmark I see from below and remove the bridging tissue completely. Mm. Can you see this muscle below? Yes. This is a very important muscle. This muscle is a, you know, very important muscle for the surgeon. Always use as a landmark everywhere. Yes, sir. Saving surgeons from giving complication. Mm. This is digestic. Yes, sir. Posterior belly. 
Now, see, this is the digestive muscle coming to the under surface of the mastoid here. See this? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As I mentioned, staying lateral to the digestic. Staying lateral to the digestic. I can remove. See this? I am lateral to the digestic. Yes, sir. Yes. Lateral to the cradle pointer as well. This is cradle pointer. Mm. See this? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. I can remove this tissue completely. See this? I see now in the depth. What is there? Yeah, but it's not. Uh, but it's little bit so more uh, lateral. Yeah. Lateral, yes, sir. It is more lateral. Little bit you can see, but yeah. at the same uh, point, it's there quite it is lateral. This is the digestic ending here. Yeah. Just yeah. above that, and this is the tragal pointer here, just one centimeter below and deeper. So easy it is to find this now. That looks very lateral, no, sir. Yeah, little lateral. Mm. Now see, staying about the, you know, the lower division now. See this? Mm. Yes. If I open up, yeah. See this lower division, sir. Can you see the lower region fibers? Yeah. Yes. That is the retromandibular vein. Yes. Then this is your upper division. See this? Going up, yes. Yes, sir, yes. See my artery. The direction of the artery force is lateral, always. Yes. Away from the nerve, you can see. So the kind of teaching we do is like you have already taught us, like insert, elevate, and spread. Yes, exactly. See how it is going. Stay above the now. Elevate the tissue above, not the nerve. Don't yes. give traction to the nerve. Yes, sir. no traction. No traction to the nerve, traction on the tissue, not on the nerve. See, this is lower division. Branch is going. Yes. <clears throat> this is the vein. I can bipolarize it here. One more place. Coming <clears throat> And now, the other branches, see this? See this? Yes, sir. This is your marginal mandibular. Yes, yes, clearly seen. And see, I am below the tumor. My tumor is here. Staying lateral to this, I can take this cup of tissue. Yes, sir. See this. Both sides I will elevate and remove this in next five minutes. Sir, how come you don't get bleeding? When we, when we do carotid, it's a lot of net, carotid net, is always net. bleeding. Microscope. Microscope gives the opportunity to you can have a look at the small, small capillaries. See so many branches from the lower division. Yes, sir. See, I am getting away from these branches. See, staying above the branches. Yes, sir. Yes, see the branches going? Yes, sir. 
see so many branches from the lower division so many interconnecting branches and all look at them these are all uh, you know small small blood vessels see this my lower pole is getting freed very soon my all important branches have gone through yes sir i am in um, i put them aside and i can really remove this yes sir abhi similarly from the upper pole here now some buccal branches these are important see this see this upper buccal yes. yeah yeah yes sir mop mm. these are the upper buccal see this yes now again i see my branches below yes sir mm. Hmm. Bye, Polar. Hmm. Sir, so supposingly, like this tumor is small. Supposingly, we have a big tumor, and we are not able to trace the main trunk of patient now, and we plan to do a retrograde yes. dissection. Yeah, so what are the landmarks for various front frontal buccal meshes yeah, for every branch there are landmarks we have discussed yes, I... for the marginal mandibular we have discussed then yeah, go yeah. to see for that best is to go to the anterior border meseter all these branches go on the meseter yes sir here see all these branches go on the meseter see these branches yes, see these yes, yes. sir follow any of these branches follow any of these retrograde they are going to take you to the main trunk see this lower lower buccal now yes sir yes. see so many branches from the lower division how do people call there are five branches of fusion now i see till entire part till diagrammatical major if i go i see almost more than 100 branches and all are important because this nerve is serving for the most complex function of the body the spontaneous smile um sir so i have one more question supposingly uh, the facial nerve is damaged during proctectomy and we want to like reanimate so should we do a facial masseter or should we take a sural nerve and then from the main trunk we should join various branches depends upon the gap among the branches you are going to uh, to intend to reanastomose if there is no gap primary anastomosis is, is the best there is no comparison to it okay sir if there is a big gap you can use a nerve graft okay like sural yes sir but if you don't have a proximal end Then only you bring the mesentric. Why mesentric otherwise? Spontaneous, okay. spontaneous smile will come only when the discharge is going to come from the facial nucleus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Because recently uh, we had a case of uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and we could not trace the main trunk, so we did total paroxysmy, and uh, then uh, the plastic surgeon of our team. Did the sural nerve grafting? The see now, all branches going respectively. Yes, yes, wonderful. And we remove the tumor. Very nice. See the great, network great. of branches. Network. Focus, focus, please. Little bit. Yeah, no, it's very good. Yeah. Network of vessels. and everywhere where are the nerves are the vessels you have to be very careful controlling the bleeding 
can create problems and injure the nerves. So you have to be very careful. Use bipolar and see now all the branches. This is inferior trunk. See the branches, branches, branches. This superior, this one. This is zygomatic. This is buccal and so many interconnecting. See this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We all can. This is uh, this is all about the parotid. We'll just wait, wash it. See the full, full uh, plexus. Amazing, sir. Best unfairness. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Parotid beautiful. Beautiful. surgery revolves all around the. See, this is greater auricular behind the facial yes, there. Yes, sir. We could see. Yes. yes. Thank you. We'll close it. And now, last thing. Thank you so much. Has any question, any suggestions, madam? You do any uh, parotid acne any differently, madam? Is a vast experience in head and neck. Oh no, sir, Tish, you've done it beautifully. It was a visual feast to watch all your surgeries. I didn't even feel like getting up even once. And thank you for inviting me to be with you. Thank you, Paramita. Thank you, Rajiv. And it was wonderful. Oh, I think you always is a totally learning experience, madam. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. We have learned a lot from you today. We had really good discussion and amazing cases. So we have really learned a I lot. I really today. enjoyed every moment. Thank you so much, Satish. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Sun. Thank you, Satish. Thank you, Maruti. Thank you, Rajat. Parmanji. And big thanks to Pachari Boss and Paramita. Swarmanji is there? No, he's there gone. Thank you very much, sir. It's a pleasure yes. seeing you. So I think we come on the behalf of Sun. We can thanks all. <laughs> yes, sir. sir. Your idea of inviting your pathologist, Doctor uh, uh, Parikh, madam, was an amazing Ultimate. idea. So we have learned yeah, so much of it. So much. We have really she learned. Very good. She was very good. See, pathologists. Very... Pathologists are very important. You know. Very important, sir. Very important. You have to give them full respect to learn from them, and yes. they are really important. Yes. One wrong pathology can ruin your career. Yes. 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 That is true. It was. It was. Radiologist. Mm. I always emphasize on the diagnosis. The pathologist and radiologist are the backbone of your diagnosis. Yes. And third is, I always whenever uh, you know I am hardcore onco surgeon. The rest ENT is secondary for me. Mm. I am uh, basically onco surgeon and doing lot of oncology procedures every day. Most of the day oncology only. And these Tata people are the people. Who are doing purely, purely evidence-based medicine? Evidence-based, yes. The kind of experience they have, the kind of work they are doing, day and night, like mm. these Adena guys are doing only Adena oncology. Yes. They are yes. so good at you know academical part. Mm. They publish so much. They have a you know huge uh, workload, mm. and the training system in Tata is amazing. Yes. If somebody has to do something in head and neck. Mm. He has to visit Tata in life at least for. Mm. That, that is that is true. that is true. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Maruti. Kalyan, good. Thank you, Rajiv. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sun Pharma, for everything. Thank you and thank you, Rajat. Keep coming. Yeah, Rajat is our hero. Is our. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, Rajiv. Overall, our goal is to extend the, you know, evidence-based medicine. Your comments, suggestions are valuable. You are most welcome. Yes, sir. So, thank you. I okay. thank uh, okay. today, Doctor Shiva, Doctor Ashna Pari, Shiva was there. Yeah, yeah, he was very good. Doctor Gaurav Chaturvedi, Doctor Maruti. Dwaypan, Dwaypan also joined in between. He also joined. Dwaypan, all these guys are amazing. And big okay. thanks to Ramandeep, uh, who is yeah, Ramandeep. Uh, yes. Who is a very very his, his input recognition. Thank yeah. you, thank you all, thank you, Paramita, thank you, Rajiv Bas, thank you. See you, and see you next week, thank next Sunday, you, with some thank more interesting you. cases, more uh, advanced cases next Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. Bye.
If symptomatic, then you should go for the surgery. I'll be going to talk about it. I'll be talking about it. Hmm? Symptomatic? I'll be talking about it. 
डायरेक्ट ऑनर ना नंबर ना बोलना और क्या बोलते हैं नहीं सर ऑलरेडी वर्ड हां ऐसा